Twelve Spirits of Christmas, Tessa Lamar Novels, Volume 2, written by Catherine M. Hurst, narrated by Holly Adams. Chapter 1 The pressure in my chest started the day after Halloween. Nothing major, just a sense of dread that accompanied the holiday season. It happened every fall, though it seemed to start earlier and earlier each year. I navigated my cart through the seasonal aisle, expecting discounted candy and mismatched costume pieces. Instead, I found candy canes and marshmallow Santas. Don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with Christmas in and of itself, but this time of year meant family obligations. While I don't think I'm the only person on the planet with a screwed-up family, I know for certain I've cornered the market on crazy mothers. My name is Tessa, or Tessa Marie, when I've done something foolish. I'm a licensed mental health counselor, though not currently practicing. My career came to a crashing halt when the fact that I'm a psychic medium made national news. These days, the only clients I see are victims of violent crimes at the Orange County Police Department, or members of the local Cherokee tribe coming for a spell or potion at the medicine shop. Working two jobs is stressful, and my coping mechanism of choice is chocolate. I turn the corner and hit pay dirt, an end cap of leftover semi-melted and mostly damaged bags of Halloween candy. I tossed three into my cart and glanced at my watch. I'd left the house with a short shopping list over an hour ago. Less than half the items were crossed off, but my buggy was almost full. My phone rang, and I cringed. My great-grandmother had a way of calling the moment I did something naughty. Hi, Graham. Tessa, are you still at the Walmart? Yes, ma'am. Could you pick up two bottles of my fiber mix? It's on BOGO this week. Oh, and two boxes of tea bags. She paused to speak to someone in the room. You might want to get some more ribs and stop for a bottle of whiskey on the way home. We have two racks thawing. Are we having company? I held my breath, praying she hadn't invited anyone awful to dinner. Darlene and her new beau stopped by. Hurry home, and don't you dare buy Halloween candy. She laughed and disconnected. Graham May hadn't invited someone awful to dinner, She'd invited the queen of awful, my mother. I didn't worry about the latest in Darlene's flavor of the month club. The new boyfriend wouldn't be around long enough for me to remember his name. I added another bag of candy to the cart, and my phone rang again. Hello? Dessa, where are you? I have five of the elders' wives waiting to see you. Bryson spoke in a hushed tone. I'm at Walmart. Can you help them? I had to prepare myself for dinner, take a couple of shots, and chase them with a pound of chocolate. The last thing I wanted to do was rush back to the medicine shop to make love charms. They asked to see you, Brasson whispered. Hurry. I don't like the way Mrs. Matthews is looking at me. The playfulness in his voice curled my toes. I was pretty sure I was in love with him, but... We'd decided to take things slow. However, the lack of toe-curling activities did nothing to relieve my stress. I added another bag of candy to the cart. I'm only half done with my list. If I'm there in five to finish the shopping, can you come here and take care of the women? That'll work. I slid my phone into my purse and frowned at the candy, he wouldn't judge me. However, standing next to his toned body would take the enjoyment out of hoarding sweets. The man ate like a machine and rarely touched processed sugar. He'd also given up coffee, two strikes against him in my book. We'd worked together as medicine man and woman for the local members of the Cherokee tribe since Charlie, my grandfather, passed away. We were also quasi-engaged, but... Our relationship was complicated. I'd rounded the corner to the health and beauty department when the phone rang again. 
Hi, Aaron. Tessa, we have a case. Can you meet me in Winter Park in an hour? I stopped in the middle of the aisle and hung my head. I considered Aaron one of my best friends, but I didn't have time for police work today. I'm at the store. What kind of case is it? Suicide from the sound of it. The deceased's partner found him hanging from a tree in the backyard. Aaron's voice lacked its usual humor. He'd either had a late night or a rough day. Maybe both. Sure. Text me the address. What's the victim's name? I had no idea what I'd do with the room full of people waiting for me at the medicine shop, but skipping out on dinner with Darlene made me happy. Plus, working the case would give me the opportunity to check up on Aaron. I hadn't seen him in over a week. Thanks, Tessa. You're a doll. Partridge. The deceased's name is Partridge. I glanced around to make sure no one was watching before I loaded two containers of maize fiber mix into the cart. What kind of tree was it? Orange tree. Why? It was probably a sin to laugh at the dead, but I couldn't help it. We have a partridge in an orange tree. Aaron groaned. I'll send the address. Try to hurry. No problem. I continued to push the cart up and down the aisles, adding items as I went. I knew Bryson stood behind me before I laid eyes on him. Because of our weird metaphysical connection, his hand on my shoulder woke my magic, and his warmth made me smile. He leaned his six feet three inch frame in to inspect the contents of the buggy and shook his head. To his credit, he didn't comment on my stash of individually wrapped hip expanders. I turned and faced him. When did it become okay to start the holiday season on the 1st of November? I love Christmas. Bryson grinned as he moved his hand to the small of my back. Dimples formed from the corners of his mouth to his cheekbones, causing a woman in our aisle to swoon. Full-blooded Native American and ridiculously sexy, he received no shortage of female adoration. As much as I wanted to grouse about the nightmare to come, the twinkle in his eye made me bite my tongue. Of course he loves Christmas. He's a morning person after all. Morning people have a certain outlook on life that night owls don't. I raised on tiptoe to kiss his cheek and handed him the list. May needs two bottles of whiskey. Can you stop by the liquor store? Will do. He slid his arm around my waist and brushed his lips across mine. Any reason she needs extra? Darlene's bringing a new man to dinner. I lingered in his embrace, enjoying the unexpected public affection. You're awful friendly for the middle of Walmart. I'm happy to see you. Bryson took a step back, but kept his hand on my waist. Are you? Or does this have something to do with me bailing you out of a house full of women? A lady beside us choked back laughter, staring at Bryson as if she had nothing else to do except wait for his reply. He chuckled. Both. You owe me one. I slung my purse over my shoulder. Grocery shopping is my only me time. You can collect later. His flirting left me tongue-tied and blushing. Bryson didn't show this side of himself often. He gave me a peck on the cheek. You better hurry. Those women looked desperate. If one more person told me to hurry, I'd curl into a ball and refuse to move. I have to meet Aaron at three o'clock. We have a case. Bryson frowned as he pushed my hair behind my ear, the gentle touch igniting sparks that warmed me. Tell them to focus on their problem. Do a chant with them. Use some generic herbs or totems and send them home. I'm pretty sure they're all looking for something to get their husband's attention. Nothing too urgent. I'd like a date and some attention. I procrastinated but I couldn't resist a few minutes of alone time with him, even if we were standing in the middle of the store. 
I'll take you out tonight. He winked and pushed the cart down the aisle. Chapter Two After my grandfather passed away, Bryson and I set up shop at Charlie and Aunt Dottie's place. Everything in the house looked different, which made it easier to walk inside, but reminded me how much my life had changed. I craved the comfort of familiarity. I pushed my grief to the back of my mind and told myself this would always be Charlie's house, no matter how many times we changed the furniture. I walked into the living room that we used as a waiting room and into a crowd of anxious women. The chatter stopped and all eyes turned to me with a mixture of respect, fear, and hope. The air stilled in my lungs at the intensity of their stares. I hadn't grown accustomed to the blind trust most of the tribe put in my and Bryson's magical abilities. We were called on to heal all manner of physical, mental, financial, and relational problems. It was a hell of a burden, and my shoulders slumped from the weight of it. One look at their faces, and I knew Bryson had hit the nail on the head. The ladies had asked to see me for relationship issues. I cleared my throat. <clears> throat> Sorry to keep you waiting. Do any of you need privacy to discuss your needs, or have you shared amongst yourselves? Three blushed, two laughed, and the last wrung her hands. In my former life as a mental health counselor, I wouldn't have dreamed of breaking confidentiality or putting a client on the spot. Thankfully, HIPAA didn't apply to mystical arts, and I was in a hurry to get to a murder investigation. Is there anyone who isn't here for help with a problem in their romantic relationships, or lack thereof? When no one spoke, I went around the room, pulling the heavy curtains over the windows, and locked the front door all while muffling a chuckle. I'd never get used to insinuating myself into other people's love lives. I could barely handle my own. We're going to do something different today. Mrs. Matthews raised her hand. Miss Tessa, no offense, but are you going to do magic on all of us at the same time? Here? We're going to draw on the collective energies of the female essence as a group. Hoping that they didn't notice I made it up as I went, I smiled and walked to the center of the room. Stand, please, and hold hands. The ladies cast shy glances at me and at each other as they formed a circle. In grad school, I'd learned about waning desire in older women, as well as the causes. This group needed a reminder of their feminine power. More so, they needed a shot of confidence. Hachila, I whispered the word for fire, which happened to be my birth mother's name. Nothing happened. Ladies, please repeat after me. Achila, Achila, Achila. Mrs. Matthews yelped when the candles in the room lit. The other women turned to me with wide eyes. I had their attention. I stomped out a rhythm and began with an invocation. O oh moon, look down upon the would-be lovers, guide their feet to dance and their bodies to love. Black spider, weave your web around them, bind and tangle them so their affections can never flee. The women followed my lead, swaying and stomping. I chanted an old love spell I remembered from Charlie's spell book. I take your kiss and return it. I take your body and worship it. I take your heart and protect it. The women repeated each phrase as they circled the living room. We are strong! Sweat broke out of my forehead and I shrugged out of my cardigan. I closed my eyes and danced around the circle as the women repeated my words. We are beautiful. We are powerful. We are desirable. The energy in the room brought a smile to my face. Yes, this is exactly what the ladies need. 
I soared on the high of knowing I had tapped into their psyches and provided some healing. We are deserving of love. We are sensual, sexual beings. Sexual beings, the women called out to me. I stepped on something soft and opened my eyes to find Mrs. Matthews' blouse on the floor. Slowing the rhythm of my feet, I spun in a slow circle. It took my brain a few minutes to catch up to my eyes. The women, in various states of undress, continued to dance. Thank you for your blessings, great mother. I stilled in the center of the circle and whispered the spell to extinguish the candles. However, the flames didn't respond. They continued to move along with the women. My spirit animal, the firebird, stirred inside me, heating my skin as she fought to burst from my body and join the party. It hit me. The energy in the room wasn't only feminine, but sexual. So much so that my breasts felt heavy and the ache between my thighs left me wanting. I hadn't managed an orgasm since the day Charlie died, not because of grief or guilt, but out of a fear of losing control and unleashing my flames. The front door opened, and Bryson stood stock still with his keys in his hand and his jaw on the floor. The color drained from his tanned face as he turned to go, stopped, looked back, and left the house. Thankfully, the ladies didn't notice him, or he might not have made it out with his virtue intact. I clapped my hands together three times. Ladies, we're finished. Ladies. One by one, they came out of their trance-like states. Their serene expressions morphed into confusion and embarrassment. No one spoke as they redressed. The change in noise level left my ears ringing. Something had happened in that circle. Though I had no idea what I'd unleashed, I felt the effect spiritually and physically. I opened the door to find Bryson sitting on the porch swing with a curious look on his face. Hey, we're finished. I have to go. He crooked his finger and beckoned me to come. I took a step forward, not trusting myself to go any closer. The corner of his mouth turned up in a grin, but his eyes held a dark look that sent tingles through my already sparking nerves. The spell's sexual energy had claimed another victim. What did you do in there? My eyes followed the movement of his hand as he adjusted himself through his jeans. I'm not sure. He shook his head and headed for the steps. I'm not going in until everyone leaves. That's probably wise. I caught his arm and stepped closer. I'll call Aaron and tell him I'll be late. Tessa. His lips brushed my earlobe before he pulled back. We can't have sex until you get control of your magic. My spirit animal happened to be a firebird. When I got hot and bothered, so did she. But her idea of hot involved actual fire. Backyard? We agreed there's no need to rush things. He sighed. I grabbed his hips and pulled him closer. I'm tired of waiting, aren't you? I'm willing to wait as long as it takes. Besides, you have a suicide investigation, a grieving family, and dinner with Darlene to deal with. I couldn't argue with his logic. The timing stunk, but he'd turned me down several times over the previous weeks. The rejection stung. We spent a considerable amount of time together during office hours and after, but I needed more from him than time. All right, all right. No sex. Clear the house before you go. Bryson chuckled as he released me. Chapter 3 Until a few months ago, I could count the number of times I had arrived late for work on one hand. Nowadays, I counted myself lucky if I made it to the bathroom on time. 
I parked alongside two patrol cars and hurried to the house. I'd spent enough time on violent crime scenes to know the drill. Credentials out, eyes open, go only where clear, and find Aaron as quickly as possible. I walked inside and paused. The living room belonged on the cover of an interior decor magazine. Dark wood floors contrasted with white couches, Large black and white paintings with bold splashes of red covered most of the interior walls. The lack of clutter and personal effects made me uncomfortable, as if standing in a posh office building instead of a home. The police had commandeered the large kitchen island as their command center. Aaron Burns and Richard Samuels stood with two other homicide detectives and crime scene investigators. I stuffed my hands in my pockets and walked into the kitchen. Hi, sorry I'm late. How can I help? We haven't cleared the scene just yet. The responding deputies assumed it was a suicide and mucked it up. Aaron ran his hand through his short, dark hair. I'd like for you to walk out back, see if you pick up anything. Talk to the Vic's husband. We'll get you inside the house once CSI is finished. I met his blue eyes, and a thrill of pleasure pulsed through me. Bad, Tessa, bad. I disregarded my reaction, chalking it up to leftover sex magic. Aaron and I had a brief fling that ended when Bryson came into my life. Anything more than friendship and co-workers with detective blue eyes was off the table. Tessa, are you okay? He rested his hand on my arm. Jesus, you're burning up. I pulled away, forced a weak smile, and lied. I'm a little tired, maybe catching a bug. We'll make it quick. Aaron frowned and set his hand on the small of my back. I tried to ignore his touch as we walked toward the back of the house. Is it suicide? Was there a history of depression, a note? The husband denies there were any issues. The Vic was promoted to a swanky position at the Tourism Development Board about two months ago. They're recently married. No family in the area, though I understand not all of their families accepted their marriage. Nothing obvious. No psych history. No note. Aaron held the back door open. I walked out onto the patio and stopped in my tracks. A man hung from a thick branch of an orange tree by strands of Christmas lights. Several investigators moved around the area, snapping pictures and collecting evidence. I stepped away from Aaron, dipped my chin, and closed my eyes. My spirit animal stilled as I focused on the energy around me. If Mr. Partridge's spirit lingered in this place, I could reach out to him and try to get his side of what happened. More often than not, murder victims, and those who died suddenly, hesitated before moving on to the afterlife. I opened my eyes to find Aaron and the others staring. The expressions on the tech's faces made me want to run. They thought of me as a freak, or worse, a fraud. Aaron touched my arm, drawing me back to reality. His brows rose in question. I shook my head. I got nothing. Is the spouse nearby? I'd like to talk to him before I walk the house. He's next door. Aaron guided me away from the crime scene toward a gate on the far side of the yard. I hadn't expected the gate to lead to the neighbor's property. Nor did I expect to find a crowd of people so close. Then again, my family and friends couldn't be quiet in church, let alone a backyard. Aaron led me toward a man sitting alone. Mr. Adams, this is Tessa Lamar. She's the victim's advocate I told you about. I stepped forward and offered my hand. Do you feel up to talking? Mr. Adams looked me over slowly, as if judging my worth by my clothing. I prepared myself for his rejection, but he took my hand and dropped his chin to his chest. The weight of his grief slammed into me the moment we touched. I'd misjudged his pain as indifference. Thank you, but I've told the police everything I know. Gatlin wouldn't have done this to himself. 
His voice caught at the mention of his husband's name. Detective Burns and Samuels are two of the best. They'll do everything in their power to find out what happened. Mr. Adams narrowed his eyes. I know you. You're that psychic, right? I chewed my lip and nodded. People who recognized me tended to react in one of two ways. They treated me like a sideshow freak or begged me to connect them with their dearly departed. Officially, I'm a victim's advocate. Occasionally, I'll work with the police to help solve crimes, but I don't consider myself a psychic. Honey, I'd employed Sherlock Holmes, Columbo, and Teresa Caputo to find out what happened. He moved his legs and motioned for me to sit. Thank you, Mr. Adams. This'll only take a moment. I sat and turned to face him. Please, call me Michael. What do you want to know? Tell me about your husband. Anything you want to share is fine. It helps if I know a little about them. He drew a breath. He is, or is it was now? My chest tightened as I recalled the day I caught myself referring to Charlie in the past tense. I believe our loved ones are never far from us. You can use the present tense if you want. He is the most amazing man. Driven, hardworking, but loving and generous. He is the type of person who has his own gravitational pull. People are drawn to him. I couldn't help but smile at the way Michael spoke of his husband. What did he do for a living? Oh, honey, what didn't he do? He's involved in several local charities and manages a handful of actors and artists. He landed his dream job a couple of months ago, working at the CVP as cultural director. He won a huge contract last year, and they promoted him. Is he a performer? The words felt awkward, but I respected his decision to use the present tense. He could have been, but he suffered from a debilitating case of stage fright. He preferred to be behind the scenes. Michael sighed and wiped his eyes. I'm sorry. This is all too much. We're newlyweds. I can't believe he's gone. I'm sorry for your loss. I'll give you some privacy. Thank you, Tessa. One last question. I smiled and motioned to the fence. What's the deal with the gate? Most people want to keep their neighbors out. This is Gavin's house. I married the boy next door. He chuckled under his breath before his grief took him again. We use it for temporary housing for visiting artists or out-of-town guests. I'll be staying here until the police finish. The hair on the back of my neck stood on end. Michael, would you mind if I stop by tomorrow? I need to get inside your house, but I'd like to walk through this one, too. I never know where I might pick up something. Of course, anything you need. He stood and pulled me into a hug. Normally, I have a no-touching-the-clients rule. In this case, I made an exception. Something about this man drew me in. Gavin wasn't the only one with a gravitational pull. I would have loved to have met them before tragedy paid a visit. Chapter 4 My mother's car sat in the driveway beside Grand May's little pink house when I arrived. In a perfect world, I would have had time to take a shower and put on clean clothes before meeting Darlene's boyfriend. Then again, in a perfect world, my mother wouldn't have a boyfriend, and I'd have a father. When Charlie died, I'd learned that my biological mother, Achila, was full-blooded Nunahi the Cherokee version of a fairy. Part of me had always suspected I'd been switched at birth. However, when I imagined meeting my real parents, I'd always imagined a mother and a father. Instead, I had an elusive ghost and no dad. The scent of barbecued ribs reminded me I hadn't eaten since breakfast. I walked past the empty grill and sighed. Graham May didn't approve of tardiness, not when it came to church or dinner. Still, I lingered outside. Maddie, Bryson's chocolate lab, 
lifted her head and gave me a sympathetic look. I'm in big trouble, huh, girl? The dog looked at me, to the grill, and back. I might be in big trouble, but at least I'll be eating barbecue instead of kibble. I steeled my resolve and opened the screen door. There she is. Bryson smiled as he stood to embrace me. I pressed my face into the smoky fabric of his shirt and relaxed. Not long ago, walking into my great-grandmother's house was all I needed to feel at home. Since Bryson crashed into my life, his arms had become my safe place. Whatever distance had formed between us hadn't diminished his warmth. You two need to get a room, Darlene barked a cigarette-graveled laugh. Bryson kissed my forehead before he pulled out a chair for me. Thank you. Sorry I'm late. I did my best to ignore my mother and the man seated at her right. We just said grace. My great-grandmother patted my hand. Now, dip me some baked beans. Careful, the dish is hot. Yes, ma'am. I scooped beans onto her plate. When she didn't pull it back, I added a second serving. As the person holding the spoon, it became my job to fill four additional plates. The small task offered a welcome distraction from my mother fawning over her new guy. Tessa, this is my boyfriend, Stone. Darlene beamed at the long-haired man. May pursed her lips, unimpressed with Darlene's latest bow. Nice to meet you. I passed the potato salad. You too. I feel like I know your soul. Darlene talks about you all the time. He held his hand up when Aunt Dottie offered the plate of ribs. No thanks, ma'am. I don't eat anything with the face. May rolled her eyes toward the ceiling, and Bryson dipped his head to hide his grin. Darlene skipped the ribs, but watched as the plate emptied. Why are you late? Were you working on a murder case? Yes, ma'am. I stuffed a roll into my mouth, hoping she'd take the hint and drop the subject. You should charge by the case. It's a crying shame what they pay you. Those sockets on the TV make millions. Aunt Dottie smiled at Stone. What do you do for a living? I appreciated her efforts to turn the conversation, but Darlene watched me from across the table. I recognized the look from when she'd tried to quit smoking. Angry and desperate. She wanted those ribs as much as her body wanted nicotine. She needed a target for her frustration, and I had a bullseye on my forehead. My leg bounced under the table as I struggled to avoid Darlene's eyes. Bryson pressed his thigh against mine under the table. The contact took the edge off my nerves, enough for me to swallow my food. A little of this, a little of that. I don't believe in capitalism. I'm more of an artist. Stone took a bite of the collard greens and blanched. Miss May, is there bacon in the greens? May's chin rose. I don't put bacon in greens. Dottie sighed. We put salt pork in the greens. There's bacon in the green beans and potato salad. Darlene didn't tell us you were a vegetarian. I'm a vegan. He turned green around the edges and stood. Where's the restroom? You're a what? May tossed her napkin on the table. It's through Tessa's room. Darlene shoveled a huge bite of potato salad into her mouth and stood. I'll show you. He watched her chew in horror before following to the bathroom. When Dottie moved into May's house, she took my childhood bedroom. Despite the change, we would always refer to it as mine. May shook her head and focused on her plate. Rasson and Dottie followed her lead. We ate with the knowledge we had a short window to get the meat down before Stone returned to the table. I wondered if Stone had any idea what he'd gotten himself into with my mother, 
She obviously hadn't warned him about dinner with a bunch of carnivores. I had to hand it to Darlene. She had diverse tastes in men. The last one she brought around worked construction and sported an impressive beer belly. May wiped sauce from her fingers. What's a vegan? Bryson chuckled. He's a vegetarian who doesn't eat any dairy or eggs. Well, what the heck is left? She smirked and added a few more ribs to her plate. Darlene returned to the table alone and lunged for the rib plate. She reminded me of a dog who'd stolen food from the garbage, hunched over, protecting the meat in her hand while casting worried glances over her shoulder. Mama, just tell him you aren't a vegan. You can't start a relationship on lies. Darlene finished the rib and grabbed another. Don't you lecture me on relationships, young lady. I'll have you know. Stone emerged from the bedroom, looking less green and more pale. Sorry about that, folks. I'm a bit of an artist myself. Bryson seemed to take pity on Darlene and distracted Stone while she discarded the evidence. What medium do you prefer? I work with natural stone and wood. Before he could reply, Darlene said, All mediums are the same, despite what my daughter says. I watch enough of them on the TV. They all talk to ghosts and can tell the future. Though, if Tessa were worth her weight in salt, she'd tell us the winning lottery numbers. I sank further into my chair as the man shared a look. Dottie grinned while May continued to gnaw on a rib bone. Stone wrapped his arms around my mom's waist and set his chin on her shoulder. I like anything spiritual, but music and watercolors are my artistic mediums. I softened toward him. Not many men had shown her such tenderness. You should come to Sunday service with us. Our pastor's on fire this month. Dottie stood and cleared her plate. Stone shrugged. I don't subscribe to Western religions, but I'll check it out. I haven't been in a church since I was ten. May's mouth fell open. I have expected her to bless a bathtub of water and baptize the man herself. Bryson took my hand, probably anticipating a negative turn in the conversation, but May shook her head without a word. Maybe she'd picked up on his gentle nature, too. Stone kissed Darlene's cheek and sat. You two are medicine people? Bryson nodded. I keep telling them they need to take out an ad on Craigslist and expand. People would love to visit a real-life medicine man and fortune teller. Darlene shot me a triumphant look. Mama! I shook my head, willing her not to launch into her ideas for expanding our income. Stone said, Advertising isn't allowed, right? No, it isn't. We have our hands full as it is. Bryson took my hand and asked Stone, What type of music do you play? Drums and a classic rock cover band, but my passion is leading a local drumming circle. Something about sitting in nature with others, pounding out a rhythm. It's indescribable. Bryson's grin widened. I couldn't agree more. Dude, you and Tessa should come out one night. I can loan you some bongos. Bryson glanced at me, then back to Stone. Absolutely. Sounds like fun. I nodded, though banging on bongos with Stone ranked just behind root canals on my things to look forward to list. Chapter 5 Bryson and I sat on the porch swing, letting our food digest as the crickets chirped and the bottles hanging in the spirit tree clinked together. Maddie had curled up on Dottie's chaise lounge, happily gnawing a bone. Dinner was interesting. I scooted closer. He draped his arm around my shoulder. I liked him. I couldn't help but smile. Stone's nice enough, but not exactly Darlene's type, besides the unemployed thing, of course. Bryson hooked his finger under my jaw 
and turned my face toward his. He seems to care about her. I met his eyes, then glanced at his lips. Maybe he'll be good for her. He seems laid back, not the screaming and pushing kind she usually goes for. Laid back is good. He pressed his lips to mine. My eyes drifted closed as he explored my mouth. A slow kiss stole my breath. I turned my body to him and ran my hands over his chest to speed things up, but he continued to meander around as if he had nowhere to be and nothing to do. He whispered, I promised to take you out tonight. I can't. I mean, I'm exhausted. So am I. I laughed and gave him a small shove. Why'd you offer? Promises mean something. I smiled until a little voice whispered from my subconscious. Is he trying to tell me something? Did I make a promise I didn't keep? He let his head fall back against the swing. Want to talk about what happened with the women today? I cringed, thinking about the half-naked women dancing in my grandfather's former living room. The latest in a growing list of goof-ups. Not really. You have to be careful when invoking magic. If I didn't know better, I'd think you wove a fertility spell. I thought back to my intentions with the words I spoke. I wanted the ladies to feel sexy, comfortable in their skin, but more so, I wanted to boost their self-confidence. If I did, it wasn't on purpose. Whatever it was, it worked. It hit me the second I opened the door. It still lingers. You have to be sure to emulate human casting. You never know when you'll run across someone who knows the difference between Nunahi and human magic. He ran his fingers up my arm. I'll be more careful. Goosebumps broke out on my skin as if his touch had chilled me, but the heat in my gut flared. If he continued to tease, I'd go up in flames, literally. We could go down to the lake. I can't light anything on fire in water. He stood and took my hand, pulling me to my feet. Let's fly. Burn off some of the leftover spell energy. I guess it's worth a try. The weight of his rejection squashed my desire. Bryson stood, pulled me to my feet, and led me to the back of the house. Thick trees surrounded the yard and covered the remaining property. We had little chance of being caught naked here. He released my hand and pulled his shirt over his head. I stood dumbstruck at the side of the moon playing off his muscles. I had to ask again, in case he'd misunderstood. Can we fly to the lake? I need to reconnect with you. Tessa, bodies are fun, but sex isn't the answer. The answer to what? His words set me on edge. I'd grown used to his condescending lectures, most of which I took as well-meaning, if poorly delivered. This hit too close to a chink in the armor, protecting my self-esteem. You've been through a lot, babe. You need time to get control over your emotions before you can control the firebird. Bryson frowned. Or is the firebird fueling your emotions? You're asking me? Considering how my anger flared, he had a point. But I'd be damned if I'd admit it. It makes sense, considering her strength. I didn't want to talk about the firebird. Since my spirit animal made herself known, my life had gone to hell in a paper sack. The idea of the damned bird caused my emotional instability created a chicken-egg argument I couldn't begin to understand. Silly me, I thought being in love and wanting to get physical were positive emotions. They are. He drew me close but those aren't the only feelings running through you. You're grieving, Charlie, and your old life. Again, normal. I pulled away. Come on, Tessa. You know any therapist would tell you not to make major decisions for at least a year after losing a loved one. A year? You want to abstain for a year? 
What kind of a guy refuses to have sex with his girlfriend because she's too emotional? We've already made several major decisions. We had to act, or the elders would have forced our hands with Aaron and the medicine shop. He folded his arms. Can you honestly tell me you're happy with your life now? I sighed, finding myself on the losing end of an argument. I missed Charlie every second. Working two jobs sucked. Worrying that I'd shift if I allowed myself to feel something left me empty and frustrated. I'd give anything to have my life back, but that was impossible. I don't want to wait a year to move forward with us. There's nothing wrong with taking things slow. I know. I just, I hung my head. Nothing I could say would change a damned thing. He smiled and embraced me. You want things settled. We'll get there in time. Is that what I want? Settled? The words brought to mind old sneakers and unhappy marriages, not the sort of life I imagined for myself. I'd fallen in love with Bryson during a crazy time. Maybe he was right. Maybe we needed time to figure out what we had left once the crises ended. Or maybe his feelings for me had changed. No, I don't want to let him go. I don't want to wait a year or for him to treat me like a child. I needed him to fight for me as hard as I fought for us. I needed to know he loved me. You're right. Maybe we should take a break, get to know each other as friends without the pressure to be more. He pressed his lips into a thin line. Is that what you want? It'll be good for me to focus on myself for now. I never asked for any of this. The spirit animal, the magic, ghosts, dealing with the elders. But I'm stuck with it. I need to figure out how to be me again because I don't like the person I've become. I equated the changes in my life to starting a new job. Walking into a new position stunk until you climbed over the learning curve. Unfortunately, the firebird and my magic didn't have a curve. They had Mount Everest. Bryson turned his face toward the sky. The storm is coming. If we're going to fly, we need to go. He changed the subject so abruptly, it took me a second to catch up. I didn't want to fly. But then again, he apparently didn't care enough to continue the conversation or call my bluff. Determined not to allow him to see me cry, I turned my back and undressed. The heat inside me spread from my core to my fingertips as the firebird took over. While shifting had become second nature, the sensory differences still blew my mind. My vision sharpened, allowing me to watch a spider weaving a web at the edge of the tree line. Everything burst into color. The grass was no longer green, but brilliant shades I had no words to describe. In the daylight, the changes would be even more pronounced. I still hadn't grown accustomed to the increased peripheral vision. Instead of 180 degrees of sight, I could see all but a small blind spot directly behind my head. If I tried to focus too hard, the panoramic views disoriented me. My hearing dulled in some ways, but intensified in others. I could distinguish certain tones and pitches better in this form, but I lost deeper tenors. The effect reminded me of listening to music with no bass. The sense of home faded, and the breeze took on an entirely different meaning. I read the air current and pressure like street signs as I launched from the ground. I stretched my neck and tucked my wings, allowing the warm air current to propel me toward the heavens. Brasson followed my lead, flying a few feet behind. The sound of his wings soothed my frazzled nerves, and the feeling of belonging returned. Despite what we said or felt, our spirit animals were mated for life. I forced the thoughts away and circled back. 
in human form. The hat would have blurred details on the ground, but I could make out creatures moving below. I scanned the forest as squirrels and other creatures scurried from our shadows. An updraft caught my outstretched wings, and I soared until the air became thinner and cooler. Here, the sounds of the human world faded, and my mind stilled. Bryson dove toward the ground as I continued the wide circles. He blew past me, then locked his talons in mine and spiraled us to the ground. We'd performed this ritual several times. The mating dance. As exhilarating as bird foreplay was, I wanted this feeling with him in my human body. Despite my earlier words, I wanted all of him, though I didn't know how much of that desire came from the firebird. In the end, it didn't matter. He doesn't feel the same. Chapter 6 A week had passed since Bryson and I put our relationship on hold. Things between us had gone from bad to worse. We barely spoke, and when we did, the conversation revolved around work. I'd taken to going in at midday and working through the dinner hour to avoid him. My new routine had done the trick, but it wreaked havoc on my sleep schedule. I woke, alone in my apartment, to the phone ringing. I ignored it, my standard response to a phone call this early in the morning. In the back of my sleep-addled brain, I knew the ringtone meant something important, but couldn't get the neurons firing. On the second ring, I remembered that I'd said, I shot the sheriff, as Aaron's sound. It was in bad taste, but he didn't call me when he was within earshot of the phone, so I didn't see a problem. I scowled at the clock. 5.55 qualified as the butt crack of dawn in my book. Hello? Tessa, sorry to wake you. We have a murder. I could use your help. Aaron spoke in hushed tones as a woman wailed in the background. I'm up. Can you text me the address? From the sound of it, he needed a victim's advocate more than a psychic. Not that it mattered. Both tasks took an emotional toll but people tended to accept the help of a social worker type much more than a red-headed soothsayer. What's the name? Aaron sighed. The deceased is Simon Reyes. Marty Reyes, the victim's wife, is here. I stared at a picture of Aaron, Bryson, and me on the shelf until my guilt forced my feet to the floor. The woman's cry still echoed in my head as I pulled on a pair of khakis and official police polo. Some people handled violent deaths with quiet grace, while others went into hysterics. I hadn't found a reliable way to predict what I'd encounter at a crime scene. Age, race, sex, nor social status mattered when it came to guessing how a loved one would react to the unthinkable. I tripped over my laptop bag on the way to the door. My apartment had reached the catastrophic level of disgusting. If I didn't clean it soon, men in biohazard suits would tape off the perimeter. My thoughts drifted to Gavin and Michael's house, model home spotless. How do two people with full-time jobs keep their place so clean? We're never home, a male voice whispered. Considering what I did for a living, hearing voices shouldn't have come as a surprise. However, hearing voices in my apartment unnerved me. Hello? Silence. Hello? Is someone there? I closed my eyes and focused on the energy in the room. A flutter near the window drew my attention, but the spirit vanished. I went to the kitchen in search of food and caffeine. Hunger and I didn't do well together, and coffee was the best defense against wayward spirits interrupting my personal thoughts. I suspected it had something to do with my level of alertness. Then again, lack of sleep could cause my magic to go haywire, too. I stuffed a Pop-Tart into my purse and grabbed a bottle of Frappuccino from the fridge. If nothing else, the spike in blood sugar would perk me up. Inside my car, I looked up the directions to the murder scene. At this hour, the freeway wouldn't be too bad. 
Despite over a decade of construction, Orlando's main interstate remained a parking lot most of the day and half of the night. I flipped the radio on to keep me company on the drive. Hanging by a moment blasted through my speakers. Odd, considering I'd set the station to NPR. I turned onto the highway and hummed along with a mouthful of toaster pastry. The familiar voice of the NPR news anchor filled the airspace, but as I pulled into the traffic lane, another song cut her off. The 80s classic, Don't You Forget About Me, blared. Mr. Partridge, is that you? I half expected an audible voice to answer, but nothing happened. A car cut me off and I overcorrected, landing on the shoulder of the highway with Frappuccino down the front of my shirt. Damn it! As I mopped up the mess, I whispered the chant Bryson taught me to quiet the spirits. Go now from me. It is time to rest. Go now. Leave me in peace. I promised myself I'd pay Michael a visit as soon as I finished with the new case. Even if Mr. Partridge hadn't attempted to contact me, something about the case prickled my subconscious. I turned the radio off and eased back into my lane. The type of silence that left me feeling lonely accompanied me the remainder of the drive to Belle Isle. I didn't need the GPS to find the house. Several people had gathered on the sidewalk, some still wearing their pajamas. A woman stood, huddled in the center of the throng. I stepped from my car and met her swollen red eyes. Marty Reyes? At the mention of her name, she burst into tears. Yes. I offered her my hand. I'm Tessa Lamar, a victim's advocate with Orange County PD. Is there somewhere quiet we can talk? She looked toward her house. They won't let me in sight. I lowered my hand. The police can't allow anyone inside while they conduct their investigation. Perhaps a neighbor would let us use their living room while we wait? A young woman with three children weighed. Y'all can come to my place. I have to get the kids ready for school. What kind of mother brings her children to a death scene? I smiled, praying that someone else would volunteer. The neighborhood gossips were always the first to offer their houses. Thank you, but this sort of conversation is best left to adults. She gave me a dirty look, but took the hint. An elderly gentleman stepped forward. Marty, you're welcome to use my living room. Mrs. Reyes glanced at the man and nodded. Thank you. I offered my hand to him. I'm Tessa Lamar with the Orange County PD. He had a firm handshake. Robert Shaw, retired NYPD. Perfect. A former police officer would understand the nature of the situation and allow me the privacy I needed to question Mrs. Reyes without interruption. Lead the way. We followed him next door. As I walked into his home, I wondered how long it had been since he'd lost his wife. Despite the pictures of his children and grandchildren on the walls and mantel, the place had an empty feeling, like the life had been sucked out. Why are you here? You need to go to Michael, the voice I'd heard earlier whispered. It had to be Gavin Partridge reaching out to me. I didn't know another Michael. I glanced at Mr. Shaw to be sure he hadn't spoken. He clasped his hands behind his back in the unofficial cop stance. I'll put some coffee on. How do you take it? I like a little coffee with my cream and sugar. I smiled through the unnerving sensation that Gavin Partridge stood to my right. Black's fine. Thank you, Robert. Mrs. Reyes sank into the sofa. I sat beside her. Do you feel up to telling me what happened? She bowed her head. I heard a gunshot downstairs. At first, I didn't know what it was, but I had a feeling something was wrong. Simon, my husband wasn't in bed. I called to him, but he didn't answer. Then the front door slammed. Are you sure it was the front door? 
Yes, it has a bell on it, a, a Christmas decoration. I heard it jingle. Her eyes drifted over the photos on the end table. Oh, my God. How am I going to get through Christmas without Simon? I'd asked myself the same question about Charlie more times than I could count. The holidays always brought such pressure to be joyful, but seldom lived up to the hype. Without the important people in your life, they just plain sucked. Losing a spouse is never easy, but this time of year makes it even more challenging. Is there family I can call for you? I skipped ahead in my usual routine. Protocol stated I should continue the line of questioning and rap with calling a family member, but I couldn't keep my focus. Our daughter is away at school in Tallahassee. Her expression morphed from wide-eyed fear to a queasy resignation, as if she realized notifying family members would make the situation permanent. I'll call her after we are finished talking. I turned as Mr. Shaw returned to the room with our coffee. He set the steaming mugs on coasters. I'll be in the kitchen if you need anything else. Please make yourself at home. Thank you. I resisted the urge to cradle the cup for comfort. Instead, I maintained an open posture and waited for Mrs. Reyes to take a sip. Do you have any questions for the detectives? She shook her head. You can call me any time if you think of any. The detectives can be hard to contact. Something brushed against the back of my hand. I smoothed my hair, resisting the urge to turn. Do you have some place to stay for a few days? She went wide-eyed again. A few days? The investigation can take time. The police need to be sure they protect the scene until they've collected all of the evidence. The OCPD has funds set aside to help with a hotel if you need financial assistance. I have friends nearby. Her lower lip trembled, and her eyes softened. She'd come a long way from the screaming woman in the background of Aaron's call. Would you like me to call your daughter? She looked at me as if she didn't understand the question. No, I'd rather she heard it from me. I pulled a card from my pocket. Please feel free to contact me if you need any assistance with housing, cleanup, or have any questions about the investigation. I may not have all the answers, but I'll work hard to get them for you. She stared at the card. Thank you. Is there anything else you need before I go? She shook her head. I sighed at my untouched coffee and stood. The urge to pay Michael Adams a visit overwhelmed me, so much so that I hadn't done my best with Mrs. Reyes. Sure, I'd covered the bases, but I hadn't given her my full attention. Chapter 7 The Reyes' house buzzed with activity. I stood in the foyer looking for Aaron, but Mr. Reyes' bare feet drew my attention. He'd landed face down on the kitchen floor. A half-eaten apple and glass sat on the counter. I turned from the kitchen and walked into the family room. Unlike the house next door, the Reyes had no family pictures on the wall or mantel. The room felt sterile. I turned to a tech carrying several evidence bags. Is there a TV room or a den? He motioned toward the back of the house. Down the hall? Thanks. Is Detective Burns back there? Yes, ma'am. The text blush told me he knew who I was and had probably heard the rumors about my relationship with Aaron. When the news had broken the story of a psychic helping the police department solve a murder and rescue the victim's missing children, they also hinted that Aaron, Bryson, and I were an item. Thanks, in no small part, to Darlene. Aaron and I didn't have a blush-worthy relationship, unless you counted one make-out session and a ton of flirting before Bryson staked his claim on my heart. Aaron glanced up and smiled as he slid a laptop into an evidence bag. We're almost done here for today. How'd it go with the wife? She's going to stay with friends in town. 
Is she a suspect? I hated this part. I came to the scenes to assist the family, but more often than not, the family had committed the crime. He shrugged. Too early to tell. What does your gut say? My gut doesn't have an opinion. Anything else on you have an opinion? I cringed when a couple of the crime scene investigators glanced my way. Nope. Go ahead and do your thing. Aaron turned back to his paperwork. Between the nervous energy from Gavin's spirit and the number of police downstairs, I decided to start on the second floor. The killer could have come upstairs while the couple slept, though unlikely. I needed a few minutes of quiet to center myself before walking each room and touching any reflective surface in hopes of seeing a vision of the murderer. What are you doing? Gavin's spirit said. I smiled at a tech dusting the banister for prints. My co-workers already thought I had a screw loose. No sense in proving them right by talking to an invisible friend. I pushed my thoughts and emotions down deep and focused on the job. I know you hear me. I entered the master bedroom and ignored the rumpled bed, the family photos and the masculine robe tossed on the floor. People lived here but I had to think of them as victims, victims' families or curps. I placed my palm against the mirror. Images of the events that took place in the room flashed through my mind from newest to oldest. Marty Reyes had told the truth. She was in bed when the gun fired. I'm not going away until you talk to me. I need to see my husband. I whispered, we'll talk outside. Let me do my job. Your job is to take me to my husband. The investigators and the body on the floor left little room in the kitchen. I walked on the far side of the island and surveyed the space. I didn't need to know the bullet went through Simon Ray's forehead. The blood pooling on the floor wouldn't help me have a vision. The fact his eyes remained open and seemed to follow my movements didn't help me do my job. I turned to the breakfast nook and pressed my hand to the window. Nothing. The spirit continued to yammer in my ear as I attempted to read other windows, the mirror on the baker's rack, the shiny countertop. I caught glimpses of the co-workers' disapproving expressions as I continued. My focus slipped, causing my magic to falter. May I touch the glass? I motioned to a half-full glass of milk on the kitchen island. Sorry, Lamar, we haven't processed it yet. The female crime scene investigator smiled. The spirit scoffed. How can they smile with a corpse on the floor? Have you people no respect for the dead? I'd asked myself the same question many times until I learned to disassociate my feelings from the job. Or thought I'd learned. Whatever was going on with my emotions needed to stop. I couldn't function with a ghost and my internal noise rattling around in my head. As I made my way back to Aaron, I couldn't shake the feeling I'd let him down. I didn't get anything useful. I'll come back or check the evidence room in a few days. Thanks, Tessa. He tilted his head, studying me with his startling blue eyes. Once upon a time, those eyes had set the hook and reeled me in. I hated the way he could read me, as if I were a perp making up an alibi. I didn't need to say a word for Aaron to know when something was up. I should get going. Give me five. I'd like to speak to you. Sure. I turned and walked outside. Storm clouds obscured the sun. The lack of actual food and caffeine weighed as heavily on me as the darkened sky. I drew a breath and forced my shoulders down from my ears. My thoughts drifted among the man haunting me, the two deaths, the two men in my life, and my growing sense of unease. I prayed that whatever Aaron needed to talk about had to do with work. He emerged from the house with a concerned expression. Hey. Thanks for waiting. Want to grab some coffee? Bryson's expecting me. We have a full schedule today. 
as much as I needed coffee, I didn't like the look in his eyes. Aaron wore cop face for two reasons. He was elbow deep in a tough case, or he had personal questions. Since his current cases were straightforward, I bet on the latter. He stared too long, then turned his head. Did Mrs. Reyes mention lawyering up? No. She's still in shock. I don't think it's crossed her mind yet. What's going on with you and Bryson? And here it is. I shrugged. Nothing. Why? We went out for a beer last night. He said you two had an argument. I wouldn't call it an argument. We agreed to... Hell, I don't know what we agreed to. Just be friends? I nodded, hating the way it sounded and hating how hollow I felt more. He shot me a dubious look. You're okay with that? It's only been a few months since Charlie died and a lot has happened. I think it's wise to get to know each other better. Does that mean you're available for dinner and a movie? He dipped his chin and watched me through thick, dark lashes. I couldn't believe he asked me that. Technically, I was single, but Aaron and I worked together. While he knew Bryson and I had magic, he didn't know anything about my ability to turn into a mythical flaming bird or the significance of my relationship with Bryson to our people. Anything more than friendship with Aaron would be like going out with a powder keg while swallowing fire. I don't think it's a good idea to date someone you work with. Aaron chuckled. You work with Bryson? Yes, and it's hard. I couldn't handle it if this job became awkward, too. He ran his hand down my arm. So come to a friendly dinner and a movie with me. Lunch and a matinee this Sunday, after church. I found myself smiling, despite the little voice inside my head telling me I'd regret this decision. After church means lunch with me and Dottie. Uh Uh-huh. It also meant Bryson would be there. We'd likely miss the early movies, and I could bow out of alone time with Aaron. He scratched his head. Deal. See you Sunday. I fished my keys out of my purse. I'm headed over to the Partridge house. Call it in and make sure you have officers on site before you go inside. Will do. Is the scene cleared? Not yet. Should be in a few days. It's looking like a suicide, but I'm willing to chalk it up to an accident. Man hanging lights falls from a ladder and accidentally hangs himself in the backyard. He looked away and frowned. If it was suicide, why'd he wrap the lights around himself? Why didn't he tie them around his neck and be done with it? Aaron sighed as he leaned closer. The lights may have tangled around him after he stepped off the ladder. There were signs that he struggled. I wrapped my arms around my middle. I hate Christmas. Me too. The holidays always bring out the crazies. Aaron followed me to my car. I slid into the driver's seat and he leaned in. For one terrifying moment, I thought he might kiss me. Instead, he glanced at the empty Frappuccino bottle and Pop-Tart wrapper. Breakfast of champions? You know it. I fastened my seatbelt. Bye, Aaron. Drive safe. He closed the door and walked back toward the house. I drove a couple of blocks and pulled over. My forehead hit the steering wheel. What the hell am I doing? What's Aaron doing? I didn't know if I wanted to laugh, cry, or punch something. Instead, I picked up the phone and dialed Michael Adams. Chapter 8 Michael met me in the driveway of his house. The police sticker marred the front door like a zit on picture day. It announced to the world that life wasn't as perfect as it seemed from the outside. I pulled my purse higher and plastered a smile on my face. Despite my feelings to the contrary, I didn't know this man, and I had no idea how he'd react to hearing about his dead husband's ghost. Good morning. Thanks for meeting with me. 
The hair on the back of my neck stood on end. It's afternoon. He gave me the once-over. Do you have any idea when I might be able to get inside my house? My still undigested breakfast churned in my stomach. I knew better than to come to a death scene unescorted. Should Michael decide to force his way inside or take something from the house, I couldn't stop him. I believe the police are almost finished. I spoke with Detective Burns this morning. I contacted my lawyer. He warned me that the cops would try to keep me out as long as they can. He's working on a petition today. Lawyering up. Not good. Let me see if Detective Burns is available to meet with us. If nothing else, he can escort you inside so you can gather some of your belongings. I don't want to gather my belongings. I want to sleep in my own damn bed. Let me see what I can do. I dialed Aaron and set up a silent prayer he'd answer his phone. Hey, Tessa, did you change your mind about coffee? He sounded amused. I'm at the Partridge Adams house. Is there any chance you can come by? Mr. Adams has some questions and he'd like to return home. Don't you have uniformed officers with you? His voice didn't sound as smiley. I braced myself for his reaction. No, it slipped my mind. Damn it, Tessa. I'll be there in 20. He disconnected. I turned to Mr. Adams. Detective Burns will be here soon. Would you mind if we walked through Mr. Partridge's former residence? I'd like to see if I can get a feel for him. Sometimes it helps to be surrounded by their things. My lawyer advised against working with you. What happened to the man I'd met the night before? The one who would have lifted a semi-truck to get justice for his husband? I understand. Is there anything else you need from me? Funeral arrangements? Notifying family? Or obtaining the death certificate? The voice that had spoken to me all morning screamed in my head. He lashes out when he's hurt. Tell him to stop being an ass and take you in my house. I pressed my hands to my ears before I could stop myself. The voice boomed from the inside, but my instincts told me to protect my eardrums. Michael's eyes widened. Are you okay? Embarrassed and without a rational explanation, I nodded. Gavin Partridge wouldn't give up. He acted like a boorish prig for weeks after Betsy died, refused to get another dog. Tell him what I said. I decided to go for broke. Who's Bitsy? Michael's eyes filled with unshed tears. Gavin told me you lashed out after she passed away. The anger you feel is completely normal, even more so when the loved one dies unexpectedly and under suspicious circumstances. Gavin spoke to you? The color drained from his face. Yes. What? <clears throat> what did he say? I swallowed hard and prepared for an explosion from the emotional man. To stop being boorish, Michael laughed loud and shrill. <laughs> That's Gavin. To hell with it. Come with me. Mr. Adams, let's wait for Detective Burns. Your legal counsel advised you against working with me. Should you have second thoughts... I could be accused of coercing you into allowing me into Gavin's home. I stood on shaky ground any time I used my abilities in front of a victim or family member. Toss in skeptical attorneys, and things could end badly for me. Madison will deal. He's an old friend, overly cautious and a devout atheist. He turned and walked toward the house next door. Despite my conscience telling me to wait for Aaron... I followed a few feet behind. As I entered, the difference in decor between this house and the one Michael and Gavin shared struck me. This felt like a home, lived in and welcoming. It reminded me of something out of a pottery barn catalog. For the first time since I rolled out of bed, my shoulders relaxed. How had I missed the effect Gavin's spirit had on my psyche today? 
As I've said, we've been using this as a guest house. Most of Gavin's personal things are at my place. The furniture and household items here are his. Michael motioned me to the kitchen. He loved to cook. I wandered into the stainless steel and granite kitchen. I had no idea what half of the appliances did, but I knew enough to be impressed. Feel free to walk around. The master bedroom and office are on this floor. There are two bedrooms and a den upstairs. He met my eyes. Is he here now? I can feel him, but he hasn't spoken since we came inside. Ask him what happened. I frowned as I searched for the right words. He may not remember much about how or why right away. The fact he's still here tells me there is unfinished business. He'll go when his soul is at peace. Gavin whispered, I was hanging lights for the party and someone came. I didn't hear him until he was behind me. I repeated Gavin's words and added, Please take what he says for what it is. It could be the truth or it could be false memories. Until I can see it in a vision, I don't know for certain. Michael ran his hand through his hair. Did he say who it was? I shook my head and sank deeper into dangerous territory. My mouth had a way of running three yards in front of my brain. I knew better than to discuss these sort of details with a grieving man, but once again, I'd given in to a knee-jerk reaction. My phone rang, shaking me from my thoughts. I excused myself and walked onto the patio. Hello? My mother's voice had a timbre few would call pleasant. Today, it grated my ears like a cat with its tail caught in a fan. Darlene said, Tessa Marie, you and Bryson are coming to dinner tonight at my place. I'm cooking 6.30. Don't be late. I'm out on a case, and Brasson is managing the medicine shop on his own. I'm not sure either of us can make it. You have to come. I need you to bring May and Dottie. Spending time with Darlene was bad enough, but eating her cooking ranked up there with Chinese water torture. I'll try. Do better than try, Oh, and pick up a couple of bottles of wine and some grape juice. What? I pinched the bridge of my nose to stave off a headache. Since when did Darlene drink wine? Right, forget the wine and grape juice. Make it rum and get some of that pina coconut mix. Pina colada? That's it. Stone likes fruity drinks. Better pick up a blender, too. I sold mine at a garage sale. Chapter 9 Aaron arrived and assured Michael the police would clear the house as soon as possible. After the brief conversation with his dead husband, Michael had calmed down enough to listen to reason and stay clear of the backyard death scene. I had no desire to witness Gavin's death with Michael watching. Not to mention, I needed free reign to relay information to Aaron, no matter how gruesome. I wandered around the tree where Gavin died. The police had taken the Christmas lights to the station as evidence. Even the fragments of broken bulbs were missing. I walked to the pool ladder and ran my fingers over the metal handrail. Nothing happened. I had to get my head in the game. Between Gavin's constant presence, the thing with Bryson and dinner at Darlene's, I couldn't focus. The fire in my core felt distant, as if even my spirit animal had abandoned me. The harder I reached for my power, the more alone I felt. The emptiness stole my breath. What's wrong? Aaron placed his hand on my shoulder. The contact caused the firebird inside me to flicker. Bryson had a similar effect, only more pronounced. Aaron's unexpected touch shouldn't have awakened my spirit animal, not unless we were making out. On a whim, I grabbed Aaron's face and focused. Heat flooded my being from my fingertips to my core. I opened my eyes to find him staring. What the heck am I doing? My cheeks flushed, and I released him. Sorry about that. I needed to ground myself. You help me focus. 
dinner with my mom, the thing with Bryson, crap eat breakfast. No need to apologize. I turned and grabbed the handrail. This time, visions exploded behind my eyes. Crime scene investigators, uniformed officers, the coroner pulling the body from the tree. I watched my horror-stricken self staring at the dangling body. The images flashed from newest to oldest. He was murdered, I gasped. What did you see? The visions were distorted because the metal isn't flat, but I saw it. A dark-haired man knocked Gavin off the ladder, then hit him on the back of the head. He wrapped the lights around him, strung him up like a piñata, and secured him to the tree. Did you get a look at his face? I shook my head, trying to remember how to breathe. Most of the murders I'd seen were over in a flash. This one took time. The killer had stayed until the final credits rolled. He'd enjoyed the show. Hat? Built? Aaron led me to a deck chair. How tall was the ladder? Eight feet. A little over six feet then. He looked heavy, but width could be distorted too. I leaned forward. Gavin came too while he hung. It wasn't a quick death. The coroner said he hit his head but didn't break his neck. Aaron rubbed my back as I sat hunched over. The murderer hit him with something. A club or flashlight, maybe? I sat upright and glanced around. Did they find anything like a tire iron or mag light? Not that I'm aware of. Aaron frowned. Can you try again? Maybe read the window? I stood and gave my spinning head a moment to catch up with the change in position. The sunroom windows were closest to the tree. I pressed my palm to the glass and focused. The same images flashed through my brain from a different angle. I can't see his face. Aaron spoke, but his words were lost as the visions continued to flow. Gavin had a visitor earlier that afternoon, a blonde male. The two laughed and touched each other often. They shared more than a casual relationship. Oh, no, Gavin. Really? Aaron pulled me away from the window. What did you see? I dropped my voice to a whisper. Gavin was dating someone else. The perp? No. The killer had dark hair. This guy was blonde. Do you think they're related? I doubt it. The blonde left really, um, happy. Oh. He shook his head. Does the spouse have any idea? I couldn't understand how a newlywed could cheat. Why bother getting married? If he does, he's one hell of an actor. I need to talk to Michael Adams about this. I'll try to dig up some evidence that doesn't involve you. He paced the pool deck as he mentally snapped more pieces into the puzzle. You didn't get a look at the killer's face? No, but his build is similar to Michael Adams. Damn. A headache blossomed behind my eyes. I needed to sit and process what I'd seen. I'm spent today. You know me. After witnessing a violent death, I'm fairly useless. His cop face softened. You said I helped you focus? People I care about can ground me when I'm in high-stress situations. I tried to play it off with psycho babble, but wanted to slink under a rock and hide. I had no business touching Aaron. He glanced over the yard, then back to me. You said something about dinner with your mother? I rolled my eyes toward heaven, my usual reaction when someone mentioned Darlene. She's cooking. Bryson and I have to drive Dottie and May. Bryson's not around today. That's impossible. We're booked solid. I'm heading there next. He called and asked if I wanted to go surf fishing shortly after you left the Reyes this morning. Bryson never shirked his responsibilities. Something had upset him for him to cancel a day's worth of clients. Not something. Me. I'd upset him. No, he seemed fine when I left. 
The abandoned little girl inside me recognized this as the first step in him leaving. Darlene would go off for a day here and there, then a week or so, until finally she parked me on Charlie and Dottie's front porch with my suitcase. Bryson might have gone fishing, but by closing shop and going off without a word, he was teaching me to live without him, planning for the day he would leave for good. Sure, I'd told him I wanted to be friends, but only because I wanted him to argue. He didn't fight for me. For us. He left. I turned to Aaron. Come with me to my mom's tonight. I can't handle this alone. Dottie and May will be there. I dipped my chin and widened my eyes to look as pitiful as I felt. Please, I need you. Chapter 10 Grand May, ready to go? I walked further into my great-grandmother's kitchen. Any other day at this hour, I'd find her standing at the stove cooking dinner. Aunt Dottie? Maddie padded into the kitchen, wagging her tail so hard her entire back end shook. She rubbed up against my legs like an 80-pound cat, then moved on to Aaron. Weren't they expecting you? Aaron scratched the dog behind her ears. Yes. I shrugged and checked the living room and both bedrooms. They're not here. Aaron crouched down and retrieved a half-eaten piece of paper and the remnants of a bread wrapper from beneath the table. It's a note. Darlene picked them up earlier. I narrowed my eyes and pointed at the dog. What did you do? Maddie slunk into the corner with her head hung low. She gave you an out when she ate the note. We can skip dinner with Darlene. It's been a long day and you seem out of sorts. He reached for my hand. Maddie growled and moved to my side when he touched me. It's okay. Down, girl. I pulled away and stuck my head in the fridge to search through the recycled butter bowls and whipped topping containers. Let's stay here. May always has leftovers. I'm sure I can find something. Aaron made a kissing sound to call the dog to him, but she remained by my side. I turned with a plastic bowl in each hand and caught Aaron staring. Maybe this wasn't such a good idea after all. We're both adults here. Nothing's gonna happen unless we want it to. The way he looked at me told me that at least one of us wanted it to. I couldn't cross the line, or wouldn't. Not until I came to terms with the Bryson situation. I put the containers back in the icebox. Let's grab burgers at that place down by the station. I'd like to get a look at the murder weapon in the partridge case if forensics is finished doing their magic. He opened his mouth to speak, but my phone interrupted. I glanced at the number and sighed. Hi, Mr. Adams. Aaron frowned and folded his arms. Michael's voice boomed through the connection. You left without telling me. Did you find anything? Did Gavin say anything else? I angled myself away from Aaron. I'm sorry. We had a call and had to leave abruptly. I should have let you know when we finished. Gavin didn't reach out to me again while we were there. Michael made a strange sound, half sob and half laugh. That's Gavin always making things harder than they have to be. Will you be back? I'm not sure. It depends on what the detectives want me to do. In any case, I usually wait a couple of days between readings. Thank you, Tessa. I can't begin to tell you what you did for me today, knowing he didn't leave me on purpose. You're welcome. I frowned, not wanting to believe this man could have killed his husband. He disconnected. I turned and met Aaron's accusing expression. I'd broken the rules, and he knew it. What's going on with you? I shifted my weight from one foot to the other, wondering to which of my issues he referred. Nothing. That was Mr. Adams. We didn't let him know we'd finished. Yeah, I got that. You need to keep your distance. He frowned. 
I'm not talking about work. What's going on with you? I couldn't go into the problems with my magic and the firebird, so I went with the obvious. I'm second-guessing breaking things off with Bryson. He shrugged, but I caught a flash of something in his eyes. Guilt? Did he say anything? I trusted Aaron. He might twist things a little to suit his needs, but he'd never outright lie to me, not if it meant he'd hurt me. And this would hurt me. He said you two agreed to take a break. You needed time. Aaron sighed. He's upset, but he loves you. So you admit to flirting with your friend's woman? I grinned, hoping to lighten the mood. I have a bad habit of falling for people I can't have. He motioned to the door. Let's go. I'm starving. I'm sorry, Aaron. Things are complicated. Bryson and I have a duty to the tribe. A duty to our race, but I couldn't tell him that. The elders had considered killing Aaron because he knew too much about Bryson and me, but we'd tricked them into putting him under our protection. I didn't know what it meant for Aaron that Bryson and I had split up. Life is complicated. He moved toward me, and my phone rang. I turned and put the phone to my ear. Hello? Tessa Marie, where are you? We're almost ready to sit down for dinner, my mother screeched through the connection. I'm at Mays. You told me she and Dottie needed a ride to dinner, remember? Oh, plans change. I picked them up hours ago. Now, you get your fanny over here. Dinner's getting cold. Nobody likes cold fried chicken. Actually, a lot of people like cold chicken. I couldn't resist giving her a hard time. I assumed she'd picked the ladies up early to have them cook. Tessa Marie Lamar, I'm in no mood for your sass. We're sitting down in ten minutes with or without you. Yes, ma'am. On the way. I slid the phone into my pocket. Maze fried chicken at Darlene's. The ambiance is lacking, but we can't beat the food. Sounds good. Aaron's smile didn't reach his eyes. We spent the drive to my mother's in silence. No police dispatch, no music, no conversation. Only the heavy weight of hurt feelings and the sound of tires on the road. I wanted to fix things, but I didn't know where to start. Aaron had come on strong, but Bryson had given up. My feelings didn't seem to matter, not that I knew how I felt about anything anymore. The one thing I knew for certain was I needed to get out of the car. Stone stood in the doorway of Darlene's duplex, wearing a Nirvana t-shirt, a pair of worn-out cargo shorts, and a grin. Glad you could make it. Where's Bryson? I forced a smile. He's out surf fishing. Bummer. I like that dude. Stone glanced at Aaron, and his grin faded. Likely he knew a cop when he saw one. This is Aaron, a friend of mine. We work together. I smiled as Stone held the door for us. It came as no surprise when he disappeared down the hall. I guessed he went to make sure his bong was out of sight. About time. Where's Bryson? Darlene pursed her lips. Aaron stepped forward and offered her his hand. He's at the beach fishing. I hope you don't mind me tagging along. If your chicken is half as good as May's, how could I resist? May choked on her sweet tea. Of course her chicken isn't as good as mine. She can't cook soup from a can. Aaron flashed May a grin and bent to hug the short, round woman. Miss May, I've missed your smile. Right on cue, May grinned like a schoolgirl after her first kiss. Flattering an old woman is a sin, but I'm sure God won't mind this once. Good to see you, Aaron. Dottie stood and gave Aaron a hug, but when her eyes met mine, they were full of questions. We skipped lunch and worked late. I couldn't send him home to a TV dinner or burger from a box. I seated myself at the table 
and smiled at May's fried chicken and chunky mashed potatoes, as well as Dottie's award-winning green beans. If Darlene had warmed the bread, it'd be a miracle. Did you bring the peanut coconut? My mother narrowed her eyes. Perfect. Not only could I use a drink, but I'd sit myself in her crosshairs. It slipped my mind. No bother. Darlene set glasses of sweet tea in front of us and took her seat beside Stone. I didn't understand her response. The lack of snide comments and dirty looks concerned me on a new level. She has something up her sleeve. Stone frowned at the chicken and reached for a small plate of beige-ish cubes I assumed was tofu. May made a noise, stopping him mid-grab. We should say grace. May took mine and Dottie's hands. Grand May, you know Stone doesn't believe in organized religion. Darlene pressed her lips together in a not-so-patient smile. There ain't nothing organized about saying grace. May nodded her head toward Aaron. Please bless our food. Aaron's eyes moved from May to Darlene and then to Stone. He must have decided that May presented the greater threat because he took my hand and bowed his head. Dear Lord, thank you for this food we're about to eat. Thank you for the love and hands which prepared it. In your name we pray. Amen. May made eye contact with Stone, but spoke to Aaron. In Jesus' name we pray, Jesus. Aaron nodded. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The amendment to Grace seemed to appease May and piss Darlene off. In my book, that made it a success. When Stone excused himself to answer the door, I felt sorry for him. He had no idea what he was up against. May would have him dressing for dinner and attending Sunday school within the month. Aaron gave my hand a squeeze and leaned to whisper in my ear as my spirit animal roared to life. Bryson stood behind us, staring at our entwined fingers. Chapter 11 Aaron released my hand before I could make sense of the look on Bryson's face. Angry? No, not quite angry. Surprised? Irritated? Hurt? All of the above? I gave up and turned away. I couldn't understand my emotions, let alone his. Aunt Dottie seemed to grasp the situation and swooped in to save me. We just finished Grace. Pull up a chair. Tessa will set a place for you. My brain kicked in and I stood to get an extra plate and silverware. What would you like to drink? Water's fine. Bryson's tone was as rigid as his posture. Did you catch any fish? Aaron scooted our chairs down to make room. Enough for a decent meal. He leaned and kissed May's forehead. I cleaned them already. Would you like them in the freezer or fridge? May patted his hand as he sat. I'll fry them up tomorrow. When I returned to the table, Bryson had seated himself in my spot. I set my place between the two men and handed Bryson his ice water. Scrunched in a testosterone sandwich, I had no idea what to say to break the tension in the air. Unfortunately, Darlene had no such issue. How do you all fit in one bed? May slapped the table. We have better things to do with our mouths than sex talk. Dig in, the food's getting cold. I guess when you're all stacked up, the size of the bed doesn't matter. Darlene giggled. Everyone turned to her with the same look of impatience. Everyone except Stone, who appeared to be considering the logistics of a threesome. I didn't dare open my mouth for fear of landing a size eight sandal in it. Instead, I passed the potatoes. The sooner we ate and washed the dishes, the sooner I could get out of here. To my surprise, my mother let the conversation end and focused on her chicken. I wondered why Stone didn't protest. 
Maybe she'd finally come clean about her lack of concern for God's creatures. For his part, he kept his eyes low and avoided looking at the growing piles of bones on our plates. Darlene waited until the end of the meal to knock her knife against her glass. Everyone, Stone and I have an announcement. I drew breath and waited to hear the poor fool had asked my mother to marry him. She'd married men in less time, but considering their differences in age, religion, social consciousness, and most everything else, I hadn't expected her to rope him in this quick. Stone took a swig of tea and announced, Darlene and I are expecting a baby. Mama, you're almost 45. Maybe you missed your period because of menopause. I blurted the words before I thought about the repercussions. Darlene glanced at Stone, who seemed confused. 38 is not almost 45, Tessa. Oh, crap. So what? She had me at 13? She went to a doctor to confirm it. That's why she's eating meat. The doctor said she needed extra protein. Stone smiled at Darlene. If she had bothered to visit a doctor, I'd bet my right arm the obstetrician hadn't mentioned anything about needing extra protein. Before I spoke again, Bryson pinched my thigh. I ground my teeth to keep from yelping. I'd have a bruise by morning. Congratulations. Bryson lifted his glass. May and Dottie exchanged a look, but raised their glasses without a word. The traitors. Congratulations, Mama. The words tasted like ash. Her one saving grace was that she did not have more children after me. No one deserved to grow up the way I did, abandoned and unloved by their mother. I wondered what sort of father Stone would be. Would they raise my little brother or sister to be a miniature hippie vegan? Could Darlene raise a child? Or would she ship it off? May and Dottie were too old to care for a baby, which left me. Thanks, everyone. She leaned in and kissed Stone on the mouth. I stood, toppling my chair in the process. I have to go. I forgot to turn in my paperwork at the station. Aaron righted my chair. I should get going, too. Congratulations, and thank you for dinner. May and Dottie called my name, but I hit the front door in a blind panic. I had to get out of there before I said something even more awful. Darlene's voice followed me outside. She's used to being an only child. She's just jealous. I stood in the driveway dumbstruck. I'd forgotten where I parked. This was it, the thing that would break me. I'd lost my grandfather, learned I wasn't human, been shot twice, and nearly died at the hands of a deranged conjurer, but Darlene getting knocked up would end me. Aaron jangled his keys and motioned to his car. You came with me, remember? I slid into his front seat and stared at the house. Bryson hadn't come outside. He had to know how hard the news had hit me, yet he hadn't bothered to get out of his chair. Are you okay? Aaron started the car. He just sat there. Did you come outside so he'd follow? I didn't appreciate the humor in his tone. No, I came outside because I was about to lose it, and I didn't want to upset an 87-year-old woman and a mother-to-be. It's pretty screwed up. He turned onto the main road and picked up speed. That's Darlene. It's sad. I don't think she knows who she is. She takes on the personality of whatever man she happens to be dating. Aaron glanced over. Do you know who you are? My mouth fell open. I wanted to punch him in his perfect jaw, but when I considered the question, I realized he had a point. Who am I? Everything I knew about myself had changed. I'm sorry. That was out of line. No, don't apologize. You're right. I have no clue who I am anymore. I don't think that's accurate. You're good at your job. 
You have these amazing abilities and a couple of knuckleheads who would lay down their lives for you. Aaron squeezed my hand. One knucklehead. The other is dumping me a little more with each passing minute. I glanced out the window, relieved to be close to home at the end of this day. He sighed. Technically, you dumped him. Bryson's doing what he thinks is right for you. He's giving you time to figure out what you want. Okay, then what are you doing? He grinned. I'm making sure you know I'm still an option. But you and Bryson are friends. Doesn't that break the guy code? He pulled into the driveway. I wish we'd met years before Bryson came along. I couldn't stand the pain in his eyes. My throat tightened as the truth spilled from my mouth. I care about him, about both of you. What if I were willing to share? I sat back in my seat and digested his words. I don't think Bryson would go for that. He nodded and stared out the windshield. And you? I'm not sure I understand. Do you care so much for me that you're willing to share me with another guy? Or do you care so little it wouldn't bother you? I care too much. Aaron cupped my cheek and turned my face toward his. I've been in love with you since we met at the coffee shop. My nerves got the better of me. I had to break the tension before I ended up in a padded room. It was the crutches, wasn't it? Damned sexy crutches. Damned sexy. He leaned across the console and kissed me. Chapter 12 Aaron dropped me off at my apartment. Part of me wanted to drag him upstairs, but the sane part knew I'd regret it. As soon as I closed the door, the stress of the day changed from nervous energy to exhaustion. So much happening in one day boggled my mind. One of the perks of living alone was I could make a mess, and no one cared. I left my shoes by the door. My shirt landed on the arm of the couch. My bra hit the floor outside my bedroom, pants near the bathroom, and panties outside the shower. I turned the water to a hair past scalding and stood under the spray. The tension in my muscles washed away, but the memories bored deeper into my brain. I needed to turn off my thoughts and shut down. A couple of drinks would do the trick, but that would involve going out. Meditation did nothing for me other than producing a detailed to-do list. The memory of Aaron's kiss and the idea of being the creamy white center in an Aaron Bryson sandwich made my thighs tremble. The second benefit to living alone was not having to worry about someone walking in on you while you were doing something naughty. And damn it, I needed naughty. I pulled the shower head down and flipped the spray to pulse. With my back pressed against the wall, I guided the stream to the right spot and closed my eyes. My imagination took over from there. Bryson's broad chest pressing against mine. Aaron's hard body moving against my back. Lips, hands, tongues, limbs entwined. I gave myself over to the fantasy. The curtain ripped open, and I dropped the hand shower, sending water spraying in all directions. A large male jumped back from the assault as I struggled to cover myself. In my effort to escape certain death, I slipped and landed on my butt in the tub. Damn it, Tessa! Bryson scowled and reached in to turn off the water. What are you doing here? I pulled my knees to my chest and wrapped my arms around my calves. I couldn't look him in the eye, or anywhere else for that matter. This day couldn't end soon enough. I was worried about you. I saw the trail of clothes and heard you. Please, just go. My wounded pride and sore bottom were nothing compared to the anger welling inside me. Bryson had come uninvited into my apartment, assumed I was getting busy with Aaron, and barged into my bathroom. 
Let me help you up. He offered his hand. I'm fine. I turned my head toward the wall. You're not fine. You're crying. He wrapped a towel around my back and shoulders. Can you stand? Hateful responses danced around in my head, but I kept them to myself. I pulled the towel around my chest and eased to my feet. My tailbone throbbed, but it'd be a cold day in hell before I admitted that to Brasson. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to scare you. No, you meant to catch me with Aaron. He flinched but put his hand on the small of my back and the other on my arm to help me step from the tub. Can we talk? It's been a long day. I worked two cases while you were off fishing. Then the bullshit tonight with Darlene. I'm not up for another lecture. Just go and leave me what's left of my dignity. Are you finished? His jaw set into a hard line. I nodded. Bryson pulled me against him and crushed my lips with his until I had to struggle for breath. I pushed against his chest and tried to turn my head, but I would have had more luck pushing a concrete wall out of the way. Nothing made sense. Why had he come here tonight? Had he really thought I was in the shower with Aaron? Why do this now? His grip on me tightened until I cried out, You're hurting me. I'd never hurt you. He tugged the towel free and leaned in to kiss me again. This time slower, but as hard as the first. I pulled back and met his eyes. His expression reminded me of an animal stalking its prey. The firebird stretched her wings, and my body exploded in a rush of heat. Smoke rose from the ends of my hair. I'm burning. Bryson scooped me into his arms and stepped into the shower. He set me on my feet, put the hand shower back in the holder, and turned on the spigot. Warm water flowed over my back as he drew me against him. I pressed my face into his wet T-shirt and sighed. Is this ever going to work between us? In time. He ran his hand down my bare back. But we can never be just friends. I lifted his shirt and nuzzled against his chest. My spirit animal flared to life again, but rather than set me ablaze, she pushed against the barrier between us, as if trying to force me to shift. I ignored her and fumbled with Brasson's belt. What are you doing? He cupped the back of my head as I ran my tongue down his chest, seducing my mate. I prayed he wouldn't stop me or that I wouldn't burst into flames before any seducing happened. Take these off. Brasson hesitated and stepped back. I'm sorry. I promised myself I wouldn't do this. My world crashed around me. At that moment, I felt more vulnerable than I had when he caught me playing with the hand shower. He'd started it this time, yet he refused to finish it. Questioning him would seem like begging and only amplify my humiliation. My eyes stung, but I refused to cry. I needed him to leave or Maybe I wanted to hurt him. I kissed Aaron tonight. Bryson didn't react, though I knew he heard me. I smiled and went in for the kill. You don't want to know what I was thinking about when you barged in. Pain etched his face as he turned and stepped out of the tub. A coward at heart, I stayed in the shower until I heard the front door close. Chapter 13 Aaron canceled lunch on Sunday, and I faked sick to avoid a run-in with Darlene at church. Over a week had passed since I'd seen Aaron, and I was beginning to think he avoided me at the station. I wouldn't blame him if he never spoke to me again after I used our kiss to hurt Bryson. I'd spent 40 hours working in the same house as Bryson without talking about anything personal. Michael Adams called every day at noon. Every call started with a hopeful voice and ended with whispered apologies for bothering me. 
By Friday, I wanted to come out of my skin. Our clients noticed the difference in the atmosphere as soon as they came through the door. Some commented on the tension, while others offered sympathetic smiles or comments about working with spouses. Even the dog steered clear of the two of us. We weren't married or even dating at the moment. Working with a man who perfected the art of indifference hurt on an entirely new level. How can he act so normal when I can barely hold myself together? Mrs. Matthews, one of the ladies from the weird sex ritual, came in without an appointment. I hardly recognized her. The transformation rivaled those on daytime talk shows. New hair, new clothes, new glow. She met my eyes and flashed a smile that'd bring an 80-year-old gay preacher to his knees. Mrs. Matthews, you look beautiful. Did you want Bryson or me today? I glanced down at my wrinkled T-shirt and worn-out jeans. I looked like something the cat dragged in, ate, and threw up. I need to see you. It'll only take a minute. She glanced toward my office door. Sure. Come on back. I smiled and ushered Mrs. Matthews into the room. What can I do for you? She grabbed my hands. Tessa, I just had to stop by and say thank you. I don't know what sort of magic you did to us the other night, but I feel like a new woman. I cringed behind my smile. I had no clue what I'd done and doubted I could do it again. You certainly look like a new woman. I've had more sex in the last two weeks than I have in the past ten years. I've lost twelve pounds, and my wrinkles have smoothed out. I owe it all to you. Thank you. I studied her face. She hadn't exaggerated the improvements to her skin. She glowed. Even her hair seemed shinier. The sex could have contributed to the weight loss and radiance, but... I suspected the magic had caused the changes. You're welcome. Mrs. Matthews leaned close and lowered her voice. The other women from the circle have had the same thing happen. People are stopping us and asking what face cream we're using. We didn't tell anyone about your magic, but could you do another circle? Not for us, but for some of our friends? My head spun. I couldn't remember the exact words I'd used. My chances of redoing the spell were slim. Then it occurred to me, if all the women from that night had turned into sex kittens, why hadn't I? Maybe I'd given them my mojo? I'm afraid that was a once-in-a-great-while spell. The moon and planets have to be aligned just right. Her eyes widened. I see. Well... Next time everything lines up, call us. I'll bake a cake. We can have a potluck before we dance naked. I'll keep an eye on the planets. I gave her a quick hug. Thanks for letting me know how it turned out. She squeezed me until I thought my ribs would snap, then left in a flurry of laughter and expensive perfume. I called my last client into the office, but my attention strayed. The woman complained of a sore back and headaches, not surprising with five young children. It struck me as sad that I identified more with this downtrodden young mother than I did with the vibrant sexagenarian who had left moments before. What happened to me? I stood and pulled down a mason jar filled with a particular type of mushroom and placed a chunk in a brown paper bag. Make a tea with this at bedtime. Use a half teaspoon of grated mushroom with eight ounces of boiling water. Let it sit until it's cool enough to drink. It'll ease your muscle pain and help you sleep. Thank you, Miss Tessa. She held on to the package as if it were a life preserver. You're welcome. Come see me on Monday if it doesn't help. I stood and opened the door. Oh, and be careful. It has aphrodisiacal properties. What? She looked from me to the bag. It might make you feel spunky in bed. Another baby won't help your back pain. Oh, thank you. No, I don't suppose it would. 
She blushed and hurried out the front door. Bryson came out of the kitchen with a steaming cup of God knows what that smelled like a cross between old cheese and dirty socks. He looked past me to his office, as if debating where to go. Don't worry, I'm done for the day. I sounded as tired and cranky as I felt. Take your time. He sipped his tea. Was that Betty Matthews in here earlier? Take my time? Take my time leaving the house that belongs to my family? My frazzled nerves sparked like cut electrical wire. Yes. He frowned. I saw Mrs. Jones at the store yesterday. She looked ten years younger. What exactly did you say during that spell? I don't remember, but it didn't hurt anyone. Mrs. Matthews was walking on air. Tessa, you know there's a cost for everything, especially magic. Oh, boy, here comes the lecture. Thanks, it's late and I have to go. I pushed past him and went into my office for my purse. I turned the phone off silent and scrolled through my messages, hoping he'd take the hint. Bryson stood in the doorway watching me. Can we talk? There's nothing to say. I disagree. He set his mug on the shelf and folded his arms, blocking my exit. It's been a long week. Can we do this another time? He opened his mouth to speak, but stopped when my cell phone rang. It's Aaron. The muscles on the sides of his jaws tensed. Answer it. Hi, Aaron. I kept my eyes on Bryson, gauging his reaction. I'm working a triple murder. The victim's families are here. Can you come? Our other advocate is out sick. The other advocate? Since I'd started working with the OCPD, Aaron had called me in on his cases. Now he called me as a last resort? I glared at Bryson. He had said something to Aaron. Why else would he avoid me? Sure. Text me the address. Get here as soon as you can and keep everyone out of the condo. He hung up before I could ask any questions. I shook my head at Bryson. Did you have words with Aaron? I did. His expression hardened. You had no right. It's affecting my job. I hurried to the closet and pulled out a spare uniform shirt and khakis. And him kissing you didn't affect your work here? The police department pays me in actual money. Bryson's expression hardened. I sighed and motioned for the door. I have to change. He turned his back, but stayed in the room. Will you call me when you're done tonight? I pulled the polo over my head and shimmied out of my jeans. It's going to be late. He turned and closed the distance between us. You can't avoid this forever. Sooner or later, we are going to have an adult conversation. The longer we wait, the harder it'll be. Chapter 14 My foot alternated between crushing the gas pedal and slamming the brakes on the drive to downtown Orlando. I tightened my grip on the wheel. Who does Bryson think he is? The argument was between us. He had no right taking it to Aaron. My GPS couldn't keep up with my anger. The high-rise apartment complex appeared on my right, and I jerked the car into the drive. The garage attendant instructed me to park on the top floor with the other police vehicles. I imagined they didn't want the other residents inconvenienced by something as trivial as a triple homicide. Once inside the lobby, a doorman headed me off before I could reach the elevators. His sour expression told me he'd had one heck of a day. Miss, you have to check in before I can allow you upstairs. I'm Tessa Lamar, victim's advocate with the Orange County Police Department. I'm looking for a Tiffany Mercier. Her mother was killed last night. You must keep your voice down. The man took me by the arm and led me to a hallway. The families are in the boardroom. This way. While I didn't appreciate him putting his hands on me, 
I understood he was doing his job by keeping the murders quiet. He led me down the hall and into a meeting room. Not one, but seven shell-shocked faces looked up at me from the table. This is Tina Lamar with the police department. He turned to go. Tessa Lamar, I called as he shut the door. I turned back to the room full of grieving family and realized I had no idea what had happened upstairs, only that three people were murdered. Detective Burns called me here to speak with you. I'm a victim's advocate. Do you know what happened to my mother? Who did this? How did someone get into the apartment? This place is like Fort Knox. When can we go upstairs? They continued to bombard me with questions without giving me a chance to respond. I waited until the assault slowed before I spoke. I don't have any details about the investigation. However, I can write down your questions and try to get answers. They stared, as if I had landed a spaceship on the table. I pulled a notebook from my bag and wrote down their questions. Bit by bit, I began to understand the situation. The women shared an apartment? Tiffany Mercier, the person who had discovered the bodies, hadn't said anything since I'd arrived. She moved her chair closer to mine. They sang opera together all over the world. They were retired, but performed at special events around Orlando. Did they sing at Epcot last year for the Food and Wine Fest? I recalled a trio of older women singing in the French Pavilion. Yes, they performed at Epcot every year. They were scheduled to sing at this year's Christmas extravaganza for the president. I'd heard something about Orlando winning the bid for the event. The city had gone up against Las Vegas and Boston for the right to host the annual celebration. Would you like for me to contact the organizers to let them know what has happened? Tiffany nodded. I glanced at the others in the room. When no one objected, I made myself a note to follow up with the Christmas people. Please stay here while I go upstairs and speak with the detectives. The doorman watched as I walked to the elevator and pressed the button for the 30th floor. I could only imagine what the rent cost in a place like this, and, judging from the business suits and designer dresses, it was out of my price range. The doors opened to a crowd. Excuse me. I edged my way through the wall of people. A resident noticed the logo on my polo and shouted, What's going on? Once they identified me as someone with the police department, my chances of getting through the hall decreased exponentially. I don't have any details. Please excuse me. Detective Samuels, Aaron's partner, spotted me. All right, people, let Miss Lamar through. There's nothing to see here. Go back to your apartments. Someone will speak with each of you soon. Samuels threw his arm around my shoulder and guided me through the throng of people to a secured area outside the apartment. How are you doing, Red? I'm breathing. Does that count for anything? He glanced at the condo door. Lately, it counts for a lot. What can I help you with? I need to speak to Aaron. His grimace told me all I needed to know. Aaron didn't want to see me. The family has a lot of questions. Someone needs to talk to them. That's why you're here. Samuels gave my shoulder a playful squeeze. Give me the basics. A smile crossed his face so quickly I thought I might have imagined it. I'll give you the basics on the case. If you give me the basics and what's up Aaron's ass? He's been off his game for two weeks now. My guess is it has something to do with you. Deal. I considered how much to share with Samuels. Aaron made a play for me. His expression changed from friendly to cop serious. And? And we kissed. Bryson and I are having issues. I wanted to piss him off, so like an idiot, I told him about the kiss. He exhaled air between his teeth and ran his hand over his head. You know Aaron and Bryson have become friends. I hung my head. I feel awful about it. As you should. But Aaron's playing with fire, and he knows it. Samuels winked. 
He knew about my firebird and enjoyed teasing me. He shouldn't have poached on another man's land. The boy's always been a horn dog. The need to defend Aaron rose up in me. Aaron didn't do anything wrong. Samuels tilted his head. The way he studied my reactions made me blush from the tips of my ears to my chest. I wanted to duck and run, but the crowd still blocked the hall. Put in a good word for me with Aaron, will you? Of course. I had no doubt he'd tell Aaron what I'd said, along with some heavy embellishments. Your turn. I'm a married man, Samuels chuckled. The case? Oh, right. Three dead females, ages in the mid to late 60s, GSWs to the head, all three found in their beds. My guess is the perp used a suppressor. Clean entry through the balcony door. Looks like a pro. Sounds like an execution to me. I wrapped my arms around my middle. Why would someone want to kill three opera singers? That's what we're trying to figure out. Can I walk the apartment? No can do. It's strictly need to know. Samuels glanced over his shoulder. Word came down from the top to keep this one locked up tight. Chapter 15 I relayed the cause of death to the family members and handed each of them my card. Usually, I'd ask some questions about the deceased lives to help me contact the spirits, but with the investigation locked down, I doubted anyone would ask me to use my unique skills to assist in the case. I hit a drive through on my way home. Bryson's car wasn't in the parking lot when I pulled in. Relieved and a little disappointed, I took my briefcase and sack of dinner to my second-story apartment. The place felt empty. I flipped on the late news for noise and sat at my desk. A burger in one hand and mouse in the other, I looked up the victims. Adèle Mercier, born in Paris, performed as part of a trio of opera singers. From the long list of links, it appeared she had a lengthy career. I clicked on a link to YouTube and watched a video of the women performing on an ornate stage. A glob of ketchup landed on the last of my semi-clean uniform shirts. I dashed to the bathroom to rinse it off in hopes of avoiding a full-scale trip to the laundry room. As I scrubbed the stain, the news anchor prattled on about construction on the I-4 corridor and videos of the victims played on my computer. A soprano voice rang out, accompanied by two others, singing Oh Holy Night. The beauty of the song stole my breath. I walked to my desk as if drawn by an invisible string to the computer monitor. Three women wearing red dresses stood before an elaborate Christmas display. I leaned closer and paused the video. In the background, a banner read, Three French Hens. The voice I'd heard in my car filled my head. Three French hens, two turtle doves, and a partridge in a pear tree. Gavin? I turned a slow circle, expecting to see the man's spirit in my living room. My phone rang, sending my heart into palpitations. I had to get a grip on myself. Hi, Graham. Tessa Marie, are you feeling better? Feeling better? Oh, right. Yes, ma'am. I assumed the reason I didn't see you all week is that you were still sick. It must have been a bad bug to keep you out of church two Sundays. Oh, boy. Sarcasm laced May's words, which only happened when something ticked her off. I'm feeling better. I was busy this week at the medicine shop. It is right next door. I saw your car there from sun up to well past sundown. I'm sorry, Grandma. I should have checked in on you and Dottie. I can come by tomorrow. Do you need anything? I hung my head. I'd allowed myself to get so wrapped up in boy drama that I'd ignored the two people in this world who would always love me. I'd like for you to call your mama. She's upset and it isn't good for the child she's carrying. Graham, I can't deal with her right now. I clicked pause on the computer. The last thing I intended to do was eat crow for my mother's sake. 
I'd rather have a tea party with the devil than call Darlene. Young lady, I don't care what you think you can deal with. The Lord doesn't give us more than we can handle. He gave you Darlene, and now a little baby brother or sister. The Lord didn't give me Darlene, Charlie did. He switched her dead baby with me, his daughter's child, so I'd have a shot at a normal life. In my mind, this was the one and only mistake he'd made in his long life. Yes, ma'am. Good girl. I'll see you Sunday morning, 9.15 sharp. You need to go to Sunday school in the service. I'll be there. I wanted to face Palm, but feared she'd know and come after me with a switch. I love you, Graham. Love you too, sweet girl. I drew every ounce of goodness that remained in my soul and dialed Darlene's number. Well, 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 if it isn't Miss High and Mighty, I have nothing to say to you, young lady. I rested my palm on my forehead and sighed. I'm sorry I ran out on dinner. It was rude. Damn straight, it was rude. You hurt Stone's feelings. I rolled my eyes. Please tell him I apologize. I was coming down with something. She laughed, loud and shrill. A case of the green-eyed monster. Seriously, Tessa, you could be happy for me and Stone. It wouldn't kill you, you know. I can't believe I raised such a spoiled, selfish child. I stopped listening after the first few words. I'd heard the tirade before, and I'd hear it again. I put my hand over the phone and went to answer a knock at the door. Bryson raised a brow when I put the cell back to my ear and motioned for him to come inside. He stood staring. I glanced down and realized I'd answered the door in my bra. My uniform shirt still hung over the bathroom sink. I hot-footed it to my bedroom and closed the door. Mama, I'm sorry about my reaction, but I have to go. Bryson is here. She continued to complain as I disconnected. I grabbed a t-shirt from the sorta clean pile, slid it over my head, and went to face Bryson. Excuse the mess. I haven't had time to clean up. I stuffed the half-eaten burger and ice-cold fries back into their bag and laid it on top of the over-full garbage can. We need to talk. Oh, right. Our adult conversation. I motioned to the couch and plopped down in an adjacent chair. I hated that he was right. My efforts to avoid this had created more problems than they had solved. He caught me at a good time. I was too tired to fight. Buck called. The elders want to speak to us. Buck, the head of the local Cherokee tribe, had tried to force Bryson and me into marriage and threatened to kill Aaron for knowing too many of our secrets. I'd known Buck since I was a child, but he'd played dirty after Charlie died. I didn't trust him and never would. Why? Bryson sighed. You know how these things work. He won't tell us anything until the meeting. Have you heard any gossip? Is something going on in the tribe? I chewed my thumbnail. This sounded ominous, but Bryson had a way of making lunch plans sound serious. I racked my brain for a reason the elders would summon us and came up with only one explanation. Our breakup? He shook his head. A few people asked if things were all right between us. Otherwise, it's been business as usual. Things aren't great between us, but that is none of Buck Oldham's business. The look on his face put the fear of God in me. Right? Bryson stood. Does tomorrow afternoon work for you? I don't have a hot date, if that's what you're implying. I regretted the words as soon as I spoke. It wasn't like me to lash out at people but my pain kept falling out of my mouth. I'm sorry. I don't know what's gotten into me lately. Bryson didn't react to my smart-assed comment or my apology. Do you still have clothes at the tribal house? He stood three feet away, 
And I'd never felt so lonely. I do, but I don't want to fly. I'll meet you there. Text me the time once everything is confirmed. We should show our strength and solidarity. So we should lie? Good night, Tessa. He walked out and closed the door behind him. Why can't I just be nice? I could have ended this with honesty and an apology two weeks ago. Chapter 16 I woke from a nightmare, disoriented and with my heart pounding. In the darkness, I could make out the shape of a woman sitting on the foot of my bed. I rubbed my eyes and glanced at the clock. 3.33 a.m. Tessa, my daughter. Achila stretched her hand toward me. You're here. All my life, my real mother had come to me when I was at my lowest. Things were tough right now, but they weren't that bad, were they? I placed my hand in her ghostly one. You cannot ignore what you are. You must embrace your true nature, or it will be lost to you. I don't understand. It occurred to me that her hand felt solid against mine. For the first time I could remember, I felt my mother's touch. Your spirit animal needs nourishment, the same as your human body. Neglect her, and she will leave you. My firebird eats? My mind raced. I'd shifted with Bryson a couple of weeks before, but we never hunted in animal form. The thought of it made me ill. She is fire. She consumes all she touches. She is magic. She can give or destroy. The choice is yours. Please, I don't understand. Please, speak to me like I'm a child. Her hand slid from mine. You are my child. But it is time you walk as a woman in grace and wisdom. I don't understand. Trust your heart, not your fear, and walk forward. Her body shimmered as it became more transparent. Don't leave me. I need you. I'm with you always. Achila's form faded with each word. I lunged for the place she'd occupied seconds before. Her scent, flowers and citrus, lingered. I pulled the quilt to my face and breathed her in. Why do you always leave me? I rolled her words around in my head. While I understood some of her message, the part about the firebird made no sense. The one person who might know what she meant had left frustrated and angry hours before. I hated that I needed Bryson, but hated that I missed him more. The clock hadn't moved in what felt like hours. In the calm of the night, I replayed my previous conversations with Bryson and Aaron. When did I become so needy? I'd always had a quick temper, but since Charlie died, I'd allowed my anger to make my decisions. Worse, I'd resorted to putting Bryson through hoops to prove his feelings. I'd become the kind of woman I hated. I felt powerless to change. I gave up on sleep and started a pot of coffee. The apartment needed cleaning and I couldn't afford to pay someone to do it. I put my earbuds in and cranked the music. When the sun rose two and a half hours later, I had three bags of garbage, four loads of dirty clothes, and a squeaky clean place. I stuffed my cell phone and keys into my pocket and dragged my laundry downstairs. At this hour, the washers were empty. So I broke the one machine per person limit and used all four. To pass the time, I scrolled through the news on my phone. Another murder had taken place last night. The musician in a local band called The Blackbirds was found dead in his car outside a local bar. The report didn't go into the cause of death or name the detectives working the case. Once again, I felt compelled to look for more information on the victim. Stuart Black had played lead guitar in his older brother's band for the previous six years. 
The Blackbirds had recently signed a recording contract with a major label. They were named the best indie rock band in the Southeast two consecutive years. I clicked on the video and sat back to listen. Three French hens, four calling birds. Calling birds. I repeated the lyrics several times. They rang a bell, held some meaning I couldn't recall. Four calling birds aggravated me like a sliver of glass in my heel. A quick Google search solved the riddle. The lyrics to the carol had changed over the years and varied by culture. The original song lyric went, Four collie birds. In regional English, collie was another term for black. Four blackbirds. I'd dialed Aaron before I considered the early hour or the lunacy of my theory. Yeah. He sounded like I'd woken him. It's Tessa. I need to talk to you. You're gonna think I'm crazy. Well, you probably already think I'm... It's not even seven. Why are you awake? Couldn't sleep. I doubted anything I said to him would make much sense until he had his coffee. I'm coming over. I'm not alone. Those three words slammed into me like a freight train. I'm not alone. I'm not alone. Tessa? Sorry, I have a spotty connection. It's not important. Call me later, or better yet, I'll send you an email. I hung up before he could reply. Aaron had someone in his bed? He'd told me he loved me. I'd shot him down, but... Wow. I snatched the empty basket from the floor. Blonde? I bet she's blonde and skinny. The firebird stirred, sending heat through my veins. She wanted to hunt. I chucked the basket across the room and stared as if someone else had thrown it. Okay, take a deep breath. Killing a police officer won't help. I needed a friend, but at this hour, the person I needed would be dead to the world. Haley, my best friend since college, and the only person who understood me when I couldn't understand myself, was five months pregnant and not a morning person. I didn't want to put this on her. I need a journal, I said to myself. You should get one. They work wonders. My great aunt Dottie smiled from the open doorway. I turned and threw my arms around her. She was the last person I expected to see and the one I needed most. How did you know I was down here? I heard you talking to yourself on my way to your apartment. A little birdie told me you were upset. She smiled and kissed my forehead. I groaned. Rising? Humor lit her eyes and made years fall from her face. I guess I need a new expression. No, not rising. I had a visitor last night. Charlie's worried about you. My heart broke like tempered glass. A million tiny pieces too dull to kill and too many to glue back together. I haven't seen him since the day he passed. I didn't know you had the sight. She eased me into a plastic chair. I don't. I talk to him all the time. Sometimes he talks back. He sent me here this morning. Is he well? I mean, does he seem okay? He's his usual happy-go-lucky self. Now, Tell me why I'm here. Bryson and I are having trouble. I'm working two full-time jobs, and I hurt Aaron. I rested my head on her shoulder and watched my clothes swish through the glass door. I could relate to being churned and scrubbed to a pulp. I wondered if I'd come out clean or in shreds. Darling, those boys both love you. There's bound to be some bumps in the road. You need to listen to your heart. As for work, you call the shots with the tribe. Set reasonable hours or they will run you ragged. It sounds so easy, baby girl. It is easy once you set your mind to it. She hesitated. Is something going on with your magic? Other than my lack of control? She furrowed her brow. 
Charlie said you needed to free it or it would suffocate. I sat back. A Sheila came to me. She said something similar, but I have no idea what that means. Me either, darling. But I'd take it seriously if I were you. I wiped my eyes. Dottie, have you heard any rumors from the tribe? Buck summoned Brasson and me to meet with the elders. I don't know what I'm walking into. Betty Matthews is telling everyone you performed a ritual and turned her into a sex goddess. Dottie grinned. Goodness, I didn't do anything of the sort. I frowned. So much for not talking about what happens in the medicine shop. Betty's always been the tribe gossip. She got old man Matthews to pop a tent a couple of times after all these years, and it's gone to her head. And <laughs> Dottie, I giggled, I'll never be able to look him in the eye again. She laughed. Just don't look down. Keep your eyes on his face and you'll be all right. Despite the horror of that mental image, laughter bubbled inside me. I hadn't had a belly buster in a long time. We sat like schoolgirls giggling over a boy until my stomach hurt. Family had a way of driving me crazy one minute and bringing out the best in me the next. Dottie showing up in my laundry room at the crack of dawn reminded me that I wasn't alone, no matter how lonely I felt. Chapter 17 Funny thing about waking up early in the morning, noon felt like nap o'clock. I closed the blinds and snuggled under the covers. Nothing had changed except my outlook on life, but for the first time in weeks, I fell asleep without any trouble. My cell phone rang. I glanced at the screen and sighed. Hi, Aaron. I'm returning your call. I'm sorry about throwing you under the bus with Bryson. I laid back and pulled the covers to my chin. It's over. He and I talked it out. His voice held none of its usual warmth. While relieved they'd settled things, I wondered why he didn't want to discuss it with me. Oh, right. He'd moved on. Good. Well, any luck on the cases? Nothing concrete. Did you pick up anything on your end? Not since the day in Partridge's backyard. This wasn't a good time to pitch in my hair-brained idea about the song. You haven't done your paperwork. I know. I'll come in and finish it tomorrow. I have a thing with Bryson today. I doubted the wisdom of giving myself a deadline with everything going on, but I hoped it would appease Aaron. My good mood slipped away with each passing second. I wanted to hang up so I could salvage my nap. You two patch things up? I closed my eyes and counted backward from ten. No, it's work-related. He sighed. I have to go. Bye, Aaron. I flipped my phone on silent and went back to sleep. About five minutes later, or so I thought, four hours had passed. I'd overslept for the meeting with the elders in Geneva. Bryson had left several messages. No, no, no! I had two options, drive and risk traffic and stoplights, or fly. Flying presented its own set of drawbacks, arriving naked, and leaving a window open in my apartment, to name a few. Ajila's words came back to me, and I decided to let my firebird stretch her wings. If nothing else, time in the sky might calm my temper. I composed a quick text to Brasson. Overslept, on my way, have clothes ready. I pulled the blinds and opened the window, facing the area with the least amount of traffic. Crouched beneath the sill, I drew my energy and focused on the fire in my core. The firebird burst out in a ball of flames. Before the human part of me could comprehend the change in my visual spectrum, the firebird launched into the air. A flaming bird would draw unwanted attention, but I couldn't focus enough to extinguish the flames. The struggle between my two natures continued as I flew over the city. The harder I resisted, the brighter she blazed. My fear 
fueled her determination until I could no longer fight. She would take me to her mate, to Bryson. We followed the St. John's River into the wooded area owned by the tribe. Bryson's presence became a homing beacon, drawing us forward at a dizzying speed. The smoke from the ceremonial fire rose in a column marking the location of the meeting. We dove toward the flames, but Bryson's hawk came out of nowhere. He blew past us, soaring higher in a wide circle. The firebird called to him, and he dove straight for us, locking his talons with ours. Spiraling toward the earth, we fell, intertwined, breathless, and enthralled. Our spirit animals had no need for time, or grief, or words. They recognized each other for what they were, lifelong mates. They played, they challenged, they loved in a way our human sides couldn't. Bryson didn't pull back until the flames of the ceremonial fire engulfed us. We shifted to human form, wrapped in each other's arms. I turned my face toward his, and my breath caught in my throat. I expected to see desire. Instead, I saw fear. I whispered, what's wrong? The elders want to bind your magic. Is that even possible? Why would they do that without talking to me? I couldn't keep the firebird locked inside me. How could someone do it from outside? Fear caused an adrenaline spike that agitated my spirit animal. He looked past me. Listen to me. We can resist this, but we have to work together. The elders gathered around the fire. I knew most of them by name, but a few new faces caused my heart to skip. They chanted a spell I didn't recognize. Bryson pulled me close, shielding me with his body. Focus, Tessa. Don't let them in. What? How? I struggled to put a wall around us, but magic slammed against me. The muscles in Bryson's shoulders bunched and his face contorted. Shift and get out of here. What's wrong? The firebird battered against my defenses. My fear and anger combined with her need to defend her mate. They're siphoning my magic. Fight it! I pulled away and tried to shift. The flames flared around us, but the firebird couldn't break free. With no hope of escape, I turned to Buck. We are Nunahi. We are as separate as we are a part of the First People. Stop this now! Buck avoided my eyes and continued to chant. When rational thought failed me, The firebird rose up and took control. She burst into existence and drew the ceremonial fire into herself. Seeing a threat to her mate, she unleashed a torrent of flames, forming a protective circle around us. Bryson lay shivering in the ashes. He didn't appear injured, but something was wrong. The firebird threw her head back and called to him as she took flight. The human side of me didn't understand why she'd left him behind, but I trusted her instincts. She swooped low and covered him in her flames. The fire absorbed into his body, and his hawk appeared. He shook his head and stretched his wings, but didn't join us in flight. She circled back and landed beside him. The birds nuzzled and preened to reaffirm their bond. I realized feathers had changed to skin when my cheek brushed against his stubbly chin. The intimacy I'd felt through our spirit animals seeped away, leaving behind the squeeze of uncertainty. I glanced around, expecting to see angry faces, but the wall of flames still shouted us from the elders. Are you hurt? I ran my hands over his back. No. I was so scared when I saw you laying there. The binding spell worked until you forced me to shift. His voice bordered on hostile. Why are they doing this? I stood naked, fighting a growing sense of isolation. I'd learned not to feel shame about asking for help, but I didn't have enough information to figure out what I needed. Other than for it all to stop, 
that spell you worked on the women caused some problems. We should go. He drew me closer. We can't run. We have to face this, or they will come for you again. Chapter 18 Rasen took my hand as I willed the wall of fire to lower. Thirteen hostile elders stared at us. The years I spent training to become a mental health counselor taught me that fear manifested as anger. I latched on to the thought that these men feared me as opposed to wanting to hurt me. Buck Oldham took a tentative step forward and tossed a blanket at my feet. Cover yourself. Part of me wanted to leave the blanket on the ground to spot him. Choose your battles, Tessa. I grabbed it and wrapped it around my shoulders. My mate requires covering. Bryson tensed as he turned and accepted a blanket from a man I didn't recognize. Tessa, daughter of Achila, granddaughter of Jasiqua, you have been found guilty of abusing your gifts and manipulating the women of the tribe, Buck said. I couldn't believe my ears. I hadn't hurt anyone. I have the right to speak in my defense. Your mate spoke in your defense, an older man said. We are mated in spirit only. He does not have the right to speak for me. Bryson sucked a breath between his teeth. Is this true? Buck glared at Bryson. It is as she says. I'd said the wrong thing, though I'd spoken the truth. I struggled between the instinct to run and my desire for justice. Landmines littered both paths. I'm not going to stand here and discuss my personal life. I will speak on my own behalf. Let me hear the accusations. The old man stepped forward. My wife has suffered from your magic. Who is your wife? Betty Matthews. I sighed and dipped my chin. She's behaving like a cat in heat. She refuses to see her responsibilities around the house and is threatening to divorce me. Buck said, I've seen Mrs. Matthews. She appears younger. May I? I smiled. The entire ordeal was a misunderstanding. I'd educate them and everything would be forgiven. Buck nodded. The majority of the women who come to me complain about relationship issues or problems in the bedroom. Most are unhappy with their sex lives. That is ridiculous, old man Matthews popped up. That does not give you the right to alter their natural state of being or ruin marriages, Buck said. I shook my head, refusing to back down. My grandfather's book is full of spells to attract lovers. What I did was no different. Besides, the old ways allow a woman to divorce a man by putting these things outside the front door. Divorce is a sin. Mr. Matthews shook his finger at me. That's your opinion. It's not my place to judge. I turned to Buck. Bryson testified you used some sort of group ritual with the women. Buck folded his arms and glanced between the two of us. I said that I didn't know what specific spell she used, but it involved female magic and a circle of women. Bryson took my hand. You had no right to try to bind our magic. John Macon, a new addition to the Council of Elders and self-proclaimed medicine man, stepped forward. We didn't realize the spell would affect you, Bryson. We must defend our people against the Firebird. Our duty is to protect the tribe. Suddenly the situation made perfect sense. This meeting and the elders' attempt to bind my powers had nothing to do with my ritual and everything to do with securing Macon's place within the council. Since we had no intention of claiming the position, I didn't see a reason for their overreaction. We could talk this out. I don't solicit business from the tribe. 
nor are Bryson and I part of this council. If you remember, we denounced any claim to my grandfather's position as medicine man. Yet, you acknowledge that our people visit you for healing, Buck said. Would you have us turn them away? Yes, John Macon folded his arms. Our people shouldn't rely on a whelp who doesn't understand her magic and the man she keeps at her beck and call. I glanced at Bryson's pained face. Do you have anything to say? I do not have a say in these matters, as I'm not an elder, and I'm your mate in spirit only. I turned back to the council less confident without Bryson's support. The people should have the right to choose where they seek help. We believe that you are too young and inexperienced to wield the power that you do. Buck nodded in Bryson's direction. Your spirit mate agrees. I turned to Bryson and saw the truth in his eyes. He'd said practically the same thing to me regarding our relationship. I needed time. Time to grieve. Time to grow up. Time to be worthy of him. This is how you feel? Bryson didn't answer. His silence confirmed my fears. I hung my head and asked Buck, what would you have me do? Allow us to bind your magic while you train. When you're ready, we will return it slowly, Macon said. Continue training with Bryson. It's the safest way. You wouldn't want to harm someone because of a mistake. No. I shook my head. Had the request come from Buck, I might have considered it. John Macon gave me the creeps. I couldn't allow him to take part of me and lock it up. I might not understand all of my capabilities, but I would learn in time. If you try to bind me by force, I'll consider it an assault and fight to protect myself, even if my mate won't. Bryson cringed at the last bit, but I didn't care. How dare he tell them I couldn't handle my magic? If you will not consent, you will be banned from these lands and our people at sunset. Buck frowned, having played his hand and lost. I accept your decision. My grandfather would be ashamed of all of you. What you do comes back tenfold. I only hope I'm there to see it when it does. I'm going to the water before I leave. I turned and walked to the river. I needed purification and a few minutes away from people to clear my head. Banishment seemed harsh, considering this land tied me to my heritage and to Charlie. I added it to a growing list of things I'd lost because of the firebird. The caress of the water desolated my tentative control over my emotions. I dove under and swam to the middle before surfacing. Bryson stood on the shore, watching me. I knew the look. I'd disappointed him. The feeling was mutual. I swam toward him until my feet touched the muddy river bottom. You should have talked to me about this. He dropped the blanket and stepped into the water, meeting me in the middle. I didn't know what they had planned until today. When you didn't show, I had to testify. They twisted my words. Maybe so, but you agreed with them that I should be bound. I met his gaze. I won't allow you or anyone else to take my magic. I understand. Do you? I wanted to believe him, to put all of this behind us and move forward. When they cast the spell and I lost my magic. He turned his face toward the sky. I knew I could never allow that to happen to you. Even if I can't control it? You'll learn. I doubted I'd learn in time to salvage much of my life. Why didn't you speak for me? I asked you what to do. He frowned and brushed my hair from my face. It wasn't my place. I love you, Tessa, 
but you cut my balls off back there. When I saved you? I would never understand men if I lived to be 200 years old. And with Nunahi blood, I just might. When you claimed me in spirit only. His crestfallen expression crushed me. We haven't had sex. We're not mates. Baby, sex has nothing to do with it. Then what does it mean? That we said the words. His frown deepened. I'm surprised you don't know this. How could I possibly know this, Bryson? I thought I was human until a few months ago. I shook my head. Words? Like wedding vows? Yes, but they're a type of spell. They allow us to share magic and bind our spirits. We share magic every time we work a spell together. This is different. I didn't understand why he argued. Our spirit animals had already made it, and joining our human side would help us with the elders. Let's say the words. He hung his head. Would you love me, if not for your spirit animal? I hesitated. I'd asked myself that question a million times, and had come to the conclusion I'd never be sure. I don't know. When you know, we'll say the words. He studied the sky. We should leave soon. Storm's coming. Chapter 19 Bryson drove me back to Winter Park. The clothes I'd left at the tribal house were missing, so I ended up wearing a pair of sweats and a T-shirt borrowed from one of the guys staying there. Both fit me like a sack, but it beat riding around naked. Leaving the land and the people that had meant so much to Charlie left me numb. I'd disappointed him, Bryson, and myself. Bryson had warned me not to test the elders more times than I could count, but I was so sure I could make them see reason. My pride cost me more than I cared to admit. Fire engines blocked the entrance to my apartment building. I chewed my thumb as we eased up the side street to get a better look. Oh, my God. I leaned forward and counted stories, though I knew what had happened the moment I saw the trucks. Flames engulfed my apartment. I leaped from the SUV before it came to a full stop and sprinted toward the entrance. A firefighter stopped me before I could reach the door. Whoa there, you can't go inside. That's my apartment. Is anyone hurt? I had to try to save what I could. I'd caused this. I'd hurt people just like John Macon said I would. You live in 428? He wiped soot and sweat from his brow. Yes, please. My neighbors. Is anyone hurt? Do you live alone? I blinked the acrid smoke from my eyes. My feet rooted in place. I couldn't look away from the fire. As of right now, all the residents are accounted for. He pointed at a man in a white uniform shirt and hat. That's Chief Color. He's going to need to talk to you. Do I need a lawyer? I don't know why those words fell out of my mouth, but they did, and I couldn't put them back inside. He gave me an odd look, then grinned. Come on, let's go talk to the chief. Bryson jogged over as the firefighter introduced me as the girl in 428 to Chief Keller. The chief was an older man with kind eyes. It looks like the fire started in your bedroom. I'm afraid your apartment is a total loss. Bryson put his arm around my shoulder for support. I wanted to shrug it off. I didn't deserve tenderness, though I craved it. I don't care about my stuff. I'm worried about the people who live in the building. I leaned against Bryson, searching for that sense of home, but it had vanished along with my worldly possessions. We're still putting out the fire, but we've accounted for all of the residents and maintenance staff. He glanced up at the building, then back at me. Did you leave a candle burning or something hot, like a curling iron plugged in? I shook my head and pulled away from Bryson. The distance between us choked me as much as the smoke. Do you have a place to stay? 
The chief glanced at us, no doubt assuming I wore his clothes. My family is local. I patted my pockets and realized I had no phone or keys. My purse was in the apartment. Tessa. Bryson handed me his cell. I stared at it, trying to remember why I needed a phone. The picture from our first barbecue is upstairs. He tilted his head. We can take more pictures. But I loved it. Of all the things I'd lost, I mourned a cell phone shot of the three of us in a cheap drugstore frame. It didn't take a psychology degree for me to realize I'd connected the photo to my hopes for the future. Every night since we'd broken up, I'd stared at it, so I went to sleep. Someone called my name from across the parking lot. Aaron ran over and pulled me into an embrace. He eased back, smoothed my hair, and hugged me again. I heard the call over the radio. Are you all right? I wasn't home. He pulled back, looked at my borrowed clothes, and released me. Aaron and Bryson exchanged a look before he turned and spoke to Chief Keller. I'm Detective Burns. Anyone hurt? No, it looks clear. We're putting out the last of it now. Keller stepped away to answer a call. I can't stand here and watch my life burn. I need to go to Mays. Before I'd messed things up, that statement would have earned me two offers of a ride and a staring contest between the two men. Today, neither of them seemed eager to spend 20 minutes in a car with me. After what felt like an eternity, Bryson said, I live next door. You can ride with me. Thank you. I handed him back his phone. I needed to give Grand May and Dottie a heads up, but some things needed to be said face to face. Aaron ran his hand over the back of his neck. Can I call you later? My phone's in the apartment. I have the number to May's landline. He looked at Bryson and me as if summing up the situation. I could come by if that's easier. It's been a shit day. I'm not really in the mood for company tonight. I added finding a locksmith and having a new set of car keys made to my list of things to do. I wanted it out of there, but Bryson showed no signs of moving. Aaron sighed. It's business. The murder investigations. I stared at him for a beat. I don't... I, I can't... All right, let's get you to May's. Bryson set his hand on the small of my back and guided me to his SUV. He opened my door and reached across to pull the seat belt around me. I stared out the windshield without seeing what lay beyond the glass. In the dimly lit vehicle, my reflection stared back at me with accusing eyes. How many people besides myself had I rendered homeless with my carelessness? Bryson slid into the driver's seat and started the engine. Tessa. Don't, I whispered. This isn't your fault. I shifted in my bedroom. I lost control as soon as I let the fire bird out. It is my fault. Chapter 20 I walked into Grand May's house and realized I no longer had a place here. Dottie had moved into my room, and Bryson had moved into her and Charlie's house when we opened the medicine shop. My choices for beds involved a lumpy sofa or Bryson's pull-out couch. Tessa Marie, what's the matter? Aunt Dottie came into the kitchen. Is Grand May sleeping? My voice sounded like the floor vibrated when I spoke. Sit, I'll go get her. Dottie gave me one last concerned look and hurried to wake me. I sank into a kitchen chair and waited. Maddie put her head in my lap and whined. I absently petted her until May came into the room. May took one look at me and went for the whiskey bottle in the cabinet over the stove. She grabbed three glasses and joined us. What's happened? I burned my apartment down. Honey, tell us what happened. I thought I had told them. Maybe I didn't say the words out loud. I burned my apartment down. 
May nodded and set her hand on mine. You said that, darling. Tell us how it happened. I told them the entire story. From losing control to Buck and the elders trying to take my powers to my troubles with Bryson and Aaron. My pathetic story took two shots of whiskey to finish. When I got to the part where Bryson dropped me off, they sat with stunned expressions. Jesus bless you, how are you still standing? May stood and wrapped her arms around me. My poor girl. I didn't know what I expected, but I didn't expect this. The moment May touched me, the floodgates opened and I started to cry. I held on to her as I had when I was little with a skinned knee. Dottie joined us in the embrace, rubbing my back and whispering it would be all right. May poured us another round, and the ladies took their seats. I felt better after letting it out into the open. If anyone could help me come up with a plan, these two could. Let's figure this out, May grinned, and slid another shot my way. The clock read after midnight. Maybe we should get some sleep and leave the plan until morning? Dottie squeezed my hand. Are you going to be able to sleep? No, but... May shook her head. No buts. Dottie, get a pen and paper. I didn't know what they had in mind, but I thought one more person should be at the table. Should I call Bryson? No, they said in unison. Maddie barked and sat next to the table panting. From the wild look in her eyes, she wanted in on the action. Seems to me he's part of the trouble. Dottie returned to the table and flipped to a clean page. Let's prioritize. What's the most urgent problem? I need necessities. Clothes, keys, phone, new ID. She jotted it all down. I can drive you around tomorrow after church to pick up some basics. I can't go to church in sweats. May frowned. I suppose the Lord will give us a pass if we miss service tomorrow. I breathed a sigh of relief. I'll call Haley. We were almost the same size before she got pregnant. Good thinking. Lord knows she won't see those tight jeans of hers ever again. May laughed. She can lose weight, Graham. Not when she's carrying that baby in her backside. Trust me, I know. May patted her ample hip. Moving on, Dottie tapped the paper. The Red Cross can help you get a new driver's license. Don't waste your time at the DMV. I need a place to live. I hated to bring it up because I didn't want to displace Dottie. She and May seemed to enjoy living under the same roof. May said, easy. There's an extra room at Charlie's. I use it for an office. Dottie shook her head. Bryson needs to empty out the third bedroom. It's time we got rid of all that extra stuff. I loved Charlie, but the man was a pack rat. I thought about Charlie's house with its three bedrooms and a den. It did work, except for the fact that Bryson and I weren't on the best of terms. Just until the renter's insurance check comes and I can get a new apartment. Dottie took notes. We love having you close, but a young woman needs her privacy. I think it'll do you good to stay at Charlie's with Bryson. May rubbed her hands together. I have a plan. Oh, boy. I didn't care for the devil in her eyes. Next problem? Dottie grinned. Buck Oldham and that damn council. May frowned. Do you like working with the tribe? I shrugged. I like helping people. Answer the question, May said. I'd asked myself the same question numerous times. I prefer my work with the police department. Good. I'll start spreading the word that the council banished you and demanded that you stop seeing folks. Let Buck and the rest of those old geezers deal with the complaints. May sat back in her chair. As for learning to control your magic, that's going to take time and practice. If you slow down, it'll come. Bryson is supposed to help me, but he makes it worse. 
She pressed her lips into a line and drew her brows together. Okay, I make it worse because I can't control my feelings, I corrected. Glad you can see it for what it is. She pointed at Dottie and motioned to the pad. Write this down, the boys. I'll handle the boys. I didn't want to get into my personal life, but the looks on their faces told me I had no choice. Yes, you will. And let me tell you how to do it. Meg gave me a toothless grin. You're too available. You work with Aaron. Let him see you every day. Be polite, but not too friendly. Put on some makeup. Do your hair. Let him see what he's missing out on, but don't go out with him. Okay. I didn't like the idea that I made myself too available, but I doubted advice from my elderly great-grandmother would help. May drained her glass. Do what you need to do during the day. Bryson works on his sculptures late into the night. Make sure he sees you in cute pajamas when he comes inside. Be sure to tell him goodbye when you leave for work in the morning looking nice. Get all dressed up and go out with Haley. He'll come around. When he does, you make him wait. But won't that leave me in the same mess I was in with the two of them? She shrugged. Do you want to choose? I chewed my thumbnail while I thought it over. Dottie pulled my hand from my mouth. I'm adding fake nails to the list of things to do. I don't know which one I want. I love Bryson, but I don't know if I love him because of what we are or because I love him. Dottie nodded. And Aaron? It's easy with Aaron. Or it was. He's seeing someone else. May shook her head. You know that old saying, if you love someone, set them free? Yes, ma'am. It's total horse hockey. If you want him, go get him by making him come to you. I tilted my head. But you said I was too available? Plus, Aaron is an outsider. The elders won't allow it. You don't answer to the elders. She smacked my hand. Before you go too far down either path, you need to make up your mind which one you want. What if I don't want either? May shook her head. Then hallelujah, find someone else. Honestly, girl, didn't you learn anything from Darlene? I grinned. I always figured she clobbered them over the head and dragged them home. May leaned close and whispered, Her hoo-ha isn't magical. She puts out the bait and the men bite. In your case, you have to put out better bait so you catch a good one. Chapter 21 The following Saturday, I had a new cell phone, makeup, unmentionables, two outfits, and shoes, all courtesy of Walmart. I also had a key to the car I couldn't drive without a license, new credit cards on the way, and a claim with my renter's insurance company. Haley had dropped off two bags of clothes and various bottles of lotions and potions to make me feel better. May had supervised Bryson and Aaron as they took the junk out of the third bedroom, scrubbed it clean, painted, and moved my new things into the room. She'd promised them dinner in exchange for their troubles, but I suspected she'd thrown in meatloaf and mashed potatoes so she could observe as I practiced her strategy with the guys. Though I'd followed her advice all week, I didn't think either had noticed me. Male voices carried from the dining room into the bathroom, where I stood putting on the finishing touches, lip gloss and borrowed earrings. I'd washed my hair and let it dry naturally. As a result, the red curls hung in corkscrews down the center of my back. Haley's skinny jeans and soft green sweater looked good, though the pant legs bunched at my ankles. I plastered a smile on my face and walked out of the bathroom. Aaron and Bryson stood when I entered the room, though neither seemed to know what to say. Thanks for helping out today. I glanced at the table, then walked to the kitchen to get the butter and a pitcher of sweet tea. You're welcome. 
Aaron said. Brasson followed me. Are you holding up okay? As well as can be expected, I handed him the tea. Thanks for setting up the room. He nodded, still looking at me as if I were something under glass. It's only until I get money from the insurance company. May mentioned that. I smiled and walked to the table. Once we all settled, May took mine in Bryson's hands. Dear Lord, thank you for our many blessings and for the food we are about to eat. I hope you don't mind that we missed service last week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The men exchanged a look. In all the times we'd shared a meal, May had never once said grace with a man at the table. An awkward silence hung in the air as we dug in. May cleared her throat. <clears> throat> Tessa, what did you decide to do about working at the medicine shop? I choked on my greens and took a swig of tea to wash them down. She knew darned well what I'd decided. I looked across the table at Bryson. I'm going to take a step back and focus on my work at the police station. His shoulders tensed as he nodded. If that's what you think is best. May patted Bryson's hand. Maybe you should focus on your art. Buck doesn't appreciate what you and Tessa do for the tribe. It might teach the council to treat you better. Bryson flashed her a quick grin, then met my gaze. I couldn't agree more. May continued. It was Tessa's idea. I looked at her with wide eyes. She'd lied at the table with the same mouth she'd said grace. Isn't that right, Tessa? May grinned. They don't seem to appreciate the work we do. I stuffed a fork full of potatoes in my mouth before she forced me to lie again. Aaron watched the exchange with a curious expression. Have you gone through the evidence on any of the cases? I held up a finger and swallowed hard, thankful for the change of subject. I'm waiting for the lab to finish processing everything. Has ballistics cross-matched the weapons between the Reyes, Mercier, and Black cases? He set down his fork and gave me his full attention. I don't think so. Why? I have a hunch it might be the same guy. Aaron shook his head. The M.O. was entirely different. Black was a drug deal gone south. Same kind of weapon? A twenty-two, but they're common. Tell me your theory. Dottie put her napkin on her plate and stood. Aaron dipped his chin. I'm sorry, Miss Dottie. This isn't dinner conversation. Oh, it's not bad. It's been a long while since I ate at this table. I'm afraid it's brought back some memories. She took her plate to the kitchen. Excuse me. I followed Dottie. Would you like to talk? We can go for a walk. Are you sure you want to leave May alone with them? I grinned and hooked my arm through hers. Let's go sit on the porch swing. We can hear if someone calls for help. The crisp night air reddened my cheeks as we settled on the swing and listened to the crickets. I hated seeing her upset, but it felt good to be there for her for a change. I have my moments when I still can't believe he's gone, she whispered. Me too. He's proud of you. She turned and smiled. He always was, but with everything you've had to face since he passed. My chest tightened. How could anyone be proud of me these days? I keep messing up. Your grandfather wasn't as perfect as you think. He was wild when he was younger. She stared into the distance with a smile. We met at a teen mixer in the old tribal community building. He was the most handsome man I'd ever seen. They let a white girl go to a dance? I poked her side. I'd heard Charlie's side of the story, but never Dottie's. I snuck in with a friend. She elbowed my side. I thought I had a crush on her brother, but that changed when I met Charlie. Love at first sight? As close as it gets, I reckon. She turned toward me and lowered her voice. 
My friend's brothers were shifters, wolves. I didn't know it at the time. I was there to see John, but by the end of the night, I'd forgotten all about him. Unfortunately, he hadn't forgotten about me. I swallowed bile as things fell into place in my mind. Is he the shifter that attacked you? She looked down at her hands. After the dance, I went to a sleepover at my friend's house. I woke up, and John was on top of me. Oh, Dottie, no. She shook her head. I screamed and fought him off before he could violate me. But in the struggle, he shifted. I still don't remember much other than waking up in Charlie's shop. He'd broken the rules and used magic to heal me. I'd never heard this story. Charlie had told me about the dance and how he knew she would become his wife, but little else. The elders found out. She sighed. He had to keep me there for two moon cycles to make sure I wouldn't turn. My parents reported me missing, but back in those days, they didn't have the internet, and not everyone had television. It took a while, but someone recognized my face on a flyer and knew I'd been at the dance. Did they find you with Charlie? Yes. The council sent people to ask him about me. When they saw I was alive, one of them shot me. I stopped the swing. I'd always wondered how Dottie survived the attack. I knew Charlie had claimed her as his own, but never thought to ask how. What happened then? She avoided my eyes. Charlie killed the man who shot me and buried him out back. My grandfather committed murder and buried the body in the backyard? He'd defied the elders for a woman? My face must have shown my horror because she took my hand. We've all done things we regret. I nodded, though still stunned by the revelation. Dottie, how badly were you hurt in the attack? Charlie told me later that I had died. He brought me back by sharing a piece of his soul. My world screeched to a halt. I took her hand and whispered, Bryson did the same thing with Aaron. I wondered. I couldn't understand how two men were in love with the same woman and remained so close. She stared into my eyes. Tessa, you have to be careful with those two. They're bound together as much as you and Bryson. Maybe more. Chapter 22 I left Dottie to her thoughts and went inside. May dozed in an easy chair while Bryson and Aaron did the dishes. They laughed as they worked, moving like brothers who knew each other's next move. Physically, they couldn't be more different, Bryson with his dark Cherokee looks and Aaron a blue-eyed wasp. As they noticed me in the doorway, the mood changed. Bryson focused on scrubbing the meatloaf pan while Aaron put away the dinner plates. Need any help? I'd never felt so out of place in this house. We're almost done. Aaron closed the cabinet. Tell me about your hunch. What? I sat at the kitchen table, trying to stay out of the way. The cases. Why do you think they're related? Aaron gave me an odd look. You sure you're okay? How's Dottie? We're fine, both of us. Fine. I drew a breath and gathered my courage. I knew he'd laugh when I told him my theory. You know the song, The Twelve Days of Christmas? Yeah. The three ladies in the Mercier case, they performed under the stage name Three French Hens. Okay. He held back a grin. Stuart Black performed in a band called The Blackbirds. In the original song, four calling birds were four collie birds. Collie means black. Aaron chuckled. And Mr. Partridge in a pear tree? An orange tree. I stood. Forget it, it's late. 
I'm tired. I shouldn't have mentioned it. Bryson glanced over his shoulder. It's a strange coincidence. I held my arms out wide. Thank you. He dried his hands and looked at Aaron. Anybody knock off two turtle doves? They laughed and laughed until I stood and stomped out of the room. You can both kiss my lily white Tessa Marie. Watch your mouth, May said from the chair. Yes, ma'am. I plopped onto the couch and pulled out my new cell phone. My computer had burned along with my apartment, but I used the phone to Google Simon and Marty Reyes. I almost fell over when entry after entry of the couple popped up. Aaron, you might want to come in here. He walked into the living room with Bryson on his heels, both still snickering like a couple of kids. I handed him my phone, and the smile on his face faded. The web pages referred to the couple as dos tortelitas, two turtle doves. Holy shit! Aaron gave the phone to Bryson. Language! May pointed a bony finger. Sorry, ma'am. Aaron ran his hand over his head. Let me guess. Those tortelitas means two turtle doves? I grinned. It sure does. Bryson went a little pale as he set the phone in my hand. Well, I'll be damned. May shook her head. I believe you two owe Tessa an apology. I'm sorry I doubted you. Aaron leaned over and gave me a half hug. I need to step outside and call Samuels. Bryson sat and put his elbows on his knees. He didn't look at me, but he sounded sincere. I'm sorry that I've been so standoffish. I know you're going through a lot right now. I wanted to reach for his hand and tell him it was okay, but I caught May's eye. She shook her head an eighth of an inch. I understand. You have your own problems to deal with. He looked at me with a heartbreaking expression and stood. I'm heading out for a bit. I wondered where he was going, but let it go. I didn't want to seem too available. Let me walk you out. Thank you for dinner. It was delicious, as always. He gave May a quick hug. Aaron and I planned to grab a beer. I smiled, though I'm sure it came out looking like a snarl. You could come along? She has to be up early for Sunday school. May stood and placed herself between Bryson and me, like a four-foot-nothing bodyguard. He looked at me over her head. All right. Maybe another time. Good night, Tessa. I'll see you later unless you're asleep when I get home. Good night, Bryson. May stuck her jaw out and put her hands on her hips until he walked outside. I collapsed onto the couch with a groan. May smacked my thigh. Buck up, girl. The plan's working. Graham, I hate this. I don't like your plan, not one bit. I threw my arm across my face like I did when I was a little girl. Aaron came back inside. He looked from May to me and smiled. Thanks for dinner. Call me if you need any more help moving things. I will, thank you. May stayed in her spot, watching him. Tessa, Bryson and I are heading out for a beer. May wagged her finger. I already told the big one outside that she has to be up early. You two run along and leave her to get some sleep. Don't get into any trouble, and you better not let me hear about you drinking and driving. Aaron took a step back. Yes, ma'am. We'll only have one, I swear. Y'all have a good night. Watching May in action took the sting out of staying home. He left so fast I thought she might have swatted him with a newspaper. Graham, you're enjoying this way too much. It's been a long time since I had men to boss around. She leaned over and flicked my nose. Off to bed with you. Tomorrow is Sunday. Chapter 23 Sundays with May hadn't changed much since I was a toddler. Wake up before the sun, eat breakfast, and get to church before the good parking places were full. 
I found comfort in the predictable routine, even if it did involve getting up early and putting on pantyhose, two things I hated more than lima beans and liver. We piled into Bryson's SUV, dressed in our Sunday best. Mine, a borrowed dress from Haley that hugged my curves without being too sleazy for the Lord. Bryson seemed to enjoy it. I'd caught him looking several times. May cleared her throat from the back seat. <clears throat> Thanksgiving's only a few days away. Dottie and I have a grocery list. I'll do the shopping another day. My smile faltered. A Sunday trip to Super Walmart would eat hours of my time and patience. Stop interrupting. Dottie and I will do the shopping. Yes, ma'am. She shook her head. You can give an old woman five minutes to discuss Thanksgiving. Lord knows this one might be my last. At my age, I can't take things for granted. Bryson chuckled. You're as spry as a spring fox, May. <laughs> you flatterer, she sat straighter. Darlene and that hippie are coming. Dottie and I have decided not to invite the rest of the family this year. I turned in my seat, not believing my ears. May always made a huge deal out of the holidays. Everything all right? We've never had a Thanksgiving without the whole family. Dottie offered me a reassuring smile. Your mama's having some problems with morning sickness, and Stone is picky. I'm not much in the holiday spirit this year. We thought it best to keep things quiet for all our sakes. Feeling guilty, I nodded. I couldn't agree more. A small family gathering sounds perfect. Bryson pulled into the church parking lot and came to a stop. We arrived five minutes later than our usual time and hit a bottleneck, followed by cars zinging every which way. Anyone who didn't believe in God should come and watch the miracle that happened on Sundays when everyone made it inside in one piece. Bryson, hurry up. There's a spot near the door. May swatted his shoulder. She'd unbuckled and wedged herself between the front seats to better backseat drive. It's a handicapped spot, Grandma. I craned my neck and searched for a vacant space. I'll pull up front and drop everyone off, then park. Bryson glanced in the side mirror and cut the wheel. If you wouldn't mind. May sat back and folded her hands in her lap. The perfect southern lady, with her pale yellow dress and a cotton puff of hair teased to perfection like meringue on a pie. He stopped the rover at the front entrance of the building and hopped out to open May's door. She took his hand as he helped her down. Little old ladies and big SUVs didn't quite work, but she acted as if she stepped out of a carriage. Dottie, on the other hand, opened her door and slid on her fanny until her feet touched the concrete. Not the most graceful way to exit a vehicle, but she didn't seem to mind. We'll meet you inside. I pulled down the visor to check my lipstick. Oh, no, you are coming with us. I'm not taking a chance on you getting lost between here and women's Bible study, May said. Graham, Bryson and I are going to the young adult class today. I had no desire to sit through Bible study when the next youngest person in the room had collected social security since before I was born. May turned to Bryson. You best make sure the two of you get to class. You need all the help you can get. I'll know if you play hooky. I wouldn't dream of missing it. He grinned and climbed back into the driver's seat. Boy, someone's full of piss and vinegar this morning. She's worried about Thanksgiving. Cooking for everyone is a lot to give up. Bryson drove toward the edge of the parking lot. I think she's due for a break. She's been cooking holiday meals forever. I glanced at him and grinned. Want to cut class and go to Starbucks? No. May would beat us with a switch. He laughed and opened his door. Let's take the afternoon and work on your control. Oh, I can think of a few ways to get the firebird worked up. You propositioning me in a church parking lot? He chuckled. 
I wouldn't dare do such a thing. He rubbed his chin. We should get inside before lightning strikes us both. Good luck keeping your mind on the service. I winked and hopped out. I took my time, swishing my hips from side to side as I made my way to the glass doors. To heck with May's plan. If I had to sit through Bible study and Sunday service, I might as well have a little fun. After an hour of learning about the sins of premarital sex, a two-hour sermon on honoring thy mother and father, and another hour discussing the message over May's pork roast and winter vegetables, I wanted a nap. Bryson dried the last of the dishes and hung the towel. Ready to get to work? I eyed him, contemplating feigning a headache. Come on. He grabbed my arm and pulled me toward the door. May? Dottie? If you'll excuse us, Tessa and I will be in the yard practicing. May surveyed her clean kitchen. The woman hadn't done a dish since Bryson moved in next door. Thanks for cleaning up. You two have fun and take that dog with you. Maddie lifted her head and looked from May to us. She groaned as she stood, stretched and crawled from beneath the table. I could relate. Graham. She should stay inside. I'd hate it if she caught fire. Not to mention Maddie had an annoying habit of putting herself between Bryson and me any time we touched. Oh, all right. May patted her leg and Maddie followed her into the living room. My great-grandmother might grumble about the dog, but she'd insisted on putting a huge pillow next to her easy chair so Maddie could see the TV. I stepped outside into the midday sun and smiled. In Florida, the autumn sky was bright blue, the air warm but fresh, and the trees still had their leaves. I longed for Dottie's lounge chair and a good book, the way people were supposed to spend Sundays. You look happy. Bryson watched me from the shade of the porch. I guess I am. I needed a regular day. Any sense of normal would end the moment we started working on my magic, but a girl could dream. He looked away. We should go to the backyard. Did I say something wrong? I hurried to catch up, taking two strides for each one of his. He slung his arm around my shoulder. I wish I had known you before you had magic. Why is that? I bet you smiled more. He opened the gate and led me to the backyard. I didn't quite know how to respond to that. I had smiled more back then, but I couldn't say if it changed when the firebird came or when Charlie died. Should I strip? Not yet. You're pretty good at shifting when calm. I want to bring you to the edge and see if you can hold back. I couldn't help but giggle. Something funny? He pulled me close. Not a thing. My breath caught. I knew what would happen next. Or at least I hoped I did. Bryson leaned forward and devoured my mouth. He wasted no time on preliminary kisses, sweet nibbles, or eye-gazing. We went from zero to sixty in the space of a millisecond. He slid his hand to the back of my neck and curled his fingers in my hair, using the leverage to turn my head how he pleased. He lowered his lips to my neck kissed a line to my collarbone, and bit down until I made a noise. The ember in my gut came to life as if someone pumped bellows inside me. The firebird stirred and called to her mate. Bryson moaned against my skin. His spirit animal had heard the cry and rose to the surface. Tessa, hold back. Don't shift. His lips moved against my neck sending a shiver down my spine. I focused on the fire inside me. Rather than envisioning dousing the flames, I imagined a fire trench around her, something to hold her in place while she burned. The firebird shrank back, and I drew a breath, no longer overwhelmed with the need to shift. Good. Razin shuddered as his magic stilled. Is this only about teaching me control? Or do you want to kiss me? He frowned. Tessa, 
I slapped his face hard enough that my palm burned. You can't have it both ways. You can't tease me to death one minute and tell me sex isn't the answer the next. He rubbed his cheek. I have two choices. Make you experience a great deal of pain or make you feel good. Let's try pain. He grabbed my wrist and pulled me against him. It's never just about training. You know that. I knew from the curl of his lip and the dimple in his cheek he didn't take me seriously. I'm done here. He turned my face toward his and smiled. I miss you. I jerked my head back, not ready to back down. We see each other all the time. How can you miss me? I miss us, crazy woman. He rested his forehead against mine. We're good together. Can we try again? The sincerity in his voice melted my anger. Only if you'll consider my opinions before you make a decision. I want a partner, not a lord and master. I can do that. I narrowed my eyes. He'd agreed without a single counterpoint. I'm serious. He put his finger against my mouth and whispered, I'm going to kiss you because I want to. If the bird gets in the way, we'll use it as a teachable moment and try again. I held his gaze until our breathing synced. I've missed you too. He grabbed my backside and lifted me off my feet. I wrapped my arms and legs around him while kissing his mouth. His fingers dug into my bottom as he lowered to his knees, then laid me on the grass. I broke the kiss. My dress. He did a ninja move, and I ended up in his lap facing him. Rison cupped my face and sucked my lower lip into his mouth. The firebird remained where I'd left her, but the magic inside me swirled and churned like the sea. I pressed against him and ground my hips into his, desperate for this, for him. Hold on, Tessa. Focus, he growled against my mouth. I concentrated on the pressure between my thighs, the feel of his body against mine, the rub of his stubble on my face, until I thought I might explode. I want you. He slid his hand under my dress and did something fantastic with his fingers. Hold the magic back. A different kind of magic pressure built inside me. It had been ages since something felt this good. My thighs tensed as I hung on the precipice. I held my breath and gritted my teeth. One more second. The firebird ripped through me with enough force to sway the trees surrounding the yard. She screamed as she streaked through the brilliant blue sky. I held on to a thread of my humanity, grieving for what I'd just missed with Bryson. We'd come so close. Chapter 24 Embarrassed and frustrated, I managed to avoid Bryson the entire morning. He'd asked to discuss what happened in the backyard, but by the time we'd returned home, the sun had set and I was exhausted. The truth was, I hadn't wanted to talk about it then, and I didn't now. Everything would be fine, as long as he held true to his promise to try again. I slipped out of the house before he woke and hightailed it to Mays for breakfast. Carbs and fat were a poor substitute for an orgasm, but I'd take what I could get. May turned from the stove when I came through the front door. Good morning. How'd practice go yesterday? All right. I poured myself a cup of coffee and slumped into a chair, praying May wouldn't ask what we did during our training sessions. They didn't always involve making out, but it was the fastest way to get my spirit animal's attention. That doesn't sound too convincing. She set a plate of biscuits and sausage gravy in front of me. It's maddening. I shoveled food into my mouth before she could ask any more questions. Dottie joined us, already dressed. Morning. How'd it go last night? May grinned. 
She says all right, but she's irritable and sucking down breakfast like she's not seen food in months. Dottie patted my shoulder. We've all had nights like that. The harder you work, the more frustrating it gets. My cheeks burned. I didn't dare look up and see their expressions. Either my mind floated in the gutter or they were picking on me. Dottie laughed. I know what'll cheer you up. Come to Walmart with me. I need to get a few things for Thanksgiving dinner. Oh, yeah, that's my idea of fun. I dabbed my mouth with a napkin and sat back, admiring the clean plate. May shook her head. Sarcasm is ugly, Tessa Marie. I thought about my alternatives. A conversation with Bryson or shopping with Dottie. Sorry, I'm cranky today. I'd love to go with you. All righty then. She hopped up and walked into the other room with a bounce in her step. I smiled, knowing I'd made the right choice. She returned with her purse on her shoulder and car keys in her hand. Ready? Walmart on a Monday morning reminded me of a bar ten minutes after closing. Most everyone had cleared out, and the ones left behind looked like desperate zombies. I snagged a cart and met Dottie in the produce section. I'm thinking apple pie with a crumb topping. She hoisted a bag of apples into the buggy. Sounds good. As long as we have ice cream and pumpkin pie for leftovers, I don't know how you stay so skinny. I hardly considered myself thin. I had enough backside for two people. We meandered up one aisle and down the next, with Dottie adding items as we went. She tossed a box of cornstarch into the cart and marked it off the list. Tessa Lamar, good to see you, John Macon sneered as he walked up the baking aisle. My manners forced me to reply. Mr. Macon? The color drained from Dottie's face, and she held on to the buggy as if she might fall. Macon looked her over and turned back to me. I hear there was a fire at your apartment complex. You didn't have anything to do with that, did you? I didn't hate many people, but John Macon had earned a spot at the top of my list. Everything about him, from his cocky smile to his slicked back hair and too tight jeans, irritated me. No need to answer. I can tell by the look in your eye you did. It's a good thing no one was hurt. He glanced at Dottie again, and a light came on behind his eyes. Dorothy, it's been a long time, damned long time. I was sorry to hear about Charlie. She nodded and dipped her chin. I didn't know how they knew each other, but I'd bet my middle finger it wasn't good. We should get going. John stepped in front of the cart. Have you given any more consideration to Buck's request? You know it's the prudent thing to do. Not a single, solitary thought. I smiled and pulled the buggy forward, forcing him to step aside. Dottie clutched the handle and hurried us down the aisle. You should talk to her, Dorothy. Tell her what happens when young girls don't do as they should. John Macon called after us. Tears filled Dottie's eyes. We should go. All right. I slung her purse over my shoulder and held her hand as we left the cart and walked outside. I wanted to go back in there and tell Mr. John Macon what he could do with his threats. But Dottie trembled as she sat in the car. A million questions came to mind, but I chose the one that scared me the most. Did he hurt you? She turned to me, alarmed. It was a very long time ago. My swirling brain came to a screeching halt. He's the shifter? Your friend's brother? He's dangerous, Tessa. You need to stay clear of him. Is it all right if I tell Bryson what happened? I had to do something. I couldn't let this man terrorize her, or me for that matter. I'd rather you didn't tell him about what happened to me. Yes, ma'am. 
I'll tell him about the threats and nothing else. We drove home without a word. After I had settled Dottie into her easy chair, I walked the path between May's and Charlie's. Dottie had told me her story in confidence, and I wouldn't break her trust. Bryson needed to know about the bad blood between Dottie and Macon in case the man started trouble. I hoped I could walk the tightrope without lying to Bryson. He came out of his room and I walked through the door. Hey, where did you go? To Walmart with Dottie. What's wrong? He stepped closer and searched my eyes. We ran into John Macon. He accused me of causing the fire. Bryson sighed and tucked my hair behind my ear. Are you okay? I shrugged. He said I should reconsider Buck's request to burn my magic. Said bad things happen to girls who don't do as they're told. Bryson's energy shifted as his spirit animal woke. That son of a bitch. Easy. I handled him. I snuggled into Bryson's chest to calm him down. Dottie is afraid of Macon. There's a history there that's none of our business, but if he shows up here, keep him away from her. He'd be a fool to come here. He squeezed me tighter. Last night. I pulled back and smiled. I was upset and needed time alone, but I'm over it now. I think I'm making progress. A slow smile curled his lips. You'll get there. Don't be so hard on yourself. The look in his eyes reminded me of the previous evening. I had to look away before I lost myself in him again. I need to call the insurance company. Aaron is picking me up in an hour on his way to the station. He kissed my brow. Do what you need to do. I'll see you tonight. Chapter 25 Replacing a driver's license without a birth certificate, social security card, or any other form of identification required an act of God. The caseworker from the Red Cross swore she would get the documents and told me to be patient. Adding insult to injury, the insurance company had to wait until the fire department filled their report before they would pay my claim. With the holiday weekend looming, I could be hanging in limbo for another week or two. Aaron drove me to the station to pick up the uniform shirts and victim's advocate badge I'd requested. Whatever progress I'd made with him had vanished, along with his good mood. We can't find a common link between the cases. The M.O.s are different and the Vicks don't have anything obvious in common. He took a corner quicker than he should have, and I smashed against the door. I've had a rough few days. I'd rather not add car accident to my list. I turned the radio off and drew a cleansing breath. My frazzled nerves couldn't take the noise. Any chance you can get me into the Mercier scene? His hands tightened on the wheel. I can try. The chief and the building's management are working hard to keep the case away from the media. I can see why they would, considering what they charge for rent. But why does the chief care? Samuel said something about orders to keep the case under wraps? Ms. Mercier was dating the mayor. Aaron watched my reaction. Eyes on the road. I took a minute to sort the new information. He is married with a stable of grown kids. He nodded. Why on earth would he cheat on his wife with a woman his age? As soon as the words came out of my mouth, I realized how ridiculous they sounded. I mean, I thought men like that went for young model types. That's a stereotype, and I'm pretty sure it's ageist. Ms. Mercier was a beautiful woman and very talented. I cringed. So... The mayor is pulling strings to keep this case quiet because he's afraid the affair will come out? Is he a suspect? No, he has an airtight alibi. Aaron pulled into the parking lot. How'd you find out about the affair? 
She had a picture of the two of them on her nightstand, and his private number showed up on her cell phone records. He opened his door. That's all I can say about it. I jumped out and followed him into the building. Aaron, I need to get in there. I might be able to see something. Same with the Reyes house. Mrs. Reyes's attorney petitioned the courts to allow her back into her home. He lowered his voice. She's been there over a week. Let's go. I'll talk to her. Explain why I need to walk around. My patience had worn thin. I knew the cases were related and feared the killer would strike again soon. Eight more times if my theory held. You need a uniform and credentials. He motioned to the hall that held HR. That'll take too long. I tapped my temple. What about Stuart Black's car? Is it still out back and processing? Yes. I'll start there. But it would help if I could get on these scenes. There's nothing I can do. He turned and walked toward his office. I stood stunned. Since when did Aaron not trust in my theories? I knew the answer, since he started seeing someone else. I didn't care for the new by-the-books, Aaron. Uniforms and badges could wait. Stuart Black's car sat in a high-tech crime lab garage. I grabbed the clipboard from the wall and scanned the report. The investigator's signature on the last page meant they'd completed processing it for evidence. I needed a reflective surface to read the past. The driver's side window wouldn't work. Not only had the bullet shattered the glass, but dried blood coated most of the surface. I touched the back driver's side window and caught movement from the street. Nothing useful. The visions from the windshield were better. A man peered through into the car a split second before Stuart Black's brains ended up in the passenger seat. The shooter had dark hair and a similar build to Michael Adams. My luck continued to improve when I found one of the forensic artists in the break room. An hour later, I had a picture and a photocopy of the man who killed Stuart Black and possibly Gavin Partridge. I needed to confirm the lead before I handed it over to Aaron. I went to my desk, pulled out the Partridge file, and added Michael Adams's number to my contacts list. Gavin Partridge's spirit hadn't visited me since the day I learned about the three French hens. I needed to find the ghost and have a chat. The best place to do that was with his husband. Mr. Adams, this is Tessa Lamar. Is this a good time to talk? Hi, Tessa. Any news on the investigation? Officially, no, but I need to talk to you. Do you mind if I come by? Sure, I'll be home. See you soon. I went for my purse and sighed. I could call a cab, but my bank balance had gone from bad to abysmal since the fire. I wanted to put my head down and cry. I hadn't had to bum ride since I was a teenager. I couldn't ask one of the officers to drive me to a crime scene without risking air and hearing about it. Hey, Tessa, sorry about your apartment. Samuels peeked over the top of my cubicle wall. Smoking with the birds again? On any other day, Samuels amused me as much as he annoyed me. Today, nothing could make me laugh. Can I borrow your car? <laughs> Truck? And hell no. You aren't good on two feet, let alone four wheels. He came around to the cubicle entrance and folded his arms. Where's your car? At my place. My keys didn't make it out of the fire. He didn't need to know I had new keys, but I couldn't get to the car, nor could I legally drive. I have some time. Where do you need to go? No, no, no. I couldn't have him chauffeuring me to visit Michael. I smiled. I have a GYN appointment. He blanched and held up his hands. TMI. My birth control pills were destroyed in the fire, I bluffed. But it occurred to me that I did, in fact, need to replace my contraceptives. Then again, 
the way things were going in my love life, I had time. Did your cash make it out? I had to buy new everything. I'm broke. Samuels pulled out his wallet and handed me a couple of twenties. Consider it a loan until you get back on your feet. Call one of those rideshare places. You mean like Uber or Pick Me Up? I'd never used a cab, let alone a place called Pick Me Up. They're cheaper than a taxi. Thanks. You're a lifesaver. I stuffed the cash in my purse and gave him a quick, non-regulation hug. He patted my back and whispered, Be careful, Tessa. Call me if you need anything. Other than a ride to the girly doctor? Yes, I draw the line at gynos and tampon runs. I'll leave that to one of the guys who's having fun with your lady parts. He chuckled and walked away. I hurried to the exit and called for a ride. While waiting, I called the pharmacy. Chapter 26 As luck would have it, I had a chatty pick-me-up driver full of Christmas spirit. He prattled on about his plans for the holidays while carols blared on the radio. I scrolled through my phone and quietly panicked that Thanksgiving was three days away. May hadn't mentioned it, but she wouldn't. She didn't have to confirm a meal that she'd cooked for as long as I could remember. I love Christmas, don't you? He smiled at me in the rearview mirror. I glanced at him, then out the window. It's a little early, isn't it? Never too early for Christmas carols. I'm Steve, by the way. He edged onto the freeway, singing jingle bells with the radio. I frowned at the car next to us. The woman driving wore a Santa hat and huge smile. The 20-minute drive had turned into the trip from hell. Steve turned the music up and belted out Oh Holy Night. Dogs three counties over howled along. After three more carols, he grinned at me in the rear view. Pretty girl like yourself, I'm sure you have a boyfriend. What'd you say your name was again? Tessa, I jabbed my hand between the front seats. Get off here! Steve yanked the wheel, crossed a line of traffic, and clipped a construction barrier to reach the exit ramp. Another car leaving the highway rammed into the back quarter panel, sending us into a spin. The car busted the guardrail and came to a stop. I leaped out and moved away from the accident as fast as my shaken legs would move. I'd seen movies where cars went over bridges, and I didn't want to live through it. Steve called after me. Hey, this is going to get me fired. Hey, wait, you didn't pay your fare. I walked down the exit ramp and sat under the bridge. My stomach churned hard enough I thought I might see my breakfast again. I couldn't take another thing. Not one more terrible, awful thing. I patted my pocket and realized I'd left my phone in the back seat. You've got to be kidding me. I don't know how long I sat under the overpass feeling sorry for myself, but a uniformed police officer called to me from the road. Are you Tessa? Were you just involved in a motor vehicle accident? Damn it. I scrambled down the slope toward him. Yes, I didn't mean to leave the scene, but the car was over the edge and the driver was singing Christmas music. I left my phone up there. I'm having a dreadful day. It's all right, ma'am. Can you tell me what happened? My apartment burned down, and I can't drive until I get a new license. What caused the accident? Oh, I chose my words carefully. The pick-me-up driver cut across a lane to get to the exit, and the other driver hit us. He nodded. Can I see some ID? A trickle of fear ran down my spine. I wasn't driving, but I'd caused the accident by yelling at the driver to exit the highway. My ID burned in my apartment. I work for OCPD. You can call and verify everything with Detective Richard Samuels. The officer smiled. I thought you looked familiar. You're Aaron Stessa. I'll give Burns a call. He can come pick you up. I couldn't have him call Aaron. Not when I'd lied to Samuels. No, please don't. 
I'm running late for an appointment. I just need to get my phone and call another cab. His expression grew serious. Tessa, you're bleeding. You should get your head checked out. I'm calling an ambulance. I touched the side of my head and my fingers came away sticky. Blood. My blood. Oh, God. The ground beneath me shifted, forcing me to sit. The world spun faster and tied my stomach into a hard knot. Call Burns. I don't want an ambulance. As much as I didn't want Aaron to see me like this, I couldn't afford to be carted away to the hospital. The officer radioed for assistance. Within minutes, a cruiser pulled up and he ushered me into the front seat. I held a towel to my head and counted backward from 100. I had no idea what would happen when I reached zero, but the activity kept me awake and focused. Another officer brought my purse and cell phone. We ticketed the driver for several infractions. I grinned. I hope they included unlawful singing of Christmas carols and improper hitting on a paying passenger. Cute. I'll have to remember those. He eased the towel away from my head. You should get that checked out. You're going to need stitches. Aaron's voice caught my attention. I turned my head too quickly and the scenery around me flickered. My stomach revolted, but I managed to keep from throwing up. Aaron and the officer exchanged a few words. Then his beautiful blue eyes met mine. Dessa, I'm calling EMS. No, listen to me. I'll be fine. I don't want an ambulance. The hospital's a couple of blocks away. Please drive me. He ground his teeth. Are you officially refusing medical assistance? Stop treating me like a case. I'm not going to sue you if I die between here and there. My attempted humor fell flat, but the car seemed to tilt back and forth like a fair ride. He frowned and helped me out of the car. I'm tired of breaking rules for you. I held on to him to stay upright as the pain in my head changed from a dull ache to an insistent throb. And I'm tired of the men in my life acting like total jerks. Chapter 27 Aaron walked me to his car with his arm around my waist. I didn't think May would object to my leaning against him in my current state. I doubted I could take two steps on my own. The press of his body against my side woke the firebird. My skin flushed and my breath caught. I'm okay to walk. I pulled away and staggered, ending up back in his arms. He tightened his grip on my hip. You have a concussion. Stop fighting me or I'm calling EMS. The firebird surged upward against my shields and took my knees from under me. I sank against Aaron for support. I need away from these people. I... What? I what? I'm going to shift into a flaming bird? I had to think of something drastic. I needed privacy before my damned spirit animal outed herself to the world. I have to pee. Now. It's an emergency. Are you serious? He took one look at my face and scooped me into his arms. With long-legged strides, he carried me to the side of the car facing the wall and opened the door. I'll block the view from here. Hurry up. My head felt like an overripe melon ready to split. Fresh blood trickled down my scalp, and the world around me blurred. My spirit animal stirred again, struggling to break free of her cage, namely me. I couldn't shift in front of him, but I couldn't stop it. Call Bryson now. Don't freak out. What the hell? Tessa? Aaron reached for me as the world spun and faded to black. I woke in bed with a large body pressed against me. The sun either rose or set judging by the light outside the windows. I touched the side of my head, surprised to find not only had the wound healed, but someone had cleaned the blood. Bryson stirred beside me. Hey, feeling better? Mm-hmm. 
I curled closer, nuzzling my face into his chest. Waking up beside him didn't happen as often as I would have liked. I planned to take advantage of it. How's your head? Sleep had turned his naturally deep voice raspy, sexy, healed. I circled his nipple with my tongue. He tensed and rolled to his back. We're not alone. Wait, what? Something brushed my calf, and it occurred to me someone was behind me. I reached back and felt hard muscle. Oh, my goodness. Good morning, sunshine. Aaron rolled to his side and wrapped his arm around me. I froze, afraid to move. I'd never been in bed with two men. Frankly, I didn't understand why I was now. What time is it? How long was I out? Aaron's grip tightened. Three days. It's Thanksgiving morning. Three days? I struggled to sit upright, shoving Aaron's arm away. What happened that I was out for three days? You should get dressed, and we'll talk. Bryson sat up, and the covers fell away to reveal the long, bare lines of his body. My voice came out shrill. I've been in bed with both of you for 72 hours? Bryson sighed and ran his hand through my hair. His touch took the edge off my nerves. Not the entire time. We took turns. I touched my chest, then lower, and realized I'd slept between two men, naked as the day I was born. Where are my clothes? I glanced around the unfamiliar room. Where the hell am I? My place. Aaron rolled over. A need to get the heck out of there overwhelmed me, but fear kept me rooted to the mattress. I didn't dare look over my shoulder as the bed shifted. Judging from the amount of skin I'd felt, Aaron had slept in the buff, too. A dresser drawer opened, and a T-shirt landed in front of me, and then a pair of basketball shorts. You can borrow these. Thanks. I slid the shirt over my head and wiggled into the shorts beneath the blankets. Will one of you tell me what happened? Aaron handed Bryson a pair of pajama pants while I waited for an explanation. Bryson pulled them on and sat cross-legged beside me. After the car accident, you shifted. Good thinking having Aaron call me. You surprised the hell out of me. One minute you were standing there, the next a fireball shot into the sky. Aaron tied the string on his sweats and propped himself against the headboard. Did anyone see me? I chewed my thumbnail, trying to recall the crash or anything that followed. If they did, they would have assumed the fire was part of the accident. The pick-me-up car you hired exploded a split second after you did. Aaron grinned. I stared until he lowered his eyes. How could he act so nonchalant about the firebird and the accident? Did I blow up the car? He shrugged. No one was injured. As far as I'm concerned, no harm, no foul. Bryson frowned. You got lucky. No one's reported a flaming bird, UFO, or anything odd. Be thankful. I didn't feel lucky. People could have died because of me. I needed a minute to calm down, to think, to freak out without an audience. I scooted to the end of the bed. Where are you going? Bryson sighed. To the restroom. You're welcome to come with if you think I need a chaperone. He shook his head and gave Aaron an I told you so look. Aaron ran his hand over the back of his neck. I went into the bathroom and shut the door. The look they'd exchanged did nothing to calm my nerves. I wanted to lash out at them, yell and throw a tantrum. Though I couldn't understand why. Calm down, Tessa. I splashed water on my face. For someone who had a concussion and slept for three days, I looked pretty good. My skin glowed, and my hair looked redder, brighter somehow. I leaned closer to the mirror and 
gasped. A thin red ring surrounded my pupils, and my irises had changed to an emerald green with flecks of orange and red. Brasson, can you come in here? He entered the bathroom with a concerned expression. Are you all right? What's wrong with my eyes? I turned and opened them wide. He took my chin between his thumb and forefinger and tilted my head toward the light. You didn't shift back entirely. What? I looked back into the mirror. Why? It sometimes happened when we shift after an injury, but it usually fades in an hour or so. I lowered my voice. Is Aaron okay? I mean, did he lose it? He was more upset we didn't tell him before now. He knew we were holding something back, but didn't expect this. Bryson ran his hand through his hair. We've put him in more danger. We? You mean me? Memories of Aaron and I see you because the wrong person connected him to me flashed through my mind. I leaned against the vanity to stay upright. I should have let the elders bind my magic. Tessa, you're both my responsibility. I could have done a forgetting spell, but I needed him. I don't want to be your responsibility or your obligation. Then what do you want? It doesn't matter what I want. I shook my head and pushed past him. Aaron sat up when we returned to the room. Everything okay? What happened after I shifted? I overreacted. I knew it. They knew it. But I couldn't stop myself. Every word that came out of my mouth grew louder. He shrugged. I called Bryson. He told me he'd find you and bring you here. I turned. Why here? I didn't think May and Dottie would like the idea of the two of us showing up naked, and I needed Aaron's help. I blew off his logic, not ready to acknowledge he'd done the right thing. Why did I wake up between you two? I coaxed you into shifting back, but you were still unconscious. Wait, you mean I didn't heal after the change? That sobered me. I hadn't realized how much I'd come to expect quick and easy healing. Bryson frowned. Not entirely. The skin-to-skin -skin contact with your mates completed the healing. I stopped processing everything he said after mates, plural, mates. What did that mean? Was this some sort of ploy on their parts to share me? Your head injury must have been worse than we thought. Sometimes a brain bleed or a swelling causes coma, Aaron said. I don't care about comas. I glanced between them. Mates? Brasson nodded. Aaron shares a part of my soul. I didn't realize the implications until I needed him to help me heal you last night. You told him what happened in the hospital? The dizziness returned, though I didn't think it had anything to do with my brain swelling. I'm cool with it. Beats the alternative, right? Aaron chuckled. This is the last of the secrets between us. Yes. I doubted he knew everything, but I didn't care to open that can of worms. Aaron shrugged. It explains why I'm drawn to the two of you. Great. So you're attracted to me because of the same magical crap as Brasson? Are either of you interested in just me? Aaron bowed his head, then looked up and met my eyes. I meant what I said in the car. Memories of our kiss flickered through my mind, and my anger faded into a numb sense of resignation. Does it matter what brought us to this point? Brasson sat beside Aaron. I don't know. I stared at the two of them. No little girl dreamed of growing up and finding out she's stuck with a guy because he's the last of her race, or worse, Stuck with two guys because they share some magical connection. So what now? We buy a giant bed and move in together? Brasson frowned. You're getting ahead of yourself again. 
we need to focus on the more important issue first. My lack of control? He nodded. Your reaction today feels off. Is it the firebird? I stilled, considering his question. My spirit animal did feel restless, but I couldn't be sure if my anger came from her or me. I'm angry, and I don't understand why. We'll figure this out, but we have to learn to trust each other first. My phone rang, and Aaron reached for it. Speaking of trust, it's Michael Adams again. Would you mind telling me why you were on your way to meet him? Chapter 28 After apologizing to Michael for not showing up to our meeting, I sat on Aaron's sofa. My two mates stared, waiting for an explanation. I thought about fibbing, but I doubted they'd believe anything except the truth, and even that was pushing it. Outnumbered, and more than a little freaked out by the situation, I decided to come clean. Gavin Partridge haunted me for a couple of days after his murder. His spirit was still too confused to give me any useful information about his death. I thought if I could talk to him, maybe I could find the link between the four crimes. I have a sketch of the shooter. I planned to show it to Michael and Gavin. Did you plan to run it by me? Aaron's expression hardened. I wanted to see if I could find a connection first. I told you to stay away from Adams. He's the top suspect in the murder. I shook my head. He couldn't have killed his husband. I disagree. I sighed. I hope you're wrong. Me too. Aaron shook his head. You told Samuels you had an appointment with your gynecologist. I couldn't tell him I planned to break into a death scene. Bryson folded his arms. Can we agree right here? right now, that you won't do anything illegal until we get your magic under control. Aaron added, how about you won't do anything illegal, period? I'll agree if the two of you stop treating me like a child. Bryson grinned. If you stop acting like one. Fine. I folded my arms, realized I was pouting, and unfolded them. You two need to stop ganging up on me. Aaron said, we're not ganging up on you. We're worried about you. You've given us reason for concern. I wanted to tell him none of this was my fault, but it sounded hollow to my ears. How do I control the firebird? I can teach you to a point, but your magic is stronger than mine. Achila paid me a visit. Aaron sat beside me. Who's Achila? My real mother. Her spirit visits me sometimes, usually when things are going south. Like now. He took my hand as if it were the most natural thing in the world. A sense of peace washed over me, reminded me of the feeling of home that Bryson's touch provided. I knew deep down that the feeling meant we were connected. What did she say? Bryson took a seat across from us. She never speaks plainly. It's always metaphors and poetry. She said, my spirit animal is fire and magic. I have to feed her or she'll die. She can either give or destroy. I left out the bit about being a child. These two didn't need any validation. They stared, as if waiting for me to continue. Aaron ran his thumb over the back of my hand, and Bryson appeared lost in thought. I couldn't take the silence another second. Achila said it needs nourishment like my human body. And Dottie said Charlie told her the same thing. I mean, what do they mean I have to feed her? Nourishment can be different things. Food, spiritual growth, exercise, even love. Bryson stood and paced the living room. I'll go to church three times a week or dance around a fire every day, but. I'm not thrilled with the idea of hunting and eating rats. I made a face, 
once again trying to add some humor to a frustrating situation. Heron's face brightened. I can help with the exercise and emotional nourishment. Brasson smirked. You can try, but she has a tendency to catch fire when she's aroused. Aaron's eyes widened. That day at Charlie's when you ran out? Your skin was so hot. Yep. I chewed my thumbnail. He looked between us. So you two haven't? Nope. I stared at my hands. I can understand not wanting third-degree burns, but can't you do it in a pool or something? That's what I said. I fell a little more for Aaron. We shared the same sense of humor. Bryson sighed and knelt before me, ignoring Aaron. Listen to me. I'm old-fashioned. Sex means something to me. If I take you to bed, and things don't work out, it'll be harder for me to walk away. Aaron drew a breath. Damn. I sighed. Things have to work out. Neither of us can walk away. Can we? No. Bryson hung his head. Which means I'm stuck with the two of you, too. Aaron ran his hand down my back. I thought you were seeing someone? Aaron furrowed his brows. What gave you that idea? I called you early one morning. You said you weren't alone. That was when you two weren't talking. I got Bryson shit face the night before. He was on the couch. Oh. I could imagine the conversation between them that night. Aaron pulled me to his side. Back to the real problem. Why don't we think outside the box and invest in fireproof suits? I braced myself for Bryson's response. I'd suggested things like that in the past, and his reactions ranged from frustration to anger. His shoulders tensed, but the corners of his eyes crinkled. His laughter took me by surprise, so much so I wondered if he'd finally snapped. Aaron's phone rang, and he went into the bedroom to answer it, leaving me alone with Bryson. Still kneeling, he stared into my eyes, as if he looked hard enough he might understand me. I'm sorry, I whispered. For what? That I lost control. Again. Don't apologize. You were seriously injured. We'll keep working on it. I thought I was making progress, and then this happened. You're much better at it now than you were a month ago. He took my hands. Talk to me. What's really going on? Sometimes I feel so close to you, I think we are two halves of a whole. Then I remember we hardly know each other. Every time we turn around, something else happens, be it John Macon or this thing with Aaron. And I remember we were thrown together because of what we are. I need to know this is real between us and not our spirit animals or the elders calling the shots. You've asked me the same question. I know it bothers you, too. I love you, not your magic or your spirit animal. You. He wrapped his arms around me. I closed my eyes and relaxed into his embrace. The tension of the previous weeks morphed into a deep-seated need to be close to this man. I closed my eyes and prayed for a solution to this mess. Aaron cleared his throat. I hate to interrupt, but there's been another murder. Bryson pulled back, but kept his eyes on mine. He nodded slightly, as if trying to convey that he understood how I felt. Tessa, I think we have your five golden rings. Aaron's voice rose, pulling my attention from Bryson. Lucy Cullen, five-time Olympic gold medal winner. Someone slit her throat with a blade from an ice skate this morning. These killings have to be related. I'd watched the figure skater compete in the last Winter Olympics. The idea that someone so young and full of life was murdered made my stomach royal. I'm going with you. In my clothes? Aaron grinned. You must really want to churn the rumor mill. Forget it. 
I need to find Gavin Partridge and show him the sketch. If that doesn't work, I can go to the crime scenes. If I can make contact, maybe we can stop this before six geese a lang. Aaron looked at me as if I'd lost my mind. Geese? That's the next day in the song. On the sixth day of Christmas, my true love gave to me six geese a laying. I'd like to see what this guy comes up with for that. Bryson looked me over. We need clothes. Aaron had dressed in jeans and a button-down shirt. He clipped his badge near his gun on his hip. I have to get to the ice rink. I'll call in and tell CSI to allow you access. Did you pick up a new badge? No. I didn't want to hear him complain about my acting rash and irresponsible again. It wouldn't matter. We flew here. I don't even have my purse. Aaron looked at Bryson as if to say something smart assed, then turned back to me. Your purse is in my room, but you still don't have a license. I assume he's driving you around today? Can you drop us off at May's to get my rover? Bryson's expression grew serious. I'll drive you where you need to go. Until we know you're completely healed, one of us will be with you. You're going to need some credentials to get into the rink. Aaron slid his phone into his pocket and grabbed his keys. Both of you. I frowned. Is there someone working today who can help me? It's Thanksgiving. Your badge is waiting for you to pick it up, but it'll take months and a mountain of paperwork to get something for a civilian. Aaron patted his pockets, gun, and badge. Brasson grinned. I can be there without being seen. You can be invisible? Aaron stared slack-jawed. I said, he means he can shift and watch from the trees or wait in the car. Damn, I always wanted invisibility as my superpower. Aaron motioned to the door. Let's go find a serial killer. Chapter 29 May and Dottie were on the porch swing when Aaron pulled up the drive. I took one look at their curious expressions and sidestepped behind Bryson. We didn't have time to answer questions. Not when those questions involved our borrowed clothing, Aaron dropping us off, or my lack of shoes. Bryson must have read my mind because he whistled for Maddie. The dog bounded around the side of the house with a slobbery tennis ball. He bent down to pry it out of her mouth. Oh, no, you don't. We have things to discuss with the two of you, May called. Dang it. I hung my head. I called her when you were injured. Bryson wiped his hand on his pants. Let me do the talking. We walked to the porch side by side like scolded children. Where have you been? Why didn't either of you call and let me know what was going on? May stood with her hands on her hips. Bryson said, Sorry, ma'am. Tessa didn't wake up until this morning. I appreciate you calling after the accident, but you should have kept us informed. She looked us over with a disapproving twist of her lips, then shook her head. As long as everyone is all right, you're both adults, but I like to know what's going on. We worry. Dottie winked. Does this mean you've mended fences? Bryson said, we're working on it. Tessa Marie, you and I will have a talk later. You must have forgotten my advice. Since you look like you've healed, I expect you to take me to the mall for Black Friday tomorrow. Graham May turned from me to Bryson. We'll be putting up the lights on Saturday and the tree after church on Sunday. Just because we aren't feeding an army today doesn't mean we're skimping on Christmas. Bryson nodded. I closed the medicine shop until January. I have all weekend free. Good. Let that jackass buck Oldham stew. May shifted her dentures around. Serves him right. Graham, we have to hustle. I promise we'll get it all done. 
I leaned in and gave them each a hug. The lady from the Red Cross dropped your license and birth certificate off yesterday. I sighed in relief. The day brightened with that off my list. That's wonderful. I'll get it later. I need to change before we go to the station. What's so important you're working on Thanksgiving? May held up her hand. Don't tell me. I don't want to know. Dottie grinned and started the swing in motion, signaling the conversation had ended. You two take care. And be home for dinner, May added. We've already started cooking. Six sharp, I smiled. If you'll excuse me, I need to change as well. Bryson turned and walked inside. May attempted to whisper, but her idea of quiet had a lot in common with a regular speaking voice. I thought you weren't going to be so available. I didn't mean to mess up the plan. I flashed her a sheepish smile. Mm-hmm. She shook her head. I went inside and changed into slacks. Luckily, I'd left an extra OCPD polo in my office in case of emergency. Things were looking up. I tossed my makeup into a bag and sat to put my shoes on. Despite my rushing around, Bryson waited for me on the porch when I returned. Ready? He gave me a quick once-over. I'll do my makeup in the car. I gave May and Dottie another quick hug. See you tonight. Don't be late, Tessa Marie. May narrowed her eyes at Bryson. You either. Bryson smiled and dipped his chin. The woman loved to give him a hard time, and he took it as if her cantankerous words were hugs. And I loved him for it. I hurried towards Bryson's SUV. He held the door open for me and kissed my cheek before I climbed in. I believed he understood my feelings, and it felt right between us, not settled in like an old pair of sneakers. He slid into the driver's seat and started the engine. Why are you grinning? I'm happy, I guess. Me too. Are you concerned about closing the shop? No. I'm looking forward to sculpting again. He focused on the road. I have a couple of large commissions to finish. I plan to use the free time to plan Haley's baby shower. I remembered the other mother to be and sighed. And I should spend some time with Darlene. She'd like that, Tessa. I know, it just, I don't want to end up raising my sibling. I don't remember anyone asking you to do that. I shrugged. Darlene didn't raise me. I have no reason to think she'll raise this one. Do you want kids? The concern in his voice stilled my heart. The elders assumed we would have children to continue our race, but no one had ever asked me if I wanted kids. Until now. I don't know. I mean, I may when I'm older, but I, I don't know. I love kids. I always thought I'd have a houseful. He seemed resigned. Not for nothing, Bryson, but you have a big head. Your sons would tear me in, too. Nice, Tessa. Maybe we shouldn't have kids. It's cruel. I mean, if we aren't supposed to marry outsiders, who would our children marry? Each other? I, for one, hope there are more of us out there. He turned his head and laughed. Let's not borrow trouble. We should focus on today. Tomorrow will come whether we worry or not. I let my head rest against the seat and closed my eyes. He had a point, of course, but living in the moment was a heck of a lot easier to say than it was to do. I pulled my hands back and opened my cosmetics bag. You're beautiful without it. He motioned to the makeup. Says you. I leaned closer to the mirror to apply a little eyeshadow. Think of it like war paint. It gives me confidence. I get that. He drummed on the steering wheel with his thumbs, looked out the window, to me, and back to the road. 
Are you all right with the situation with Aaron? I opened a tube of mascara. I don't understand it enough to know if I'm okay with it. It was a little odd waking up naked with the two of you. Because you didn't know where you were or how you got there. Would you be willing to do it again? I turned my head so fast that I left a trail of black goo across my temple. Sleeping with the two of you or sleeping with the two of you? Sleeping. You can't kiss me without risking spontaneous combustion. How can you think about making love with the two of us? My mouth hung open. I'd had a similar conversation with Aaron about sharing me. I never, in my wildest, naughtiest dreams, imagined having it with Brasson. You want the three of us to share a bed all night with no monkey business? Yes, and I want to figure out what Achila and Charlie meant by feeding your spirit animal. I should know, but I don't. I've never had the problems you have with control. Gee, thanks. It wasn't meant as an insult. It could be the firebird, or it could be a combination of things, but I know, I know. We have to be careful. I just don't understand how sharing a bed with you and Aaron is being careful. Because you're hung up on the idea we'll end up having sex. It's your measuring stick for your relationships. I narrowed my eyes. I'd thought the same thing about myself, but hearing it from him pissed me off. He smiled and motioned to the mascara smear. You might want to take care of that, in case it stains. I turned to the mirror and scrubbed the blob. I can't figure out how being a part of a three-person relationship would work. I mean, are you and Aaron attracted to each other? Bryson looked at me and frowned. Would that bother you? No, maybe? I don't know. I finished applying the mascara. I thought you were jealous? I was taken off guard at first, but I'm okay with it as long as everything is in the open. You didn't answer my question. Bryson sighed. You're doing it again. What? He pulled into a parking space at the station and turned to me. Borrowing trouble. Chapter 30 an hour later, I had a brand new temporary victim's advocate badge and a handful of new shirts. What I didn't have was the courage to face Bryson, not after the conversation on the drive over. On some level, having two men, the two men I'd grown to love, seemed like a dream. What woman wouldn't want to snuggle between those two every night? However, I didn't have a great track record at dating one guy. How in the world would I manage two? Worse yet, they already had a tendency to gang up on me. How much worse would that be if we were involved? One thing I did know, I was sick to death of people telling me to give it time. Tessa, Tessa Lamar? A man I didn't know by name called from across the rows of cubicles. Yes? He jogged over. Detective Burns called. He asked me to allow you into the evidence room. Evidence room? My addled brain took a moment to catch up. Oh, for the recent murder cases? Yes. He extended his hand. I'm Zach. I shook his hand. Nice to meet you. Zach led me to the back of the building. He went on about procedures, but I only heard every third word or so. How could I try to read the evidence with Zach watching? Not to mention the security camera. What if I flipped out? Is it possible to have my associate inside the room while I examine the evidence? I dug through my purse for my phone. Only authorized personnel are allowed back here. He cocked his head to the side. Is there a problem? No, let's do this. Zach handed me an evidence list for each case. 
Notate the numbers of the items you'd like to examine. Where is the sheet from the black murder? Unavailable. CSI still has most of the evidence out back. I nodded, flipping through page after page, looking for the glass from the Reyes case. I'd like to see Ray 2578565. He nodded and left me in the small room. I scanned the reports until he returned with an evidence bag. Don't you need equipment? The preliminary forensic reports are in the next room. Would you like me to get them? I shook my head as I opened the bag. Thanks, that won't be necessary. Zack stepped forward and smiled. You're the psychic that found those missing kids. Yes, but I didn't find them alone. I had help. I'll be damned. I heard we had a psychic working here. Everyone has, but no one knew for sure. You know how it is. His smile broadened. Are the other rumors true? Which rumors? You know, about you, Burns, and the big guy? His cheeks flushed. I'm not sleeping with Detective Burns and the civilian who helped solve the case, if that's what you're asking. My worst fear had come to life, giving me a glimpse at my future if I chose to have a relationship with Bryson and Aaron. People would judge me. I didn't mean to imply, he stammered. Yes, you did. I stared at him until he backed away. Sorry. Zack, the rumors, and my relationships had to wait. I noted several additional pieces from the Mercier case on a slip of scrap paper and handed it to him. This process reminded me of losing an earring at the beach. I could sift through every grain of sand in a two-mile radius and still not find it. I needed to go to the scenes, touch the windows and mirrors to find what I needed the face of the shooter. I pulled the glass from the evidence bag. When I focused, visions exploded behind my eyes. I took a calming breath and forced my emotions down. Mr. Reyes filled the glass. He took a sip, but stilled when he heard a sound. A door opening? Another man came into view, blonde, shorter than the victim. I felt Different types of fear from them, one tinged with concern and excitement, the other a bone-deep terror. The gunshot rang out, and a body hit the floor, but I couldn't see the actual murder. At some point during the vision, Zack returned and set his hand on my shoulder. Are you all right? I nodded, not trusting my voice. I had to push through and finish reading the evidence, though I wanted to run from the room with every fiber of my being. The next evidence bag contained a framed picture of Tiffany Mercier taken from her mother's nightstand. The second I touched it, images flooded me. I couldn't tear my hand away, nor could I slow the images from drowning me. Ms. Mercier was awake when the killer came into her room. She couldn't defend herself against the gun. He'd pressed the barrel to her forehead and fired. Ms. Lamar! Zack grabbed for me, managing to break my fall. I stared open-mouthed, unable to form a sentence. What happened? Do I need to call EMS? I shook my head. Tessa? I eased to my feet. My head throbbed as if experiencing residual pain from the murder. I'm fine. It happens sometimes when I do too many readings. I need to make a call. Chapter 31 Detective Burns Aaron's frustration came through the phone. I glanced over my shoulder and leaned further into my cubicle. I needed walls and a door to have this conversation. Hi, it's Tessa. Listen, I was able to get a few images of the Reyes and Mercier cases. Maybe they're not related. Nothing matches. What do you mean, nothing matches? Partridge's and Black's killer had dark hair. Reyes's was blonde. 
Mercier knew her assailant, though I couldn't get a look at his face. I only saw a blurred profile. He had blonde hair, but I can't be sure it's the same guy. Aaron, that killing felt intimate, not like the other two. It was worth a shot. Thanks. He sighed. Hell of a coincidence. Do you want me to come to the rink? I wanted to see him. The defeated tone in his voice pulled on my heartstrings. No need. We have it all on video surveillance. The victim's family is flying in later today. Come to dinner tonight at May's. It's Thanksgiving. He shouted at someone, then came back to the call. Sorry, I don't think I'll be out of here in time. Make me a doggy bag? Of course. Call me later, please. I'll try. He disconnected. The clock on the wall read 2 p.m. I'd left Bryson outside for three hours. I gathered my things and headed for the parking lot. Despite my concern for Aaron and frustration over my apparent bad reputation, the midday sun brought a smile to my face. I looked to the sky and soaked it in. Tessa! Michael Adams jogged across the parking lot. Tessa? What is he doing here? I turned to the SUV and sighed. I'd almost made it. With some effort, I smoothed my expression and walked toward him. Good afternoon. What brings you to the station? I tried your cell and couldn't reach you, so I googled you and, well, I spoke with your great-grandmother. She told me you were here. My head spun. Anyone could poke around online and find my great grandmother's home number. Did something happen? Yes, uh, Gavin is speaking to me through the radio. Michael shifted his weight from one foot to the other. While I had personal experience with spirits, including Gavin, using electronics to make contact, I had serious doubts that Michael had received some sort of cosmic Morse code. Michael, before Gavin and I were dating, he was seeing someone else. Their song was At Last by Etta James. He rolled his eyes. Cliché, I know, but I've heard it three times today. That happens sometimes, but it doesn't happen when the radio isn't on or when I have it set to the rock station. Michael flashed a triumphant smile. His pushiness gave me pause. People inserted themselves into investigations because they had something to hide. In Michael's case, I wondered if it had something to do with his husband's cheating. I see. But why would he play his song with a former lover? Michael's hands curled into fists. I think Terrence is the murderer. I didn't want to encourage him, but at the same time, the police had no leads on the case. What does Terrence look like? Michael shrugged. Blonde, brown eyes, short, nothing to write home about. I never understood what Gavin saw in him. I knew better than to discuss details with the victim's family, but I didn't know how else to explain that Michael had misread the signs. Plus, I worried he might try to take justice into his own hands, if he hadn't already. In my visions, I saw the killer as dark hair. I'm telling you, Terrence had something to do with it. I remembered the photocopy of the artist's sketch in my purse. I unfolded the paper and handed it to him. This is the man I saw. He doesn't look familiar. Michael's hopeful expression morphed into a glare. Detective Burns told me they had some evidence that Gavin might have been unfaithful. Did that come from you? I sighed and lowered my eyes. Yes, I don't know what you think you saw, but it's complete rubbish. I'm sorry, Michael. You said the visions could be wrong. I caught movement out of the corner of my eye and turned. Bryson waved as he walked toward us. I looked back to Michael. No, the visions are always right. I said what the deceased say is sometimes jumbled and confused. I'm certain the killer had dark hair. Bryson set his hand on my lower back and nodded to Michael. I was beginning to worry. 
I had a lot of evidence to get through. I looked back to Michael to find him openly gaping at Bryson. I'm Michael, Michael Adams, Bryson declared. I said, the detectives are working on the case. I'll let you know if I hear anything. Please try to be patient. He looked at me as if he hadn't heard what I said, then took another long look at Bryson and nodded. Thanks. Sorry about calling your family. I thought I'd found something. I forced a smile. I understand. Michael turned and walked back the way he'd come. Bryson whispered, What was that about? His husband was the victim found hanging in the tree. He's grieving and overstepped his boundaries. I took his hand to steady my nerves. The entire conversation had left me shaken. Has he done something like this before? He narrowed his eyes in the direction Michael had gone. No, but he found May's phone number and called the house. Bryson pulled me against his side and guided me to the SUV. Tell Aaron about this and don't go near him again. Thank you. Ready to go? The weight of the day settled on my shoulders. Yes, but we don't need to go to the ice rink. They have it on video. Plus, I saw enough from reading the evidence. I don't think the murders are related. There are at least two different killers. He ran his hand over his jaw. I'm surprised. That they fit into the song seems too much of a coincidence. I agree, but unless the guy is a skinwalker, it's not a serial killer. I have an idea. He held my car door open. I climbed in and buckled my seatbelt. Where are we going? He winked and started the SUV. You must be hungry. And I've been thinking about uh, Sheila's riddle. What do you say we go grab some food and talk to Scarlet? The seer? We'd visited the elderly woman when the second sight came on me out of the blue. She's not Ninahi or a shifter. She's been around a long time. She can help us understand what the old ones are saying. You're an old one and you don't know. I couldn't help but poke fun. Thanks to the Ninahi blood in his veins, Bryson might have looked 30-something, but he was over a 100 years old. Funny girl. He merged into traffic and relaxed. How did the readings go? Any trouble with the Firebird? I debated the merits of telling him about Zack and the rumors about my loose morals. I read quite a few objects in a short amount of time. I did okay, until I caught some gruesomeness off a picture frame. The vision almost pulled me in, but I fought it. That's progress, Tessa. He took my hand. Did something else happen? The cop working the evidence room flat out asked me if I was sleeping with you and Aaron. I was mortified. First, it's no one's business. Second, why do you care what other people think? I stared at him dumbfounded. I'd expected him to come to my defense, maybe laugh it off. Instead, he twisted it around to make it my fault? You don't understand. It's hard enough being a woman in a male-dominated field, add in a bad reputation, and no one will ever take me seriously. He seemed to mull it over, but shrugged. They'll take you seriously for the work you do. The water cooler talk is nothing but rumors and wishful thinking. Easy for you to say. Guys are heroes if they sleep with a lot of women. Bryson's grin faded. You don't think Aaron is catching shit about the news coverage? I haven't heard anything. He gave me a hard look. Do you think they'd gossip with you about him? Why hasn't he mentioned this to me? I don't think he cares about the rumors. He turned into the diner. Why can't people mind their own business? Bryson cut the engine and gave me a did you really just say that look. I thought about what he'd said. Would it bother me if the two men in my life were into each other? Hell yes, it would bother me. Not because I had a problem with them loving each other, but because I didn't know where that left me. I'd be the odd vagina out. 
Chapter 32 A table full of teenagers laughed from a corner booth. Otherwise, I had my choice of tables in the diner. I'd slammed to the door and marched inside to get a break from Bryson's lectures. He lingered outside on his cell phone, probably talking to Aaron. The two seemed to enjoy giving each other daily Tessa reports. I spotted Scarlet behind the counter and waved. Hey, Tessa, good to see you again. She looked from me to Bryson pacing outside. Grab a seat. Want some coffee? Yes, ma'am. That would be nice. I slid into the booth and thumbed through the menu. Despite my rumbling stomach, I decided to stick with coffee. May expected us for dinner in a couple of hours, and she'd smell restaurant food on me a mile away. Scarlet brought a coffee pot and two mugs to the table. You here for food or reading? A reading. I waited until she filled both cups, then added enough cream and sugar to turn the black liquid beige. She set the pot aside and joined me. Man trouble. I glanced at Bryson and nodded. Yes, always. But that's not why I'm here. Scarlet set her hand on top of mine, and her gentle magic seeped into my bones. Her eyes closed, leaving a serene expression on her weathered face. The calm didn't last long. The elderly woman burst into a fit of giggles befitting the teens across the restaurant. Oh, <laughs> to be young again. Dear girl, your great-grandmother is right. You make it too easy for them. I leaned closer and lowered my voice. If I made it too easy, then I'd be having sex. They say I make it too hard. She giggled. Honey, trust me when I say you do make it hard. Both of them. I furrowed my brow as I mulled over her words. I opened my mouth to speak and caught the wicked glint in her eye. Oh, my goodness. She erupted in another round of laughter. I waited until she composed herself. Do you have time to talk? Yes, of course. She tilted her head. It's not that you're too difficult, is it? No. Your firebird is in the way. You know they call redheads fire crotch. But in your case, it's no joke, is it? She took one look at my face and roared in laughter all over again. I wanted to turn around and leave. What's so funny? Bryson gave Scarlet a half hug, careful not to make skin-to-skin -skin contact with the seer. My cheeks blazed redder than the checkered tablecloths. None of your business. Just girl talk. Scarlet motioned for him to sit. Bryson slid into the booth. Tessa had a visit from her Nunahi mother's spirit. I know, I know. Hush, you. Scarlet took his hand without asking. Bryson looked as if he might pull away. He watched her with wary eyes, making me wonder what secrets he might be hiding. She met Bryson's gaze. The laughter had left her expression, leaving her eyes dark and unyielding. Have you not heard the saying, a divided house will fall? I have. Yet, you didn't heed the warning, did you? Bryson lowered his chin. What's done is done. Scarlet turned her attention to me. The spells you cast, the words. Do you take them literally? The words are usually simple, but they also contain symbolism. I'd never thought about the construction of a spell as two separate components. Should I take her words literally? She smiled. What does a bird crave more than anything? To fly? She nodded. What does fire crave? I considered her question, unsure of the answer. Oxygen? Material to burn. Scarlet bobbed her head. More or less. Think of a wildfire. How it spreads and ravages. It cleanses. 
and destroys. I can't go around burning things. Is this the symbolism? It hit me when I met her eyes. It wants out, and I've been keeping it tightly locked down. She pointed at me and looked at Bryson. This one is smart. You underestimate her. My chest swelled with pride. I was smart and had good instincts with everything, except magic and men. Maybe I needed to trust myself and my abilities. Thank you. I'm not done with you. She shook her head. It isn't your emotions that are causing the problem with the firebird. It's your dual nature. My what? Whatever pride I'd felt vanished. Bryson took my hand. Your fear prevents you from being who you are meant to be. Scarlet smacked his arm. No, don't put that on the girl. We all fear. Without it, we'd behave like toddler daredevils with no thought to the consequences. She turned to me. Child, you must learn to give without expectations and take without guilt. The conversation left me more confused than before we sat down. I don't understand. Scarlet turned to Bryson. We need a few minutes alone. He hesitated, but stood and took his coffee to the far side of the restaurant. She took my hands, but this time I didn't feel her magic. You've had a rough start. There's a little girl inside you who's terrified to be alone, yet pushes people away. The woman she became worries herself to death that others will see her the way she sees herself. You must learn to accept yourself and believe you deserve to be loved. Let go of the past and stop worrying about the future. Words of denial hung on the tip of my tongue, but I bowed my head as my throat tightened. She barely knew me, and she'd call me on my crap. Years of study to understand what made people tick, and I failed to apply any of the knowledge to my life. No, stop that right now. Scarlet patted my hand. Listen to me. I met her gaze and nodded. These are hard lessons. Most of us have a lifetime to learn them. You'll get there, but you'll have to make a choice soon. You'll embrace your magic. Or you'll give it away. I can do that? Give it up and have my normal life back? A kernel of hope formed in my heart. If that is what you want, yes. She leaned back. I have to get back to work before I get fired. Sure you don't want something to eat? Eat? I couldn't imagine putting food in my mouth. So many thoughts rolled around in my head, I felt seasick. No, thank you. We're expected for dinner soon. Scarlet stood and motioned to Bryson. Go easy on him. He has his own lessons to learn. I turned toward him and really looked for the first time in a while. He sat hunched over his coffee. Shadows rimmed his eyes and accentuated the hard lines of his face. Scarlet, will Bryson and I end up together? Aren't you together now? I guess, but she shrugged. I'm better at seeing the past than the future, but I've known Bryson a long time. He loves you deeply, but he's holding back. Maybe he's as afraid as you are to let down his wall. Chapter 33 I contemplated the man sitting next to me the entire drive home. From the way his jaw muscles bulged, I imagine he did the same with me. Bryson's phone chirped for the 15th time in half as many minutes. His ability to ignore incoming calls and messages drove me nuts. Want me to answer it? 
I smiled as sweetly as possible, given my current mood. No. He took my hand. About this morning. I understand why you question my feelings for you, but you have to know I love you. Bryson. Please, let me finish. I've thought about this. When we're spending time together, it's just us. No magic. No elders. The times we're watching television or cleaning the kitchen are the best parts of my day. I'd feel the same way about you if you were human. Really? My heart did a backflip and landed in my stomach. He'd said similar things in the past, but this time they took hold. I'm crazy about you. I wiped my eyes. Scarlet said something to me that made a lot of sense. I'm afraid of being left on some doorstep, so I push people away. I don't want to push you away. He squeezed my hand. Good, because I'm not going anywhere. Do you want to talk about the other thing she said? I knew I poked the skunk, but I wanted everything out in the open between us. Brasson's phone rang again. He frowned. She's as bad as a Gila speaking in riddles. Sorry. Don't apologize. I'm stressed. Tribal members have been calling, asking when we'll reopen. Oh, that has to be hard. My mind wandered back to what Scarlet had said about Bryson and Aaron, and a wicked thought crossed my mind. I could help relieve some of your stress. How's that? I turned to face him and ran my hand up his thigh. He glanced at me and sighed. We're running late. I considered the console between the front seats. If I put my seat back all the way, I could lean across and miss most of the dials and knobs on the control panel. I pushed my insecurities down and gathered my courage as I slid my hand over his crotch. You drive. I'll take care of you. Tessa. He gripped the wheel tighter. We're almost there. Turn around and circle the block a couple of times. I opened the buttons on his fly, one by one. I want to do this for you. He drew a sharp breath when I slipped my hand into his jeans. Let me pull over before you get us both killed. I leaned across the console and kissed his neck as he maneuvered the rover onto the shoulder. Another mile, and I'd have missed my chance. I could see the edge of my family's property from where he stopped. He turned to kiss me, but I backed away. No kissing. Gets me going, and we don't want that. Are you sure about this? I like this vehicle. You won't scorch the leather. He eased his seat back as he spoke. Don't touch any of my pink parts, and we should be fine. With something akin to an advanced yoga pose, I used the console to brace myself and managed to get my head into his lap. He might have worried about his upholstery, but his body didn't care. I wrapped my hand around his length and lowered my head. Bryson exhaled and lifted his hips, meeting me in the middle. It had always amazed me how men could simultaneously relax into sex and tense up. I'd done it. I'd taken what I wanted, given without expecting anything in return. Better still, I hoped I'd chipped away at some of his walls. My eyes closed as I focused on making him feel good. The clank of something metal knocking against the window stilled everything except my heart. I didn't know what to do. It wasn't as if I made a practice of giving blowjobs in a car on the side of the road. The beam of a flashlight illuminated the driver's seat as Bryson fumbled to move me enough to close his britches and lower the window. Damn, sorry. I saw you on the side of the road and thought you'd broken down. Aaron's voice filled the car. I cut out early to join you two for Thanksgiving dinner. I glanced up but couldn't see his face behind the bright light. I wanted to die right there, 
keel over and never have to face either one of them. My eyes low, I eased back into my seat. Light. Bryson shielded his eyes. Sorry, man. Aaron cut the flashlight. I, uh, I'll see you guys at May's. I waited until he walked toward his car before I moved. The stunned look on Bryson's face made me giggle. Not in a cute way. Full-on, maniacal laughter spilled out of me until tears leaked from the corners of my eyes. It's not funny. I nodded, still unable to control myself. He cracked a smile and shook his head. We, you and me, can't catch a break. I turned to make sure Aaron had pulled away. Let's try again. No, we're already late. Who cares? What's five more minutes going to hurt? I leaned over and ran my hand down his chest. He cupped my cheek and brushed his lips across mine. The sweet kiss grew more passionate when I dipped my hand lower. His hands tangled in my hair as he broke the kiss and urged my head down. I'd just hit my stride when a car horn honked. Damn it! Bryson growled and lowered the window. His hand remained on the back of my head, signaling me to stay put. Hey, Darlene. You broke down or something? Need a ride? Her saccharine voice grated my nerves. I'm good. Stop to make a call. He turned the motor over. See you at Maze. See you then, sweet buns. The sound of tires on gravel told me that she'd pulled away. I scrambled back into my seat. Whatever humor I'd found in the situation had gone. Honestly, that woman! He steered the SUV onto the road and headed for Mays. She is who she is. I frowned. Do you think we're cursed? Maybe someone put a chastity spell on us? I think it's the universe's way of telling us to wait. Oh, no. Don't you dare start that again. I know one blowjob isn't going to fix everything that's wrong between us. I'm not stupid. He parked between Aaron and Darlene's cars. We'll talk about this later. Damn it, Bryson. I want to talk about it now. I swear on everything good and holy, if you tell me this'll work out in time, I'll deck you. Tessa Marie Lamar, where did you come from? Darlene stood on the porch with her hands on her hips. I know I didn't see you in that vehicle before. We need to get inside. Bryson opened his door and stepped out. I hung my head and counted to ten. The real problem with our relationship was that we never had five minutes alone. We couldn't finish a conversation let alone get comfortable with each other, when someone always interrupted us. It wasn't healthy. What's the matter, Tessa? Got caught with your hand in the cookie jar? Darlene smirked. Actually, Mama, I got caught with his penis in my mouth. Twice. I marched to the porch. May, Dottie, Bryson, Aaron, and Stone all stared, slack-jawed. Chapter 34 I stiffened my spine and my upper lip and walked past my gawking family. May and Dottie had set the table and steaming piles of food, along with a gorgeous turkey, waited for someone to dig in. I had my own steaming pile of something to dig into, but I'd be damned if I broke the silence. I poured myself and brass in a glass of tea and carried them to the table as everyone took their seats. The tension in the room threatened to suffocate me as I sank into the chair between brass and an Aaron. Tessa, you might want to go wash up and brush your teeth before you get too comfortable. Darlene nodded toward the hall. May's voice rose to just shy of a shout. I'm not going to have my dinner go to waste because Tessa Marie got a little nookie in the car. She shook her head. 
we're all adults at this table, and I assume we've all had our share of sex in cars. Bryson drew a breath and took my hand under the table. Did they have cars when Grandpa was courting you? Darlene giggled. Besides, Tessa wasn't having sex. She was given a pre-dinner blowjob. The firebird flared along with my temper. I'd had enough. I pulled my hand from Bryson's and slammed it on the table. I guess the apple didn't fall far from the slut tree, did it, Mama? Dottie gasped, and Aaron bowed his head. I'd overstepped, and I knew it. May cleared her throat, stood and went to the Tupperware cabinet. She pulled out enough containers to store the food and set them on the table. I've had enough of this business between the two of you. Everyone fill a bowl and get the hell out of my house before I break out the switch and tan all your hides. You have ten minutes. I sat stunned as May and Dottie left the room. Part of me wanted to run after them and apologize, but I knew better than to chase a ticked-off badger into its den. Instead, I glanced between Aaron and Bryson and sighed. Darlene shot me dirty looks as she filled bowls with more than her and Stone's fair share of dinner. I did my best to ignore her as I made plates for May and Dottie and set them on the counter. The men put the remainder of the food into containers and cleared the serving dishes from the table. They exchanged a look now and then but didn't seem as upset as the women in the house. Stone washed, Aaron rinsed, and Bryson dried the serving bowls. I put the clean plates and silverware in the cabinet and whispered to Bryson, I'm sorry. Not now. He ran his finger over the back of my hand. Aaron flashed me a quick grin over his shoulder. Of course, Darlene sat her butt in her chair and didn't lift a finger to help out. I wanted to snatch her by the hair and drag her outside, but May would make good on her promise to get a switch if I dared. Bryson, Aaron, and I walked up the path to Charlie's house. I'd done it. I'd ruined Thanksgiving dinner. I'd let Darlene bait me into an argument at May's table, a mortal sin as far as my great-grandmother was concerned. We should eat while it's still warm. Bryson put the containers on the table and went into the kitchen for silverware. My stomach rumbled in response. I hadn't seen food since breakfast. Plus, a full mouth would decrease my chances of saying something awful. I'll get the plates. Aaron sat and folded his hands in his lap. Should we talk about this? Which part? The last thing I wanted to do was talk about it. Aaron glanced between us. All of it? Bryson took a seat. We were careless. It won't happen again. I'm not comfortable discussing my sex life with anyone Except the other party directly involved in said sex life. I smiled at Aaron to ease the tension. No offense. He held up his hands. None taken. We don't need to discuss what happened earlier, but we do need to decide how we're going to proceed from here. Bryson opened the containers and filled his plate. Tessa, I know you don't want another lecture, so... Why don't you go first? I shook my head. Nope. No way. I wouldn't allow them to suck me into this conversation. I thought we settled things on the drive? Yes, but there's another person to consider. Bryson said. Tessa. Aaron sighed. Have a seat. Let's talk this through. I sank into a chair and folded my arms. After the blow-up with Darlene, I needed comfort, not to plan my future or debate the benefits of a three-way. Aaron rubbed his hands together. So, how does this work? I have, what, 10% of your soul, so I get 
10% of her time? You'd be happy with that? I grumbled. Once I found out you two were different than me, I figured that was it. I'm happy to have a shot. Aaron squeezed my hand. I'd like the chance to get to know you better. That didn't sound bad. It didn't come close to what I'd expected. I'm okay with that. Same here. Bryson set his elbows on the table and leaned in. With both of you. I tried to maintain my poker face and failed. My brain spun like a ride at the fair, bringing questions, doubts, and fears to the surface. What's the end game here? Am I supposed to choose between you? Bryson said, There's no end game. We can take it one day at a time. I nodded. Okay, I guess. Aaron nudged me. Relax your shoulders and say that again. I don't know the rules. This is different than dating humans. I'd suffered enough humiliation for one day. I couldn't tell them I was afraid they'd pair off and leave me. How would we explain this kind of relationship to the world? Brasson brushed his fingers across my cheek. You're right. It's an unusual situation. But that doesn't mean it's wrong. We should take a break. Eat dinner. Maybe a few beers would help loosen us up. Aaron looked at Bryson. They shared some unspoken language and came to a decision without a glance my way. Sounds great. I smiled and put my napkin in my lap. I couldn't stop scrolling through my growing list of concerns and worst-case scenarios. Dessa? Aaron held a container of turkey out to me. By the look on his face, I assumed he'd waited for me to take it for a while. Are you sure you're okay? I'm all right. They shared a meaningful look. I wanted to scream. Relationships involved actual communication, not some bizarre code using eyebrows and dimples. Bryson tilted his head and studied me. Aaron's phone rang, breaking the tension. He stood and took the call in the kitchen. Bryson and I sat in silence until he returned. That was Samuels. I have to go to the station. Aaron split a roll in half and stuffed it with a piece of turkey. The facial recognition analysis of the surveillance video from the rink is in. I'll save you a plate. I smiled as he leaned in and kissed my cheek. Thanks. You two have fun. Don't do anything I wouldn't. Yeah, never mind. He chuckled as he gave Bryson a half-hug backslap. Be safe, brother. Bryson turned back to his plate and sighed. After Aaron had left, I propped my chin in my hand. Not much of a Thanksgiving. I have a lot to be thankful for. He smiled and took a bite of turkey. I didn't feel particularly thankful. In fact, I wished I had a rewind button. I'd go back a year and a day and spend the holiday with Charlie. Back then, my biggest problem was my jerk of a boss. I didn't know anything about magic or shifters, and Nunahi lived in old Cherokee fairy tales. The obvious answer to my problems hung over my head like an executioner's blade. In a way, it meant the death of a part of me, a part that had caused me nothing but grief. I couldn't go back in time, but I could be human again. Chapter 35 I woke in my new bedroom with the dog sleeping across my legs. I glanced at the clock and wiggled myself free. Bryson stood at the stove cooking French toast. Good morning. How'd you sleep? Like a rock, but I'm late. It's Black Friday. I have to take May and Dottie shopping. I poured myself a cup of coffee. Your phone rang about five minutes ago. I planned to wake you for breakfast. Thanks. 
I wandered into the bathroom while listening to the first message. Hi, Tessa. This is Michael. Michael Adams. Remember I told you about Gavin's ex? I ran into him last night. I know what you said you saw, but I'm telling you, something isn't right. Call me, please. I sighed and hit save. The next message was from Aaron. Morning, beautiful. Sorry I had to run out last night. They arrested Michael Adams on a drunken disorderly. I know you said you couldn't find a connection between the murders, but the guy who killed Callan looks a lot like the sketch. I didn't have time to deal with this. May would disown me if I didn't take her to the Black Friday sale soon. I set the phone on the counter while I brushed my teeth and washed my face. Maddie pushed her way into the bathroom, growling at the full-length mirror. Down, Maddie, bad dog. Her growls turned into a full-blown barking fit. The feeling of someone watching caused the hairs on the back of my neck to rise. I turned and met Gavin Partridge's eyes in the mirror. In Bermuda shorts and a linen button-down, he looked like any other middle-aged Floridian male, except for the strand of lights wrapped around his neck and the horrified look on his swollen, blue-tinged face. You must find Terry before it's too late for the swans. Save my swans! My mouth moved, but nothing came out. I'd seen my fair share of spirits, but never once so gruesome. Most appeared to me as they had looked in life. My true love gave to me six geese a laying, five golden rings, four calling birds, three French hens, two turtle doves. He faded from view. Bryson! This isn't right. Oh, my God, this can't be happening. I tripped over the dog in my haste to get out of the bathroom. He was here. I need you. Bryson came around the corner and wrapped his arms around me. It's okay. Relax. Who was here? Although I thought Gavin had gone, the dog continued to bark at the mirror. Maddie, down. Bryson's voice cut through the noise and sent the dog running for the kitchen. It's not her fault. She was barking at Gavin Partridge, his ghost. I buried my face in his chest. He looked like he did when he was hanging in the tree. There are going to be more murders. I need to call Aaron. Slow down. Tell me what he said. I repeated the ghost's words while Bryson held me. His gentle caresses siphoned the edge off my hysteria until I stopped trembling. I'll call Aaron. Try to eat something. Thanks. I took one look at the food and pushed the plate away. The blueberry syrup reminded me of the ghost's face. I opened a browser on my phone and searched the words geese, murder, deaths, central Florida. Nothing came up. From Bryson's half of the conversation, it sounded like Aaron took the situation seriously. I scratched Maddie's head as I searched the name Gavin Partridge. The screen filled with articles about the upcoming Christmas extravaganza. Gavin had submitted the bid to the event organizers last year. As a result of the win, the Convention and Visitors Bureau promoted him to an upper management position. On a whim, I added Terrence to the search menu. One article mentioned a Terrence Pierce in conjunction with Las Vegas's bid to host the festivities. I cut and pasted the information into my notes app and refilled my mug. If the morning were any indication, I'd need a lot more caffeine to make it through the day. Bryson returned and frowned at my untouched plate. Aaron's going to question Michael Adams. Keep your phone handy in case he needs to reach you. Thanks for calling him. I used my mug to warm my hands. I think this has something to do with the Christmas extravaganza. He sat beside me. Okay. Gavin was the one who sent in the bid. It was his project. What do you know about the event? Not much, I sighed. Gavin said to save his swans, but mentioned the geese with the other days in the song, the days with murders. 
I can't find anything online about murders related to geese. Use my computer to dig up information on the Christmas extravaganza. I'll take me shopping. My heart warmed a few degrees. He drove me up the wall 90% of the time, but the other 10, Bryson was a peach. You don't know what you're volunteering for. It's ugly out there. I think I can handle Christmas shoppers. It's not the shoppers I'm worried about. Have you ever had to restrain an 87-year-old woman after she clotheslined another shopper? Bryson ran his hand over the back of his neck. I smiled, knowing he'd rethought his decision. It's okay. I'll take May and Dottie. You stay here and do some research. Your car is still in the parking lot. I can drive Charlie's truck. It's okay. It'll do me good to get out of the house. Afraid of seeing another ghost? He grinned. Heck yes. I don't mind the ones that look like regular people, but that was something entirely different. The memory of Gavin's ghost would likely plague me for the rest of my life. Did he feel malevolent? We could do a cleansing spell. No, I don't think so. More desperate than anything. Desperate people do bad things. Maybe desperate ghosts do too? He wrapped his arm around my shoulder and kissed my temple. Let's stay in tonight. Order a pizza and watch a movie. Just the two of us. No phones, no ghosts. Sounds perfect, but I need to get next door before Mason's at a search party. I kissed his cheek and went to my room to get dressed. I'd tell him about my decision to release my magic after dinner. It would ruin our evening, but I hated secrets. If he still loved me as a human, we'd have plenty of nights on the couch watching movies. See you this afternoon. I waved to Bryson on my way to May's. I hoped that shopping would provide the opportunity to apologize and move past my ruining Thanksgiving. I walked through the front door into a dark kitchen. Grand May? Dottie? My stomach sank. The house was empty. I pulled a note from the fridge and sighed. They'd changed their plans and gone shopping with a lady from church. Chapter 36 I came through the front door and dropped my purse on the floor. I hadn't upset May like this since high school when she caught me sneaking out to meet a boy. As horrible as that was, it didn't compare to the shame I felt now. Bryson took one look at me and stood. What's wrong? They're not home. Me and Dottie went shopping without me. He embraced me, remaining quiet until I relaxed in his arms. May was pretty upset yesterday. Give her some time. She's never been this mad. Not at me. He kissed my forehead. Why don't you do the research, and I'll get started on the Christmas lights. That'll soften her up. I guess. What choice did I have? Pouting and worrying over it wouldn't help. I refilled my coffee cup and sat at the table. I'll be outside if you have any unexpected visitors. He and the dog headed for the door. I smiled and waved him off. Have fun! The pressure to put on a brave face left as soon as Bryson went out the door. Rather than dig in right away, I decided to take a shower to clear my head. I stood under the water, staring at the wall while taking stock of my life. I believed the situation with May would sort itself out after I ate a dozen crows and apologized to Darlene. For once, I didn't grieve for Charlie. Instead, I mourned the loss of the gifts he'd left. I couldn't help but feel I would let him down if I gave up my magic. Enough of the pity party. I have research to do. Yes, you do, young lady. A male voice spoke from the other side of the curtain. At first, I assumed that Bryson had returned, but it occurred to me that the person had a southern drawl. Plus, Bryson's tone registered a couple of octaves lower than whoever spoke. I peeked out of the shower curtain. 
and the blood turned to a cherry slushy. Chop, chop, Miss Lamar. We're here to help you. Gavin Partridge, in his hangman glory, stood beside the sink. We? I clung to the plastic barrier, both for modesty and safety. Gavin rolled his bulging eyes. The other spirits. We're all here to help you stop Terrence. Could I have a moment, please? Psh, I've seen it all before. Besides, I prefer outies to innies. I snatched the towel from the rod and wrapped it around myself. I hadn't finished my shower, but he showed no signs of leaving. I assume you had better manners before you died. He laughed and blurred out of sight. I hurried into my room and threw on jeans and a t-shirt, then pulled my hair into a ponytail. It'd be impossible to tame if it dried without putting some effort into it, but I had spirits waiting. On a typical day, the waiting room for the medicine shop contained a handful of people to see Bryson or me. This was no ordinary day. Ghosts crammed into every available square inch, some overlapping or floating above others. Dear Lord in heaven, I grasped the door jam for support. How many are here? Gavin smiled, or at least I thought he meant it as a smile. Twelve. The youngest McNamara survived. McNamara? I glanced over the crowd, noting the three children. Six geese a laying. Gavin gave me an impatient look and threw his hands up. I don't understand. Where do the geese come in? His swollen face darkened. The McNamara family ran gooseberry farms, one of only two turkey farms in the state. They were to supply the birds for the extravaganza dinner. Oh, I had questions but my head felt as crowded as the room and just as foggy. An older woman I recognized from the photos of the third death scene stepped forward. Her form hadn't solidified as much as Gavin's, but the bullet hole in her head was unmistakable. Gavin, go easy on the poor dear. She's in shock. He put his hands on his hips and tapped his foot. I assume there's a computer here. Do you have internet access? I sighed. Yes, we have Wi-Fi. I wasn't sure, given this house. I mean, it's rustic meets the 70s. He smirked and motioned to me to get on with it. I hated Gavin Partridge. Sure, someone hit him on the head and hung him from a tree, but that didn't give him the right to be rude. Bryson's laptop still sat on the table. I went into the kitchen and sat. Terence Pierce. Gavin leaned over my shoulder. Space, please. I leaned forward. He didn't have warmth or breath, but it bugged me to have him so close. I tapped in the name and the same websites populated the page. Do you have his address or phone number? In my contacts. Gavin glared at the picture on the screen. That's him. This isn't the man I saw hurt you. But it was the man Gavin had sex with before someone else killed him. It has to be. He's in Orlando now. Who else would do such a thing? Gavin sputtered. Is Simon Reyes here? I raised my voice, hoping the ghost would hear me. A mist resembling the shape of a human moved into the kitchen like smoke exhaled from a pipe. He's not going to be much help. Gavin shook his head. I turned the computer toward Mr. Reyes's ghost. Is this the man who shot you? The mist didn't respond. I closed my eyes and focused on his energy. But sadness, unlike anything I'd experienced, surrounded me. His longing for his wife left me breathless. Adele, Gavin called as if directing a play. A lithe female spirit appeared, dressed in a long white gown. She was pretty and lithe, but the ethereal beauty standing before me belonged in a painting. Miss Mercier, did you know your killer? I whispered. 
The peace in her eyes made it feel like a sin to speak in her presence. I knew Terry from my time in Vegas. I considered him a friend. Miss Mercier's hair shifted, revealing the ugly wound on her forehead. I'm so sorry. Her words confirmed my vision, yet they took the breath from my lungs. I couldn't imagine the horror of a friend holding a gun to my head with the intention of ending my life. I swallowed past the lump in my throat and turned to Gavin. Do you know why he's doing this? Gavin puffed out his chest. We were lovers before he took a job in Vegas. When I refused to come along, he broke things off. It got ugly, as these things often do. I stole the Christmas extravaganza from him. All of these people were involved in the event? I glanced into the other room at the ghost children. I wanted to call him out on his lie. Terrence was his current lover, but I didn't want to embarrass him. Yes, 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 you need to focus. The swans are next. As his temper flared, his neck strained against the Christmas lights. Do you have any idea who the next victim will be? I'd have never thought that the turkey farmers would land a spot on the hit list of a jilted lover. I didn't want to venture a guess about swans. Miss Mercier rested her hand on Gavin's shoulder. The Orlando Ballet are doing excerpts from Swan Lake at the Christmas Ball. They are the obvious choice. I considered each of the murders. Some of the victims had a clear association with the lyrics of the song, while others didn't. He does seem to go for obvious when he can. Shouldn't you call someone? That big guy outside, what about him? How about the cop? Shouldn't you call the detective? Gavin fired off questions so fast I needed to duck and weave to avoid the bombardment. Please, give me a minute. Chapter 37 I walked outside for fresh air and to call Aaron without the spectral audience. Gavin's attitude plucked a rhythm on my last nerve. While I understood his need to save the people he'd hired for the Christmas extravaganza, his personality made me want to strangle him all over again. Aaron answered on the second ring. Hey, Tessa, what's up? I'd rehearsed what I wanted to say, but the words left me. I have a house full of ghosts. Bryson must have heard what I said because he climbed down from the ladder and listened in. It sounded like Aaron choked on his coffee. <coughs> I think I have a bad connection. Can you repeat that? Gavin Partridge and the other murder victims are here. They've identified the shooter in the Mercier case and the motive for all six. Gavin believes there will be more killings. Does the shooter have a name? Terrence Pierce. He's in town. He's Partridge's former lover and business competitor. All of the victims were involved in the Christmas extravaganza. I sat on the porch swing and closed my eyes. Aaron sighed. We've identified two shooters, plus this guy is a pro. Six geese laying were the McNamara family. The youngest child survived the attack and is in the hospital. They're turkey farmers at Gooseberry Farms. I sent up a silent prayer he'd listen, despite the unusual witnesses. I'll look into it. So, did the ghosts tell you who's next? The cast of Swan Lake from the Orlando Ballet. Aaron tapped hard enough for the sound to come through the line. Son of a bitch. I found the McNamara case. Out of jurisdiction. Can you get someone to take you serious enough to send people to the ballet? I'll see what I can do. Thanks, Aaron. I need to go. I disconnected and turned to Bryson. How much of that did you hear? Most, if not all. He motioned to the front door. Are they still in there? As far as I know, I planted my feet and set my elbows on my thighs. I can't do this anymore. He knelt and took my face in his hands. 
do what, babe? Talk to spirits, magic, the spirit animal, all of it. I never asked for any of this. It's still new to you. You'll get used to it. And I pulled away. In time, I know. But right now, I have a living room full of ghosts, including three children with bullet holes in their heads. Magic is like bad relations. You need boundaries. I snickered. (laughs) Sit with me a minute before I have to go back in there. I'm not joking. Do you remember the spell we used to send the conjurer away? Yes. He reached for me. Let's go clean house. I took his hand and he opened the door. The spirit stilled when we entered as if they knew what we planned. He gave my hand a squeeze and we recited the spell. Someone has to move. You have to go. You will go in the dark. You will hide in the day. I send you away, back to where you were, through paths not walked, with eyes not seeing. I send you away, as it is said. It will be. Gavin rushed toward me. No, Tessa, you can't do this. You need my help. The terrified look in his eyes made me pause. I glanced at Bryson, but he either ignored or didn't see the ghosts surrounding us. He started the second incantation without me. I tucked his arm. Can we keep one? Gavin clasped his hands. Please, please keep one. The look Bryson gave said he thought I'd lost my mind. Why? I shrugged. Keeping Gavin close might come in handy. I will definitely come in handy. I'll be as quiet as a dead church mouse. I swear it, Gavin added. You can call them to you by name when needed. Brasson leaned close. I'm not living in a house full of spirits. Gavin rolled his eyes. Oh, please. I've already seen everything there is to see with the both of you, including that pitiful scene in the car. I'd heard enough. Bad enough that my family knew what we'd done in the car. But a dead stranger had no business peeping on our private moments. Let's do this. Tessa, please. I'm joking. Bryson and I chanted the spell two more times before the last of the spirits left the house. I took my time searching for any stragglers with my second sight. Over the previous months, I'd cast more spells than I could count. I'd always assumed my magic came from the firebird. Yet, she hadn't stirred when we forced the spirits to leave. He looked at me with a hopeful expression. Are they gone? Yep. The stress of the day caught up with me, and I plopped into a chair. Do you tap into your spirit animal when working magic? It all comes from the same source. I feel it in my chest. We did the spell, but the firebird didn't rise. I felt your energy working with mine. He sat on the edge of the sofa. We should shift and spend some time in the sky. My eyes drifted closed before I blinked them open. I'm exhausted. I need a cat nap. The house phone rang, and Brasson went to the kitchen to answer. I tried to listen to his half of the conversation. But I couldn't follow the words. I felt as if I hadn't slept in days. Bryson stormed into the bedroom and returned with Charlie's shotgun in his hands. Go in the back, now. The unmistakable click-click of a shotgun woke me from my daze. Who's out there? I don't know. May said Maddie is barking and growling at the door. He peeked through the curtains. I stood and the room swirled around me. I don't feel so good. He looked back and set the gun aside. My vision blurred, and I staggered. Bryson carried me through the house. By the time we reached the backyard, I could barely lift my head. The fatigue settled into my bones, making the smallest movement difficult. He sank to his knees and kissed me, hard. 
His magic burst through our connection like a phantom tendril, reaching into me and pulling my spirit animal to the surface. I threw my head back and screamed as she tore through my defenses. My vision sharpened as I soared, struggling to hold on to some hint of control. The firebird fought me at every turn. Movement below drew my attention as we circled back toward the house. Shadowy figures ran toward the road. Men shouted, but I couldn't make out their words, only their fear. My anger came through her as she shrieked and dove for the closest man. She wanted fire and blood. I remembered her rage. We'd killed before. The great hawk called to us, causing her to hesitate. In her moment of weakness, I grappled for control. The human half of me pushed forward. I had this sensation of magic flowing back into my body and panicked. If I shifted from this height, I'd fall to my death. Sure, we'd rise again, but I didn't like the idea of splattering onto the ground. I loosened my grip on her enough to maintain my current form and turned back toward the house. She bucked and pushed, testing my hold, but settled as we approached Bryson. Once safely on the ground, I shifted. Before I could tell him I'd managed to control her, he drew me into his arms. We need to claim each other as mates. Enough is enough. Bryson crushed me against his chest. Chapter 38 Bryson and I stood in the middle of the backyard, him fully clothed, me naked as a jaybird, and dumbfounded by his demand that we officially become mates. Now? Yes, now. I couldn't stop them. If we were mated, I would have sensed the attack. His fingers bit into my arms. The elders? I didn't get a look at their faces, but... Who else would come here and try to hurt me? His jaw tensed and his eyes darkened. I thought he might shake me, but he released my arms and bowed his head. I'm sorry. I'm still foggy. I can't believe they came here. I shivered in the chilly night air. Can we go inside? He wrapped his arm around my shoulder and walked me into the house. Did you recognize them? No, I saw five men piling into two pickup trucks. I don't remember the color. At the time, I was trying to keep the firebird from lighting them up. I stepped away from him and went into the bathroom for my robe. You should have. Bryson frowned. I don't need any more blood on my hands. Besides, I can't begin to imagine the hell killing the elders would unleash on us. I need to put an end to this. I agree, but we have to do it smart or it will end poorly for all of us. I sighed. Besides, we can't be sure who it was out there. You should have attacked. Burns are hard to heal. I ignored his comment. Why didn't you shift and come with me? It took quite a bit of energy to draw her out of you. She'd nearly gone dormant. He motioned to the couch. I'll speak to Buck tomorrow. He'll tell me if the council ordered the attack. Then what? Then we find a way to stop this from happening again. He drew a breath and looked away. We need to talk. I curled up in the corner of the couch. The look in his eyes made my stomach hurt. If we had said the words and completed the ritual, I would have felt the spell when it first started. I could have protected you tonight. I could speak in your place with the elders. You're the one who didn't want to make any decisions. I couldn't understand why he behaved as if I'd put up objections to our relationship. I was wrong. I chewed the cuticle on my thumb, tasting blood. Tessa? A better chance to tell him how I felt wouldn't come along. But I couldn't get my mouth and brain to sync up. I think it's time. I want to be human. 
The words tumbled out of me. He furrowed his brow. What? Achila, Charlie, and Scarlet all said I would have to make a choice to keep the Firebird or let her go. I don't want it. I want to be normal again. His eyes widened and his face paled. You don't know what you're saying. Yes, I do. I didn't understand why he argued. This is my choice. Baby, listen to me. You don't know what that means. The horror in his voice shook me to my core. Then explain it to me. You'd be dead right now if not for your magic. I shrugged. I wouldn't have been shot at in the first place. He hung his head. I'm sorry. You're right. It's your decision. What aren't you telling me? He stood with a stoic expression so unlike him, but it hurt me to see it. It's getting late. I knew what his response would be before I spoke. Is it because you can't do the mating ritual with a human? Let's do it now before I change back. I overreacted. We should take some time. Think it through. No, that's bullshit. I stood, ready to go toe to toe. I couldn't handle any more rejection. He wanted me or he didn't. Will you leave me because I want to be human? No. I'd give up my hawk for you. A sliver of a smile curled his lips. If that's what I have to do. That I remained standing after the verbal gut punch was a miracle. I knew he meant what he said, but I couldn't ask that of him. He wanted the best for me, but I didn't know good from bad anymore. I'd had nonstop drama since the day Charlie died and needed my world to return to normal. However, Every decision I made created new chaos. The phone rang, and Bryson went into the kitchen to answer. I ignored the conversation, too wrapped up in myself to care. He moved to the door. I'll be back in a few minutes. Where are you going? To talk to May and Dottie. Oh, no. I forgot. Dottie must be terrified. I'll go with you. I ran into my room to get dressed. I'd officially earned the Worst Family Member of the Year award. While I sat arguing with Bryson, Dottie was probably worried sick about John Macon hurting her again. What's going on? You mentioned a history between Dottie and John Macon? My need to confide in him warred with my promise to respect Dottie's privacy. She asked me not to tell anyone the details. All I can say is, she is afraid of Macon, and we need to make sure she's okay. I'll trust your judgment. He opened the door and stepped outside, likely looking for danger. As we walked side by side down the path to Maze, I scrutinized the field on the edge of the property. I opened the door between myself and the firebird, and my vision sharpened. I could make out moving blobs of light in the darkness. Nothing large enough to be human. There's no one out there, I said. You can see in this light. I sealed my spirit animal away, and my sight returned to normal. When I steal a little magic from the firebird, I can see heat signatures. Is that infrared? Yes, and unusual, because birds don't have that type of sight. He stopped walking. What do you mean, steal magic? I shrugged, feeling self-conscious. It's more like borrowing. I imagine cracking open a door between us and letting her magic through. He stared until I looked away. I've failed you. Bryson closed his eyes. That's ridiculous. He took my hands. You're a house divided. You are the Firebird, and she is you. You can't keep that part of yourself separate. It would be like... Only using your liver once in a while. I shook my head. I can't control her as it is. How am I supposed to let her out all the time? He smiled. Because you'll learn to use what you need when you need it. I don't feel your hawk all the time. Because I don't need that part of myself all the time. 
He pulled me to his chest. I don't understand. You've told me to hold her back, to control her. It's a misnomer. What I mean is for you to hold back and control your urges. If that's the case, I'm doomed. I don't have anything close to your self-control. No, but you're more stubborn than I am. We continued walking in silence. I couldn't quite wrap my brain around how to function with that much magic flowing through me. Though, I could see how using it throughout the day would lessen the shock of releasing it all at once. He knocked on the door. May, it's Bryson. I stood a few feet away, unsure if May would welcome me into her house. The door opened a sliver. You didn't need to come. I told you we were fine. Maddie managed to get her nose in the crack and wiggle until May widened the gap. At least the dog was happy to see us. I wanted to make sure. He bent to scratch the dog's ears. I stepped forward. Graham? How's Dottie? May looked to me, and her expression softened. She's a little shaken up, but Maddie made enough racket that they didn't bother to come here. Bryson knelt and rubbed the dog's chest. Good girl. Mouth open and tongue out, Maddie wagged the back half of her body. She seemed pleased with herself, or maybe she figured May would make her eggs in the morning. May patted her leg, and the dog returned to her side. Maddie and I are tuckered out. We're going back to bed. Bryson, come by in the morning and tell me what's going on. Tessa Marie. Call your mama. May closed the door. Bryson turned and grinned. She's kidnapped my dog. Looks that way for now. She'll send her back next time Maddie steals food off the table. Good point. I slid my hand in his as we walked home. I'm tired of arguing with you. Everything doesn't have to be an argument. But we need to talk about this. He drew a breath as if about to launch into a lecture. No more talking tonight. I released him and jogged up the path. The more distance I put between us, the less I'd hear if he decided to run down his top ten list of reasons why I needed to control my magic, keep my magic, grow up, or not have sex. He caught up with me and took my hand. Sleep with me tonight. I cast him a sideways glance. You turned me down not an hour ago. Sleep beside me tonight. Bryson's expression made me wonder if his invitation had included more. Heaven help me if I'd refused an actual proposition. I needed a bigger mouth or smaller feet to make it with Bryson long term. Chapter 39 The morning sun brightened the room but the smile on my face had nothing to do with the weather. Bryson and I had spent the rest of our weekend together. During the days, we tidied our offices and replenished our supplies. In the evenings, we'd rekindled our relationship and tested the limits of my self-control, which had improved quite a bit, though not enough to break the dry spell. I stretched out on the king-sized bed, marveling at the sheets. I didn't know anything could feel this soft. Good morning. I can't believe it's Monday. How'd you sleep? Bryson handed me a cup of coffee and settled in to watch the morning news. Other than your snoring keeping me up? I scooted close and sipped my coffee. Have you noticed my emotions and the firebird have chilled out? He slid his arm around me. I think it has something to do with spending time with me. I laughed. That's a little self-serving, but I agree. I spoke to Buck. He claims the elders didn't order the attack on you. Skepticism ruined any relief I might have felt at the news. Do you believe him? Buck may bend the rules and twist the truth, but he wouldn't outright lie. Not about Council of Elders business. So. 
It's a bunch of vigilantes seeking justice because I turned their wives into sex kittens? That'd be my guess. The news anchor's expression grew serious. Up next, why the Orange County Police Department sent a SWAT team and several uniformed officers to the Orlando Ballet for three nights and how much the debacle cost taxpayers. Oh, shit. I bolted upright, sloshing coffee on the expensive sheets. Has Aaron called? Bryson checked his phone. Not me. I scrambled out of bed and hustled to the kitchen where I'd left my phone. I had seven missed calls from Aaron and two from Samuels. This isn't good. Never is. I slid into my robe as the phone rang. Hi, Aaron. Have you seen the news? He sounded like death on a cracker. Watching it now. I'm sorry. Gavin seemed so sure about the ballet. He drew a breath. The killer hit again last night. We have seven dead synchronized swimmers at the aquatic center. I sank to the edge of the bed. Oh, Aaron, I'm so sorry. It's not your fault. Can you come to the station? Chief wants you in on the debriefings. We have to catch this guy. Of course. I'll be there in half an hour. I set the phone down when he disconnected. On the television, a reporter stood outside the aquatic center. Coroner's vans and ambulances marred the otherwise beautiful building. Bryson moved to my side. This isn't your fault. We went with the obvious choice, and people died. I pulled away. Aaron sounds awful. I bet he hasn't slept in days. He stood and pulled on a pair of PJ pants. I'll make sure he gets some rest at some point today. Thanks. I stared at the TV, stunned by the images scrolling across the screen. Get a shower. I'll make some breakfast. I should look in on May and Dottie. Already done. I'd never get used to living with a morning person. Bryson had accomplished more while I slept than I would before dinner. How'd they take it? They're worried about you. So what else is new? I showered and dressed in record time. Armed with a thermos of coffee and Bryson's laptop, I kissed him goodbye and headed out. I arrived at the station and went straight to the conference room. A handful of uniformed officers nodded their greetings, but no one spoke. Tension hung thick in the air, ratcheting up my nervous energy. I spread my research notes before me and pretended to read. The chief entered the room, followed by Aaron and Samuels. The men wore stone faces and wrinkled clothes as they took their seats. Aaron nodded in my direction, then turned his attention to the chief. Miss Lamar, thank you for joining us. I understand it was your tip that caused my SWAT team to be deployed five miles from the actual murders. The older man stared until I squirmed. Yes, Chief, it was my mistake. Good catch on the tie-in between the murders. I would have assumed the ballet would be the next target, too, but let this be a lesson. We don't assume. We can't afford to miss this guy again. I nodded and focused on my notes. Despite his gruffness, I liked the guy. As far as bosses went, he treated his employees fairly and didn't mock my psychic abilities. Then again, I'd proven myself the real deal in several investigations. Chief stood and wrote on the whiteboard. What we know is the shooter is a pro, or good enough to be a pro. He's familiar with the buildings and the schedules of the Vicks. His M.O. is inconsistent, and he's following the lyrics of the 12 Days of Christmas. I glanced at Aaron. Why hadn't he told them what the spirits had said to me? Sir, if I may, one of the shooter's names is Terrence Pierce. He worked for the CVB for years before he took a job in Vegas. Lamar Terrence Pierce has an airtight alibi for the McNamara and Aquatic Center murders. There are two perps. Partridge Black and Callan's killer had dark hair. Aaron sighed. We arrested Michael Adams in the Partridge case. My mouth fell open. 
I wasn't ready to believe Michael killed his husband. Why? Fingernail scrapings from the day of the murder included the Vic's skin. He also had defensive wounds on his chest. They were newlyweds. Skin under fingernails happens when people have sex, as do claw marks. I regretted the words as soon as they flew out of my mouth. Several of the uniformed officers snickered. Chief cleared his throat. <clears throat> we need to focus, people. What's the next lyric? Samuels gave me a look that told me to zip it up. Ain't made some milking? Chief nodded. Who has the performer and vendor lists from the CVB? Samuels handed each of us a copy of the documents. Any thoughts on the next target? Chief flipped through the report. The sounds of pages turning filled the room. I focused my magic and mentally called to Gavin Partridge. He knew the people involved better than anyone. Gavin appeared in the chair next to mine with his ankle on his knee and arms folded. I have nothing to say to you. I didn't dare speak out loud to a ghost in a room full of exhausted police officers. Instead, I risked making an idiot of myself by asking questions to the group in hopes Gavin would answer. Since there are no acts called milkmaids, are there any dairy suppliers? Pages turned and heads shook, but no one spoke, including Gavin. Aaron said, Looks like T.G. Lee is supplying fancy eight-ounce individual milks. Can someone find out what makes them fancy? Gavin rolled his eyes. They're little cartons with wide mouths to dip cookies. I said, wide mouth cartons that allow kids to dip cookies. What are you, a bloody parrot? Gavin leaned into my personal space. I have these seven swimmers waiting in the hall, not a happy group. I don't want to know how you know that. Chief eyed me. Lamar, what's going on over there? I caught myself leaning to the right far enough that if someone sneezed, I'd fall out of the chair. I sat straight, which put Gavin's ghost against my face. Nothing, sir? Samuel snickered. An officer said, could be the people milking the cows. They use machines for that. Aaron flipped the page on his report. We're using adorable old ladies dressed as Victorian maids. Gavin said. I slid into the next chair. Lamar, did someone forget their deodorant this morning? Chief glared. No, sir. Then would you mind sitting in one chair? I sighed, tired of dancing around the topic. I'm sorry. There's a ghost. Gavin Partridge is here, and he's driving me nuts. The uniformed guys lost it while Aaron and Samuels looked away. They hired elderly women to serve milk and cookies in Victorian-made costumes. The laughter stopped, and all eyes turned to me. Do these women come from a particular company? Chief narrowed his eyes. I glanced at Gavin, who turned his back to me. He's not inclined to share the information at the moment. I motioned to where the ghost pouted. He's a serious pain in the ass. I can't believe I'm doing this. Chief made the sign of the cross. Mr. Partridge, I would be grateful if you would assist us in our effort to save lives. Gavin huffed. T and T Staffin hired the women. There are 25 total. I relayed the message, and the meeting ended with assignments for everyone. Everyone, that is, except me. I trailed behind the chief, Aaron, and Samuels. Chief, I'd like permission to visit the ice rink and aquatic center. Absolutely not. We have video of the Callan murder. News crews are all over the aquatic center. You aren't to go anywhere near the media. I won't have a repeat of the last time. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Given we believe the killings are related, has the event been canceled? The chief's left eye twitched. The mayor is aware of the situation. 
He insists the event must happen. The city stands to lose its reputation and a good deal of taxpayer dollars if they cancel. Chapter 40 Two weeks had gone by without another murder or a peep from the elders. I'd seen Aaron in passing at the station. A nervous tension hung in the air that had nothing to do with Christmas being only ten days away. With so many active homicide investigations, he hadn't had time to visit. Bryson spent most of his time in his studio working on a sculpture while I caught up on my paperwork or puttered around the house. Maddie barked at the door like the devil himself stood on the porch. I peeked out the window and frowned. Three cars were parked on the side lawn, but no one had come to the door. Bryson had taken May and Dottie to the Christmas tree farm and wouldn't be home for a couple of hours at best. I checked the locks and tiptoed into my room for Charlie's shotgun. If the elders had something else planned today, I wanted to be ready. The house phone rang, and I nearly dropped the gun. Hello? Tessa? This is Tanya Jones. I had the girls here with me. Can we come in? Her voice sounded strained. Miss Jones, the medicine shop is closed. The elders banished me and forbade us from helping anyone. I squinted at the shadows moving on the other side of the windows. Maddie went into full guard dog mode, barking her deepest, scariest bark. The hair between her shoulders raised, as she dropped her head to the crack at the bottom of the door and growled. Are you on my porch? Maddie's reaction scared me. Tessa, please, open the door. We have Betty Matthews, and she's not doing well. Give me a minute. I tugged Maddie into Bryson's bedroom. She whined and scratched, but her barking had stopped by the time I opened the front door. We're real sorry about this. Tanya stepped inside, followed by two women holding Betty between them. The fifth carried several purses and a blanket. I took a step back, not believing my eyes. Mrs. Matthew sported two black eyes and a bloody lip. Her hair had thinned and grayed in a matter of days. The creases on her face belonged to a woman May's age. My God, what happened to her? I led them into my room and helped situate Betty on the bed. Tanya wrung her hands. I found her this morning when she didn't answer her phone. Where's Mr. Matthews? On a deer hunt with our husbands. They'll be gone several days. I had a sneaking suspicion Mr. Matthews had lied about his quarry. Betty's pulse beat weak beneath my fingertips, and she labored to breathe. We should call an ambulance. Their grim faces told me I'd missed something. You need to see her back. Two of the ladies eased Betty to her side. Bloody straps ran from her shoulders to her waist, causing her blouse to stick to the wounds. I leaned closer and froze. Wolf attack. I set my hands a few inches above her and whispered a healing chant. Her body pulsed with pain, but something else pushed against my spell. My voice grew louder as the tainted magic fought me at every turn. Whoever had injured Betty Matthews had attacked her on a spiritual level as well as a physical one. I turned to the women. Has she said anything? No, Tanya said. Did anyone hear or see anything strange last night, like chanting or... People outside your houses. Tanya shrugged. My dogs were raising cane. Two of the others nodded in agreement. Does anyone know you're here? My pulse sped. I had a sinking feeling what happened to Betty was a message from John Macon. No, Tanya answered. I surveyed their worried faces. These women had reputations for gossiping, but with their queen bee hurt, I hoped they'd keep quiet. You can't tell anyone she's here, not even your husbands. 
If the person who did this finds out, he might come for her again. Do you understand? The women went wide-eyed and nodded. I'll do my best to heal her, but y'all should go. Tanya ushered the women to the door. Can you save her? Not until I know what caused this. I needed Bryson or Charlie or someone who knew where to start. Miss Tanya, is anyone expecting you at home? No. Betty and I had plans. She covered her mouth as tears fell to her cheeks. Would you mind staying? I might need some help. Yes, of course. Tell me what to do. Before we get started, I'm going to have you park your car in the old garage out back. She nodded. I don't know what I'm going to find. It could be dangerous. Are you sure? I expected her to ask questions or change her mind. Anything. Just help, Betty. Go move your car. I moved to the shelves and pulled down jars containing cleansing herbs. When the front door closed, I crawled under the desk and retrieved Charlie's spell book from its hiding place. As I flipped through the pages, it occurred to me I had this woman's life in my hands. I needed to call 911, but remembered Aaron's strange sickness after the conjurer had attacked him. No amount of modern medicine could heal a disease of the soul. Poor Betty had something dark feeding on her. Did Macon do this to punish me? My brain skipped like a scratched record. Why hurt Betty? Her husband was a member of the council. A flurry of emotions rose up inside me, waking the firebird. I had to do something, but couldn't decide on the first step. Bryson would know. I ran into the front room and dialed his cell. The call went straight to voicemail. I left a message and went back to Mrs. Matthews. I drew a breath and centered myself. Mother, Charlie, guide my hands and open my eyes. I lit a sage smudge stick. The earthy scent soothed my nerves and cleared away any bad spirits as I walked to the house. While in the bathroom, I pulled the shower curtain off the rod and set it beside my twin bed, along with towels, washcloths, and clean blankets from the hall closet. Tanya returned as I chanted a spell of peace and healing over Betty. The car's put away. She looked as skittish as a cat in a dog yard. And I locked the door. I smiled, trying to reassure her. Take a few breaths to calm your energy. She needs us to be at peace while we work. No matter what, believe we can help her. I'll try. I need a large bowl of water. Look in the first cabinet to the left. There's a big red bowl. Tanya hurried out of the room. I took the opportunity to coax the firebird to the surface. I'd need the extra strength to lift Miss Betty without causing her further harm. Tanya returned and set the bowl on the nightstand. I'm going to pick her up. Spread the shower curtain on the bed, then put a blanket over it. Are you sure? She's heavy. I slid one arm under Betty's neck, the other under her knees, and lifted her from the bed. Tanya blinked a couple of times, then put the plastic liner on the bed, followed by the blanket. She eyed me as I eased Betty down. How did you do that? She weighs almost twice as much as you. No questions. My voice came out firmer than I'd intended, but Bryson's warning about emulating human magic echoed through my head. We removed Betty's shoes and pants, but when we opened her blouse... Bruises dotted her chest and arms. I had to look away from the finger-shaped marks on her neck. Tanya wept as we cleaned and covered her friend. It's all right. Stay calm. Let's turn her on her side. We worked together to dampen Betty's shirt and peel the fabric away from the wounds. The bleeding had stopped, but when we moved her, the lacerations opened like fish gills and fresh blood flowed onto the blanket. I grabbed a handful of clean cloths and pressed them to the wounds as I eased the unconscious woman to her stomach. 
Come put pressure on these. I need to make a poultice to stop the bleeding. Tanya's face paled. You can't do this. She nodded and pressed her hands to the washcloths. How do you stay so calm? I have to be centered to do magic. I filled the mortar with Charlie's secret blend of cleansing herbs and added a few drops of purified water. Added enough cayenne pepper to fill three quarters of the bowl and stirred the mixture into a paste. Tanya wrinkled her nose. Is that pepper? Yes, it'll stop the bleeding. I'll stitch her up later. I pulled the first cloth away and smoothed the poultice onto the cup. I found myself chanting a spell I'd never used. The words came from someplace outside and filtered through me. The firebird moved with the cadence of the incantation, adding her magic to the mix. Once I had done all I could for her physically, I cleared away the mess and dimmed the lights. She needs rest. Tanya shifted her weight and looked from Betty to me. Will she be all right? I don't know. I gave her a hug and walked her out. Thank you for your assistance. I'll call you if there's any change. Please make sure the others don't mention this to anyone. I will. Tanya crossed the yard without a backward glance. I returned to my patient. Betty's heart beat stronger, and her breathing had evened out, yet something kept her unconscious. I remembered Dottie's story. She'd said she slept for days. I hurried to the desk and flipped through Charlie's book, hoping he'd documented the spells he used to heal and keep Dottie from turning into a wolf. I found notes regarding the care of shifter bites and scratches. However, I couldn't locate the spell I'd chanted anywhere. A noise in the hall scared the daylights out of me. I looked up and sighed. Bryson stood in the doorway, staring at the woman in my bed. Furrowed his brow and stepped into the room. What's going on? Didn't you get my message? I felt like I'd run a marathon in high heels carrying 50-pound weights. No. He moved to the bed. I can feel the dark magic on her. Tanya Jones and the others showed up this morning with her. Someone attacked her last night and left her for dead. They brought her here? Yes, because it looks like a shifter attack. The reality of the situation caused me to stagger. I hadn't had time to consider the consequences if I failed. I cleaned her up and did my best to heal her physically, but she hasn't woken. I'm hesitant to do any banishing spells until she's stronger. Good call. It can wait. He glanced at Betty and sighed. Did you call her husband? No. I believe he may be in on it. I know who did this. He hung his head. Bryson, her wounds and the magic around her? It's identical to another case. He met my gaze. Dottie. I leaned against the wall for support. Yes, it happened when she was still in high school. His calm reaction frightened me more than if he'd yelled. Megan. I wanted to say more, to get him talking so I could grasp his thoughts, but I could only muster one word. Yes. Chapter 41 Bryson and I had a quiet dinner at home. I missed joining May and Dottie's table in the evenings, but May had made it crystal clear she'd let me know when she wanted to see me. I stood at the sink washing the dishes while Bryson tended to our patient. I rinsed the last of the pots, dried my hands, and smiled at a job well done. We had fallen into the kind of routine that I thought only existed in old sitcoms, We'd get up early to sit on the porch and listen to the chorus of birds as we drank our coffee. After breakfast, he'd kiss me at the door and tell me he loved me. We'd spend our evenings in conversation or tender silence. I didn't know if it would last, but I prayed every night it would. 
Rasen called from across the hall. Tessa, come quickly. I hurried to him. Dark magic slammed into me the moment I entered my room. I staggered back, drew a calming breath, and imagined my magic surrounding me in white light. When I entered the room for the second time, I ignored the urge to leave and rushed to Betty and Bryson. Her eyes had rolled back and she'd clawed her throat bloody in her struggle to breathe. Something's blocking her airway. Bryson lifted her head and shoulders off the bed. It's nothing physical. It's the center of the spell. When I try and remove it, she chokes. I loosened my hold on the firebird and used her strength to pull Betty's hands from her throat. Hold her with one hand and give me the other. Brasson pinned her to the pillow, then placed his free hand over mine. I made a claw shape around her throat with our hands. We'd run out of time and had to do the banishing spell. I prayed she was strong enough to fight. I met his eyes, nodded, and chanted the first recitation of the spell. What, Raven? Draw near so you may hear my cries. Come from your resting place on high. Oh, what, Raven? We beg of you. Come now and take this intruder to the dark lands and bury it deep. Seal the grave and forever keep it from returning. Your people beseech you. Come. Brasson joined me as I repeated the spell. As we blended our voices and our magic, Betty struggled to draw air into her lungs. Her blue-tinged lips gaped, but her eyes rolled back into place and locked on mine. I didn't dare turn away. Betty needed me, and I wouldn't fail her. We started the spell for the third time, and she stilled. Her airway opened enough to allow a wheezing breath to pass. However, I knew better than to loosen my hold on her arms. As the incantation came to a close, her eyes drifted shut, and her breaths evened. Do you know what brought that on? I stepped back and wiped my hands on my jeans. No idea. I had such hopes for another quiet evening. Someone would need to sit with her in case another magic bomb exploded inside Betty. I pulled myself together and held my hand over her throat. Be ready. Bryson moved closer. I pulsed my magic into her neck, expecting the dark energy to push back as it had before. When nothing happened, I repeated the process. I think it's gone. He held his hands an inch over Betty and worked his way from her brow to her feet until he'd covered every inch. I don't sense anything. Dark magic in the house gave me the willies. We didn't know what spells John had placed on her or what he was capable of. Selfishly, I wanted her awake and well so she could leave, though I knew she'd be here through at least one full moon. Should we wake her? Not yet. I'd like to speak to Buck first. Brasson drew me against his chest. Will you be okay here, alone with her for a few hours? Of course. I looked away. The idea of him going to Geneva alone turned my knees to rubber. Will John be there? Will Buck listen to what Bryson has to say? Will Buck order us to return this poor woman to her husband? What if Bryson refuses? Will they hurt him? He took my chin between his thumb and forefinger, lifting until I met his gaze. There's nothing to worry about. Why do people always say there's nothing to worry about when I could fill a page with my concerns? It's been so good between us. I'll be back soon. I promise. He pressed his lips to mine. Promises mean something, I whispered as I curled up on the sofa. Bryson sat and laced his boots. It'll be okay, Tessa. I put on a brave face but couldn't shake the feeling that something would happen to him. I'll have my phone on me. Call if anything comes up. He kissed my cheek and turned to the door with a stoic expression. If John Macon or any of his people come on this property, shoot them. I laughed despite my mood. Will do. I love you.
He winked and walked outside. I hit the remote and settled in to watch a girly holiday movie. I must have dozed off because the next thing I knew, Gavin was leaning over me, grinning like an idiot. Wakey, wakey, eggs and bakey. Please go away. I pulled the quilt over my head. But I brought company. He exaggerated the last word, a la Oprah. I sat up and met the eyes of two elderly women dressed as Victorian maids with bullet holes in their foreheads. The contrast between their sweet grandmotherly faces and the gore proved to be my last straw. Oh, honey, it's okay. Your friend with the blue eyes saved six of them. These two happened to be getting fitted for their costumes when Terrence found them. Gavin tried to hug me, but his arm passed through. I turned to the ghosts. I'm so sorry this happened to you. They glanced at each other and back to me, confused. Gavin leaned closer and whispered, They don't know what's happened, poor dears. I grabbed a tissue and blew my nose. That happened sometimes when they first cross over. I remember. He stared off, then looked back to me and smiled. Nine ladies dancing has to be the ballet. I've given them the information. Now, we have to let the police do their jobs. Gavin furrowed his brow and turned his head toward the hall. What is that smell? You can smell? He marched through the wall into my bedroom. I hurried after him and opened the door. Betty still lay in the same position we'd left her. I doubted she'd moved at all. I don't smell anything. Gavin sniffed the air close to the bed and covered his nose and mouth. Honey, it smells like something is rotten. Are you sure she's alive? I moved to Betty and checked her pulse. Her heart's beating and she's breathing. He blanched and made gagging sounds. Honestly, I'm surprised you're so rude. Michael spoke so highly of you. I've discovered my inner asshole since being murdered. Sue me. He lowered his hand for half a second and put it back over his face. Tessa, I'm serious. Something's wrong here. I held my hand over Betty's head and reached out with my magic. As I moved down her body, I didn't sense any magic. To be sure, I chanted another banishing spell. What is it? Gavin backed toward the door. I don't know. We're getting close to the full moon. Maybe she's going to turn. I lit another sage stick and left the room. You mean, like a werewolf? Yes. You're kidding. Gavin leaned in my face. What's wrong with your eyes? You've got to stop getting so close. I turned away. Though I'd grown used to his appearance, I didn't need to see it up close and personal. Your pupils are on fire. He shook his head, as if trying to find a better explanation. And your hair. I hurried to the bathroom mirror. Sure enough, the tips of my hair had turned to flames, along with my eyes. This only happened when I lost control and was on the verge of shifting. I took a few calming breaths and looked again. Still flaming. Okay, hell girl, you have some explaining to do. Gavin stood behind me with his hands on his hips. Are you a demon? This is hell, isn't it? I should have known by the cheap furniture and pictures of ducks on the walls. I'm not a demon. I'm a nunahi. A Nuna what? Nuna he, I sighed. A type of fairy. Is that why you can see me? Yes. No, I don't know. Maybe. Other Nuna he can't see you. Others? He grinned. The big guy, Bryson? What about the blue-eyed cop? He looked a little fairy to me. Let's leave the guys out of the conversation. I closed my eyes and counted to ten. I could chant Gavin away, but I needed him to distract me from worrying about Bryson. The firebird could sense her mate, so he was alive. B-12. 
Beyond that, I had no idea what Bryson had done or what Macon might have done to him. Nine ladies dancing. I have several dance acts booked, but none with a cast that large. He'd switched the subject so fast it took me a second to catch up. I'll call Aaron when the sun comes up. I don't want to wake him. He's not sleeping. He's working the murder scene of Mrs. Potts and Nanny McVie in there. Then he's busy. I'll call him in the morning. Gavin rolled his eyes. The sun's coming up as we speak, my dear. I need to try to sleep. Would you mind taking the maids and leaving? Gavin waved his hand and the spirits of the elderly women vanished. They're creepy. The way they stand there and stare. Pot calling the kettle black. I moved to the couch, but Gavin appeared where I'd planned to sit. You might not want to put your head near anything flammable. He put his fingertip on my hair. Is it hot? I assume so. He raised his head at an unnatural angle. Put some paper against it. Gavin, do I have to cast you out again? I rolled my neck from side to side to relieve the tension. Do this one thing and I'll go. Performing parlor tricks for an annoying ghost ranked up there with tetanus shots. I stomped to the kitchen and pulled a sheet of paper from the notepad. When I held it to my hair, the paper smoldered and turned black. I tossed it in the sink and doused the flame before glaring at him. Done, now go. That's simply the most amazing thing I've ever seen. Gavin moved closer. How did you turn it off? My skin warmed as the firebird rose. One or both of us wanted to throttle him. What? The flame's out. He ran his ghost hand through my head. I waved my arms in an attempt to get him to back off. All right, enough already. I said go. Get out of my house. Tessa Marie, is that any way to talk to your mother? My mom stood in the doorway with her hand on her hip. Any hope of sleep vanished with the smacking of Darlene's gum. Gavin's company didn't seem that bad after all. Hi, Mama. Sorry, I wasn't talking to you. She pulled her oversized sunglasses down her nose and looked around. Uh Uh-huh. Gavin grinned. Oh, this is your mother. Interesting. I was talking to the spirits, but they're gone now. I forced a smile and motioned to the kitchen. I couldn't get away with drinking this early, but carbs would help take the edge off. I'm going to cook breakfast. Are you hungry? Are you sure they're gone? You and I have things to discuss. Darlene eyed me, glanced around the room again, and strutted into the kitchen. What's going on with your hair? I'm not going anywhere. I love mama drama. Gavin perched on the kitchen table. My hair? I lifted the ends, hoping they hadn't reignited. What's wrong with it? She stomped to me and lifted my curls. From outside, it looked like it was on fire. I laughed too loud. (laughs) Oh, I just had them put a gloss on it to make it shiny. Do you like it? Looks trashy. She wrinkled her nose. Pancakes? Gavin barked out a laugh. Trashy. Has she looked in the mirror lately? I put a pan on the stove to heat as I mixed the batter. I'm sorry I lost my temper at Thanksgiving. Darlene waved her hand. Forget about it. That's not why I'm here. I need you to come with me to my doctor's appointments. I glanced over my shoulder. Stone can't take you? She smoothed her shirt over her belly. Well... One look at her, and I knew she'd lied. Unless Darlene carried quintuplets, her pregnancy had passed the first trimester. How could she saddle a decent man with a child that didn't belong to him?
How could she think she could pull off lying to the entire family? This baby didn't stand a chance at normal life. Mama, how far along are you? Gavin laughed. This is better than the soaps. Chapter 42 Darlene's smile wilted. I don't know, but Stone can't find out. I flipped the pancake onto a plate and set it in front of her. I take it he's not the father. She narrowed her eyes. It takes more than a few beers and a dry hump to make a father Tessa Marie. Gavin, sitting on the table, superimposed over my mother's breakfast, shook his head. I think it was more than a dry hump. My appetite didn't stand a chance against this conversation. I turned the stove off and leaned against the counter. How are you going to explain giving birth weeks early? I don't know. I'll come up with something. She shoveled a large bite into her mouth. But for now, I need you to go with me to my appointments. I can't have them talking about due dates and weeks along in front of him. Mama, Stone seems like a good guy. I think he cares for you. Why not tell him the truth? She burst into tears as if she'd rehearsed the scene. <laughs> I can't tell him. What if he leaves me? I can't raise another child alone. You have no idea dear how hard it is to be a mother i ask one thing from you and this is what i get one thing tessa is that too much to expect my mouth hung open i'd witnessed her theatrics my entire life but this performance topped them all i'm not lying for you she wiped her nose on the back of her hand please tessa I really love this one. He's going to make a fine father. I'm sorry, but I won't do it. Gavin made a tisking sound. Tough crowd. She's your mother, and she's obviously hormonal. She's not my mother. I pointed at Gavin. You have no idea what you're talking about. Leave me alone, or I'll banish you. Darlene went wide-eyed and scrambled out of her chair. You've lost your mind, I sighed. Mama, please, you wait till May hears about this. She tucked her purse onto her shoulder. Mama, you just wait. You and your trashy hair are going to wish you'd, you'd. Darlene slammed the door hard enough to rattle the pictures on the walls. I hung my head, already wishing I'd never been born. How much worse could it get? Family can't pick them, can't shoot them. The only choice is to love them. Anywho, I should be going. Gavin sauntered into the living room. Don't forget to call Officer Blue Eyes. Wait, do you know that Michael was arrested? Yes. His shoulders fell. I sit with him sometimes. He's innocent, right? I'd seen the killing. But I had to ask. Michael had dark hair, and the vision was distorted. At this point, anything was possible. Yes. He looked me in the eye. Until Terrence is caught, jail is the safest place for Michael. I hated that I agreed with his assessment. My muscles groaned when I stood. If I didn't get some sleep soon, I'd join Gavin on the other side. I should check on Betty. Bye, Tessa. It's been an enlightening experience. Downright explosive. He chuckled and winked out of view. Since Gavin had pointed out the odor in the room, sitting with Betty gave me the willies. I opened the curtains and cracked the windows in the bedroom to allow fresh air to drift through the space. As a bonus, the breeze helped calm the chaos in my mind. I took Charlie's book from the desk and scoured it page by painstaking page, searching for a spell that could help Betty. A handful showed promise, 
but I decided to wait for Bryson to return before attempting them. We may not have said the words, but we were stronger together. Three hard knocks on the front door woke me from my daze. The part of my brain that lived under a rain cloud feared the police had come to tell me something had happened to Bryson. I peeked out the window and sighed in relief. Aaron stood on the porch with his hands in his pockets. My hands still trembled as I opened the door. Hey, what a surprise. Come in. He looked like last month's leftovers and smelled almost as bad. Dark circles shadowed his eyes. Sorry to show up without calling. I closed the door behind him and forced a smile. You're always welcome here. Are you hungry? Can I get you something to drink? He glanced around the room. Is Bryson here? No, he's dealing with some travel business. I went into the kitchen. Tea? Beer or water? Water, please. He sat at the kitchen table. <sighs> we can't get ahead in this case. We're running three steps behind at every turn. I handed him the bottle and turned back to the fridge for something to feed him. Gavin Partridge filled me in earlier. He said you saved six women. That's something. Aaron looked as if he didn't know whether to laugh or cry. Did he say anything about the nine ladies dancing? I emptied a container of frozen stew into a pan and joined Aaron at the table. He's convinced it's the ballet. They're the only dance act with nine women. We have men on them around the clock. He downed the water in one pull. Have you seen the news today? I shook my head. Someone put the pieces together. The media is calling this guy the Christmas killer. That complicates things, but it may help you convince potential victims there's a real threat. I took his hand to lend what support I could. Have you considered that there are more than two perps? It sure looks that way. I hopped up to stir the stew. My need to take care of Aaron gave me my second wind. Go take a shower while this heats up. The clothes you loaned Bryson and I are on the dresser in the master bedroom. He eased from the chair and wandered down the hall. Two minutes later, he called from the back of the house. Hey, Tessa, where's the shower curtain? Chapter 43 After MacGyvering a shower curtain out of a sheet and hair clips, I returned to the kitchen. The stew hung on by a thumbnail. Another minute, and I would have had to throw it out. We needed some bread with the meal. Lucky for me, May always froze her extra biscuit dough. I put a handful on a cookie sheet and sliced some apples. Aaron returned to the kitchen in low-slung sweats and a t-shirt. Who's the woman in your bed? I dropped the serving spoon, sending brown gravy across the wood floor. It's a long story. I have time. He knelt down with me to clean the mess. She's a member of the tribe, here for healing. I avoided his eyes. He had his cop face on, and I couldn't risk him calling it into the station. Aaron turned me to face him. She looks like she ran into a fist. My eyes drifted to his mouth. The desire to kiss him took me by surprise almost as much as the firebird's reaction to his proximity. She stretched and preened the way she did when Brasson touched me. What is that? Hmm? I tilted my head. You feel it? He nodded. It feels like you're running your hand through me. It's my spirit animal calling to your magic. He stood. This is a lot to take in. I took his hand and came to my feet. We should eat while it's still warm. He stared as I filled our bowls and pulled the biscuits from the oven. Why do I get the feeling there's a lot you're not telling me? It could be your suspicious cop nature. I grinned and took my seat. I needed to sort this out before I tried to explain things to Aaron. He sank into his chair and pushed the food around with his spoon. 
I thought we agreed. No more secrets. When's the last time you slept? I wasted no time in digging in. Besides the fact I hadn't eaten in forever, food would help stave off my other urges. I napped in the squad car last night. He shrugged. Eat. You're giving me a complex. You cooked this? He quirked a brow. I'll have you know I'm an exceptional cook. But no, May cooked it and froze the leftovers. Once he took the first bite, he inhaled the remainder of the bowl and three biscuits. I enjoyed watching him eat, knowing in some small way I'd taken care of him. The feeling surprised me on many levels. I'd never considered myself the domestic type. What happened to the woman in your room? Aaron pushed his empty bowl aside. She was attacked by a shifter, a wolf from the looks of it. She's under a spell or curse, and I haven't been able to break it. Sounds familiar. I stood and cleared the dishes. I hope Bryson gets some answers. He's been gone a long time. I wouldn't worry about him. He can take care of himself. Aaron stood to help me tidy the kitchen. Sit. I have this. I frowned when he filled the sink with soapy water. It goes faster with two people. He's been gone over 24 hours without checking in. I'm worried. Don't you have a connection or something? Can you tell if he's all right? I know he's alive. I could find him if I shifted into the Firebird. He's sort of a homing beacon for her. I put the leftover stew in a container. Aaron grabbed my arm. When I left the scene tonight, I planned to go home. I don't remember driving, but I ended up here. That happens to me sometimes. Life on autopilot. I smiled, trying my best to normalize the situation. I didn't want to have this conversation without Bryson present. Stop dancing around the question. This is what Bryson meant when he said we were mates, isn't it? I nodded. Will you show me? Show you what? The firebird. I was too stunned to get a look at her. You. It is you, right? I considered the question. I'd always thought of the spirit animal as a separate entity. She's a part of me, but separate. Sometimes it feels like I have two brains running the show, especially when I shift. That's why you need to learn to control it. He leaned closer. Yes, I turned my face to his. I understand. Since I woke up in the hospital, I've wanted to touch you, but I know I shouldn't. Those nights with you and Bryson were the first time I felt whole in months. He nuzzled my cheek. I want to see her. It occurred to me that none of us knew what parts of Bryson Aaron had gained. Did it work like a brick? A chip off a brick was still a brick. Or were there pieces, unique parts like a finger or sense of humor? Did Aaron inherit Bryson's magic? His ability to shift? We should wait. I don't know what will happen. What do you think will happen? He ran his hands up and down my arms. For one thing, you could change into a hawk. <laughs> You're shitting me, Aaron laughed. That'd be awesome. Yeah, well, the front door opened and Bryson stepped in. I ran to him, burying my head in his chest. The scent of wood smoke burned my nose, but I held him tight. He slid his arms around me and rested his cheek on my head. What happened? I was worried, I murmured. He kissed the top of my head. Buck's on our side. Thank goodness. Aaron stepped into the room and hesitated. Bryson grinned. Did I interrupt something? Aaron and I looked at each other and back to Bryson, who chuckled. <laughs> Relax. We haven't had time to get into it, but I'm cool with the two of you exploring without me. I would never get used to this. My guilty conscience... Years in Sunday school and fear of abandonment 
would never allow me to survive in a polyamorous relationship. Aaron asked me to shift for him. I'm concerned the firebird might cause something to happen. Bryson held back more laughter. Such as? I shrugged. I don't know. What if he shifts? Bryson ran his hand over his chin. It's possible. Magic is magic. You have it or you don't. There are no percentages or half-breeds. Oh, I needed some time to mull that little tidbit over. Questions came to mind, but they'd wait until we could speak freely. Tell me what happened with Buck, Bryson said. I need a shower first. Take him out back and shift. I'll keep an ear out for screaming. Aaron grinned. Good luck, man. She used the shower curtain as a mattress liner. I forgot about that. I could hose off out back. It might come in handy if you get worked up. We hung a sheet. It's not too bad, unless the spray hits it directly. I shook my head. They would be the death of me, or at least the death of what sanity I had left. All right, let's go but I've refused to take responsibility if something goes wrong. You kids have fun. Bryson walked toward the hall. Aaron took my hand and half dragged me out the back door. I chewed the inside of my lip. Showing him the firebird would involve me getting naked, something I hadn't thought through. Given the sexual tension between us in the kitchen, I second-guessed my decision to do this. Turn around. No, I want to see the process. Aaron folded his arms. Do you morph with crunching bones and goo like in the movies? I shook my head. You saw it the other day. Like I said, it was fast. I motioned for him to turn. He threw his hands up and put his back to me. Happy? Yes. I stripped down to nothing and focused on the firebird. Easy to do considering she'd waited just below the surface since he arrived. Okay. Aaron turned around and drew a breath. My God. I met his eyes. You've seen me before. I was in your bed for three days. Asleep under a sheet. My cheeks heated, but I didn't look away. My magic rose, and I threw my head back. As the firebird burst free, she stretched her wings at her sides and soared into the night sky. Aaron watched with an awestruck expression. She changed course and dove toward him, recognizing her mate. The firebird cried out for him to join her as she circled overhead. I felt her confusion and then her understanding when he didn't follow. For the first time, she shrank back and gave me control without a fight. I glided earthward and landed a few feet from Aaron. He knelt and held his hand out to me as if I were a scared animal. My laughter came out in a series of chirps. He stretched to touch me, and I shrank away. My feather still blazed. You won't burn me, he whispered. I dipped my head allowing him to scratch my head. His fingers traced the length of my wing. His expression softened. At that moment, I believed I was beautiful. I opened my eyes as Aaron's fingertips moved over my collarbone and to the back of my neck. He ran his hand through my flaming hair and smiled. How'd you know I wouldn't burn you? I didn't. Chapter 44 Aaron's phone rang and ruined the moment, or perhaps it saved us. The call had turned him from relaxed to chewing railroad ties in a matter of seconds. I dressed and went inside to give him some privacy. Aaron came inside as I put away the last of the dishes. Terrence Pierce has skipped town. Are you sure? I'd hoped with him out of the city the threat lessened, but I knew it was wishful thinking. Flat records show he boarded a plane to Vegas this afternoon. 
I closed the cabinet and turned. Good riddance. You still believe he's one of the shooters? Yes, absolutely. You told me once that the newly dead don't always get the details right. That he'd paid attention made me smile. That's true. But Ms. Mercier knew Terrence for years. She recognized him before he pulled the trigger. We sent your sketch to the Vegas PD. We didn't have any luck with our facial recognition software on the video footage from the ice rink. The mayor called in a favor, and the feds are running the sketch and some prints through their systems. We'll find these two. I hope so. Bryson joined us in the kitchen. His wet hair hung down the center of his back, soaking his T-shirt. He nodded to Aaron. You ready to get your feet wet in tribal politics? Tribal bullshit's more like it. I sighed and took a seat. Aaron grinned. Hit me. It can't be worse than police politics. The council split down the middle, Buck on one side and Macon on the other. Bryson said. I sat back and searched his face. What do you mean they split? The vote to bind you by force was down the middle. What does that mean? Aaron crossed his arms. They think Tessa is too powerful. They want to bind her magic until she is better equipped to handle it. He squeezed my hand. I was able to convince Buck and several others to vote no. It surprised me that he'd convinced Buck of anything. Did you tell them about Betty? I told Buck in private. He agreed to keep it between us for the time being. We don't want her husband to demand we hand her over before we know who did this. Are Betty and Tessa safe here? Aaron leaned against the cabinet and put his hand on my shoulder. Bryson looked between us and smiled. I'll put Charlie's wards back in place. I lowered them when the tribe started coming to the medicine shop. That will keep most of the elders out. Macon may be able to attack from a distance. Aaron sighed. This is all beyond me. I turned to him. No, it isn't. The firebird responds to you like she does with Brasson. As long as one of you are with me, we can beat him. Bryson interrupted. We're getting ahead of ourselves. Macon may leave you alone until after the next vote. When is that? Aaron massaged my shoulder. December 23rd. My hope swirled the bowl. That's less than a week from now. How are we going to prove Macon attacked Betty by then? Bryson smiled. Buck gave me an old spell, and I happened to get a fistful of John Macon's hair. We have to wait until morning, but we'll know if it was him. Aaron chuckled. Other than the spells, it sounds a lot like police station politics. Unlike the men, I saw nothing humorous in Bryson fighting. That slimy old man agreed to fight you? No. He came at me as a wolf. Aaron scratched his head. How does a hawk fight a wolf? Who says I shifted? He gave my thigh a playful slap. I shook my head, still not finding this funny. Besides her physical injuries, Betty has aged well beyond her years. Why would old man Matthews allow Macon to hurt his wife? Bryson's expression hardened. They blamed you. They said the spell you worked backfired. I rested my head on the table. I'd wondered if I caused the changes when I first laid eyes on her. Bryson said, Tessa, your spell didn't hurt those women. Tanya Jones was at the tribal house. She's tainted with the same dark magic I felt on Betty. They're using this as a way to discredit you and punish their wives. That's awful. I can't imagine someone I love purposely hurting me. I remembered my last two run-ins with Darlene and sighed. Maybe I wasn't any better. Aaron sat beside me. It's an entirely different situation between you and Darlene. How in the hell did you know what I was thinking? They laughed and pulled me from my chair. 
Aaron grinned like he knew the punchline, but didn't share. I looked between them, and for once didn't feel like they'd ganged up on me. When we weren't trying, a relationship eased into a yoga pants and t-shirt kind of comfortable. Bryson wrapped his arm around my shoulder. We know how you think. I poked his side. Keep telling yourselves that. Aaron rubbed the back of his neck. I should get going. It's late. Stay. Holding my breath, I glanced between them. The word hung in the air like a smoke ring. I'm good with that, Bryson said. I could stay. I'm off tomorrow unless they call me in. He shrugged. Good. We're decorating the Christmas tree before May has a fit. Everything is running late this year. I smiled, knowing that adding Aaron to the mix meant we could finish in half the time. Aaron asked, Has she forgiven you for Thanksgiving? Not exactly. Bryson shook me playfully and spoke with his lips against my temple. Babe, you need to mend fences with Darlene. She stopped by this morning. The fences are in the wood chipper. With everything hanging over my head, I had my choice of issues to worry over. I glanced between the men and bit my lower lip. Are we ready for bed? They both eyed me, but Bryson broke the silence. We should talk about this first. Make sure we're on the same page. Tessa, I'm certain you have questions. Between Bryson's arm around my shoulder and Aaron holding my hand, I'd settled into the idea of the three of us. Any discussion on the matter now would feel like grease in the tracks and threaten to derail us. What exactly did you mean when you said Aaron and I should explore? I don't have a problem with the two of you getting physical. He nodded to Aaron. He and I talked about this while you were out after the accident. We're good with sharing, if you are. In whatever way you're comfortable. Aaron watched my reaction, as if questioning a suspect. Does that mean you each get alone time, or will it always be together? I turned to Bryson. We've been sharing a bed. Will that continue? As long as you're comfortable with it, yes. He nodded. I don't have a problem with you staying with Aaron or him staying here with us when he isn't working like a madman. The question I wanted to ask worried me. No matter how I worded it, it sounded prejudiced in my head. No, that's not the problem. I doubted either would be offended, but... I wasn't sure how I would feel about their answer. Aaron ran his fingers over the back of my hand and wrist. What's bothering you? What about you two? I motioned between them as if it would clarify my question. Aaron shrugged. I'm open to either or both of you. I prefer women, but I'm not opposed to threesomes now and experimenting more later. Bryson met my gaze. We'll take things slow, talk about what worked and what didn't, and put our relationships first. I can do that. I smiled, though doubt hovered on the edge of my conscience. Bryson leaned in and gave me a hell of a kiss. He pulled back and watched me through half-lidded eyes. I turned to Aaron, who wore the same hazy expression. Agreed. Aaron brushed his lips across mine twice before teasing my lips apart with his tongue as Bryson slid his hand down my side. I wanted this, wanted them, both of them. We'd slide down the long, oily road to hell in vinyl suits together. Chapter 45 I'd slept off and on, sandwiched between Bryson and Aaron. Every so often, Bryson or I had slipped out to check on Betty. Despite the less-than-peaceful night, I'd woken in the morning feeling energized. Bryson stretched his arms over his head and rolled to face me. 
His drowsy smile and messy hair added an innocent quality to his face. Good morning. Hi. I nuzzled against him as Aaron tossed his arm over my hip. Heaven. I'd tripped and fallen into heaven. I closed my eyes and hovered in the space between waking and sleeping. Bryson whispered, We should do the identification spell and try to wake Betty. I frowned. I don't want to get up yet. We have a busy day. He kissed my forehead and got out of bed. I rolled over and watched Aaron sleep. Why Mother Nature had given a man such thick, dark lashes astounded me. At rest, the angles of his face lessened and his lips softened. I wondered what we looked like to the rest of the world when we were together. Would anyone notice me, the short redhead, between two beautiful men? I eased out of bed and threw on a pair of sweats and a hoodie to stave off the morning chill. The aroma of fresh coffee made me love Bryson a little more as I wandered into the kitchen. I poured myself a cup and went into the little bedroom. Bryson turned and gave me a wink while mixing the ingredients for the spell. Are you ready? As I'll ever be. I moved to Betty and drew a cleansing breath, then another. The candles in the room flared to life as Bryson approached. I'll work the spell. You keep an eye on her. He coated his finger with the mixture and drew a plus sign on Betty's forehead. I put the back of my hand to my nose and set the coffee aside. Whatever he'd put in the poultice smelled like rotten vegetables. He pulled the blankets to her waist and drew a symbol on her belly before setting the mortar aside. Bryson opened an envelope and sprinkled a few hairs over her heart. Bone for bone, blood for blood. Someone has given and she has received. Is his name John Macon? He held his hands over her heart and repeated the words. The wolf hair moved down her body to the symbol on her belly. Brazen frowned and repeated the words a third time, but the hair didn't move. It's not him. It has to be. Maybe the poultice is spoiled? Is it supposed to smell like that? I stared at Betty's serene face and shook my head. What if I go to her house? I can try to read the mirrors. Bryson wiped the mess from her forehead. No, you can't go near Matthews. We could call her spirit forward. I couldn't let whoever did this get away with it. I'd never considered someone else could have attacked Betty. The thought made my stomach clench. Do it again. Tessa, I felt the magic. The spell worked. I grabbed his hand. The vote's in a couple of days. You've changed your mind about giving up your magic. The hopeful lift in his voice broke my heart. I don't know, but I don't want it to happen by force. I won't give them the satisfaction. He nodded, but avoided my eyes as he covered Betty and put away the supplies. I couldn't stand there and do nothing. We had to expose John Makem and make him pay. We need to get Dottie to testify to the council. She's terrified of Makem. Do you think she can handle facing him and the elders? Not since Charlie died. I frowned and glanced around the room. If he were here, she'd do it. Don't. I frowned and looked away. In the weeks following Charlie's death, I'd considered reaching out to his spirit often. The only reason I hadn't done it before now was I knew if he wanted to talk to me, he would come. Bryson stared as if he had more to say on the topic of summoning my grandfather's ghost. I'm not calling Charlie when we can wake her and ask her who hurt her. I turned my attention to Betty and frowned. Bryson squeezed my shoulder. What's wrong? Shouldn't she have peed by now? She's been here two days. I assumed you were taking care of her hygiene. He slid his finger along the inside of her cheek. She's not dehydrated. Would she be? Yes, given her injuries. 
What sort of spells did you cast over her? Anything having to do with preserving life or making her rest? He checked her pulse again. I don't know. The words came to me and I said them. The need to step away from Betty overwhelmed me, but this time it had nothing to do with dark magic. Did I hurt her? No. If anything, you may have saved her. What do you mean? Someone packed her full of spells to kill her and possibly hurt you. By putting her in stasis, you may have cut off the energy supply to the magic. But she woke up choking. That kind of magic is meant to lie dormant until it's time to do damage. Like a bomb, I smirked. I need to look at the wounds on her back. He tucked her arms against her chest and log rolled her to her side. I covered my mouth and took a step back. The lacerations on her back had healed into ugly red welts in a matter of days. If her body's in limbo, how'd she heal? Your magic? He traced a large red scar with his finger. You're stronger than you think, Tessa. I doubt that. That he believed I could pull off that level of healing gave me hope. However, he'd think differently if he'd see me nearly fall apart when the women brought her here. Tonight's the full moon. If the attack turned her, will she shift while in stasis? The pride in his eyes told me he believed what he'd said about me. Depends on the spell. I think we should wake her and allow what is going to happen to happen. I'd rather her shift with us to help her than alone next month. Since I didn't know if the spell I'd used to heal her had put her under, or if dark magic caused her stasis, I wasn't sure how to go about waking her. Bryson had paid me a compliment not a minute earlier, a compliment I couldn't live up to. I swallowed my pride and sighed. I don't know how to wake her. Amusement lit his eyes. You must have some idea. I moved to her side and focused on the energy surrounding her. My energy. Would I sense her wolf if she has one? Bryson nodded, studying my movements as if he'd issue a grade when I finished. I closed my eyes and drew a breath. Along with air, I imagined myself inhaling my magic into my lungs. Exhaling, I refocused the energy and envisioned it as a net cast out to find any hint of animal in her blood. The third time I exhaled, I whispered, Wake. Betty's eyes moved below her lids before they opened. She turned her head in my direction and wrinkled her brow. The aging effects of John's dark magic melted away, leaving her as nature intended, beautiful. How do you feel, Mrs. Matthews? I pressed my fingers to the inside of her wrist. Her pulse was strong and quickening. What am I doing here? She pushed herself up a few inches before sinking back. What happened? Bryson stepped forward. You were attacked in your home. Tanya and your friends brought you here. She shrank from him and tugged the blanket to her chin. Attacked? Bryson, would you give us a minute? I rested my hand on her arm. He nodded and left the room. You've been here two days. I did my best to heal you. I sat on the edge of the bed. Do you remember what happened? No. Why'd they bring me? Her words died on her tongue. She closed her eyes and pressed her lips into a thin line. Am I going to turn? I looked away to give myself a second to choose my words. How can I tell her she'll grow fur in a tail once a month? Betty made a sound in the back of her throat and stilled. Her face relaxed as she drew a deep breath. She exhaled in laughter, ear-piercing, hysterical laughter. Try to stay calm. Bryson is here. We'll get you through it. I took her hand. She continued to laugh until tears leaked from the corners of her eyes. Hallelujah! Ma'am? I pulled my magic to the surface, preparing to knock her out if necessary. 
Does my husband know? She sat upright. No, I I didn't know who did this to you. I wanted to be sure you were safe. I'll be safe when I have a wolf. No one will hurt me again. My mental health training kicked in, though I didn't need a graduate degree to guess that she'd suffered from domestic abuse. The small amount of time I'd spent with her husband was enough. Did Mr. Matthews attack you? That'd be my guess, but I honestly don't remember anything after John. She'd said more than she'd intended. Her eyes widened and the color drained from her face. The last thing I remember is being with my lover. My heart stopped. John Macon? You can't tell anyone. Please, it'll ruin me. She glanced around the room. Where are my clothes? I'll get you something to wear. I went to my dresser and pulled out a pair of hand-me-down pants and an oversized shirt. These should fit. Do you have a phone? I need to call Tanya. I debated the wisdom of her speaking to her friend, but I couldn't keep her locked up here. I handed her my phone. You may still be in danger. Please ask Tanya to keep quiet about this. Of course. She lifted her chin. I'll give you some privacy. I went into the living room and paced, considering my options. John Macon and Betty? What if she called him? She'd put all of us in danger. He couldn't be in love with her, not with the nasty spells he'd cast. Did she know what he'd done to her? Something prickled the back of my neck, filling me with dread. Dark magic? A spirit? Rosin? He came through the front door. What happened? Is Betty all right? She's getting dressed. Do you feel dark magic? Healing her, waking her, all of it came too easy. Experience told me not to trust it. Anyone powerful enough to cast the spells that plagued Betty wouldn't go down without a fight. A fight to the death if he found out I knew his secrets. Gavin? Gavin Partridge? Can you hear me? What's wrong? Bryson furrowed his brow. I don't sense anything. You're not going to believe this, but the ghost smelled the dark magic. I closed my eyes and focused. Gavin Partridge, I beg of you, come to me. Gavin appeared in the room. For crying out loud, first you can't wait to get rid of me, and now you pull me out of a poker game. What do you want, hell girl? I'm sorry, it's important. Do you smell anything? He looked at Bryson, down him, and back up again. Other than a fine piece of man candy. Bryson strode across the room to my side. I turned to Gavin, pleading. Does it still smell like rot in here? He lifted his nose and sniffed. No. Oh, thank God. I sank to the sofa. He says it's clear. Bryson put his hands on my shoulders. Does she remember who attacked her? No, but she told me something worse. I relayed the details of my conversation with Betty while Gavin listened. Wait a minute. That sweet old woman is sleeping with an evil, magical wolfman? Gavin's already bulging eyes threatened to burst out of their sockets. Chapter 46 Tanya came and took Betty away. Despite our protests, Neither woman would tell us where they planned to go. The news that Betty would likely change into a wolf under the full moon hadn't rattled Tanya. If anything, it seemed to calm her. I stripped the bed and threw the linens into a garbage bag. The room needed physical and spiritual disinfecting. We shouldn't have let her walk out of here. Bryson waved a sage smudge stick over the bed. Holding her against her will is against the law. Besides. They've probably been through the change with their sons. Considering we had a police officer sleeping in the next room, he had a point. Gavin, are you sure it's clear? He nodded. Like I said five minutes ago, I don't smell anything rotten, but I really want to smell him. 
a smirk, in no mood for the ghost's shenanigans. He smells wonderful, like cedar, sandalwood, and myrrh. What are you saying? Bryson folded his arms. You're such a brat. Gavin superimposed himself on Bryson's arm. Bratessa? Bratessa? Bryson grinned. You heard him? I'd lost the taunt the ghost game in one turn. Bryson chuckled. <laughs> I did. You wouldn't laugh if you could see what he's doing to you right now. Gavin's eyes went wide, and he stopped dirty dancing on my man. Oh, my, my, my. Who do we have here? Aaron shambled in, scratching the side of his head. Is there coffee? Gavin blew through Aaron, only to return two seconds later. You hussy, this house has two bedrooms. You had Granny Rip Van Winkle in here and no blankets on the couch. You slept with both of them? I ignored the question. There's coffee in the kitchen. Aaron looked between Bryson and me. What did I miss? Where's the woman? We woke her and she bolted. I shot Bryson a dirty look. She wanted to go despite the risks. Bryson grinned. Thanks to Gavin Partridge, Tessa has a new nickname, Bratessa. Aaron laughed. Nice. I can't decide which one is sexier. The big one has a certain brute strength. Me, Tarzan, you Jane thing going on. But the cop has that boy next door, Roger, until you die vibe. No wonder you picked both. I'm not sleeping with them. I'm sleeping beside them. What kind of woman do you think I am? I glanced between Aaron and Bryson's stunned faces and cringed. You should hear the things he's saying. Bryson headed for the door. I'm going to Walmart to pick up a few things for May. Aaron cleared his throat. Uh, give me a minute and I'll go with you. I need a toothbrush. There are extras in the bathroom cabinet. I'd stuck my foot in it this time. He shrugged. I need a couple of other things, too. After the guys left, I sat at the kitchen table picking at a toaster waffle and beating myself up for my big mouth. They couldn't wait to leave after the incident. Even Gavin had abandoned me. If I had to wager, I'd bet he followed them to Walmart. I stood and unceremoniously dumped my waffle down the disposal. Movement in the front yard caught my eye. A brown rabbit hopped through May's mums, enjoying the brisk morning. A memory of another bunny crossed my mind. Charlie had given me the black and white beauty when I turned seven. I'd named it Mary Lou. Living in the country, we didn't have many neighbors. The rabbit was my best friend. When Darlene came to take me to live with another stepfather, she refused to bring Mary Lou along. Six months later, when I returned to live with May, Mary Lou was sick. Despite several trips to the vet, her health hadn't improved. Charlie took her into his workshop one afternoon, and she'd made a miraculous recovery. I'd overheard him talking to Dottie later that night, but hadn't understood what he meant when he said, I know I shouldn't have done it, but there's only so much heartache a little girl can bear. I wiped my eyes, wondering how much a grown woman could bear. Where are you, Charlie? Bryson came through the front door with a bag in his hand. He took one look at me and stopped. What's wrong? I smiled and shook my head. Smiling with ugly cryface never convinced the other person you weren't upset. Old memories. This time of year is hard. He took a step toward me and hesitated. If I hug you, will it make it worse? I laughed despite myself. He did know how my mind worked. <laughs> Probably. I'm going to change into shorts. If you need to talk, I'm here. I'm all right. I shooed him away. I lost myself in the memories of Christmas's past, 
The decorations and presents came and went, but on this land, family remained constant. Even Darlene came every Christmas, regardless of whose arm she hung on. She'd come in the morning and stay until well past dark. Brasson returned wearing an old pair of shorts and a paint-stained shirt. I'm going to wrestle the tree in do May's living room. Are you coming? I'll be there in a bit. Don't be too long. He gave me a quick peck on the lips and headed for the door. I watched him walk up the path through the window. You love him. Gavin stood beside me at the sink. I do. Then why do you let people get under your skin about it? Not all people. You have a special gift for making me lose it. Thanks, but I don't believe that's true. He smiled. I apologize for this morning. Thank you. He followed me as I went through the house and tidied up what didn't need tidying. Are you embarrassed at the idea of loving two men? I'm not embarrassed, and it's not an idea. I'm in love with them, both of them. As if to prove my point, I pulled Aaron's clothes out of the dryer and hung them in the closet. Then what's the problem? I turned to him and sighed. Of all the people in my life, Gavin was the one person who couldn't blab my secrets. People will judge us. Who cares what people think? If you're happy and they're happy, go for it. I care, and it's not that simple. We go to church every Sunday. Aaron and I work at a place that isn't tolerant of anything other than poker straight. It's no one's business what you do behind closed doors. I punched the throw pillow a few times and tossed it on the couch. I said the same thing, but people make it their business. Only if you let them. I plopped into the easy chair. Gavin, exactly how do these relationships work without someone getting hurt? There aren't any rules. Each arrangement is different. You have to decide what works for you and be honest with them. This can't be about you going along with something because you don't want to hurt their feelings. That's what scares me. I don't know what works. How do I know what to do or not do if there are no rules? What if they decide they want each other and don't need me messing things up? He laughed and made a padding motion on my shoulder. There's always a risk, even when there are only two people. You have to trust your partners and have faith it will work out. I'm trying. The clock chimed ten times. I was expected at May's. Tell me about the man you were with the day you died. Gavin sighed. You know about Terrence and me? Yes, I have for a while. He had plans with Michael, but Michael was stuck at work. I didn't see any problem with inviting him to stay for lunch. One thing led to another. Did Michael know? He'd have blown up at the first hint of it. He and Terrence were friends. That's how Michael and I met. He and Terry lived next door to each other. I thought the house was yours. Gavin nodded. Terry and I dated for a while, and I moved in. When he went to Vegas, I bought his house. And I thought my life was complicated. I smiled until I glanced at the clock. I need to go to my great-grandmother's. You're welcome to come if you promise not to tease too much. Thank you, but my work here is done. I'm going to sit with Michael. Is he holding up okay? I'd thought about visiting him, but didn't know if it broke protocol or if he'd want to see me. He's strong. He'll come through this. Promise me when this is over, you'll tell him about our time together. Of course. I walked the paths between the houses, thinking about what Gavin said. He was right. I had to learn to trust them and myself. Until I got out of my own way, none of us would be happy. I slipped in the kitchen door and into a house full of laughter. My men sat on the floor in May's living room like grade schoolers, 
a strand of half-lit light around each of them. They joked while doing one of the most frustrating tasks of the holidays, finding the dead bulb. I rested my shoulder against the wall, taking in the scene. Dottie and May sorted decorations. When they found a special ornament, one that held memories of time, place, or person, they stopped and shared the story with a lift in their voices that spoke of love. There she is. May navigated the mess on the floor and embraced me. I leaned down to hear her whispered words. I missed you. She patted my back. I hugged her tight. I missed you too. I'm so sorry I spoiled Thanksgiving. It's forgiven and forgotten. She grinned. Your mama came by the other day, crying and carrying on. She'll likely never change, but we don't have to stoop to her level, do we? No, ma'am. She swatted my backside. Good. Now, go in the kitchen and mix up a big batch of cookie dough. Do you remember the recipe? You're not going to help me? She shook her head. I think it's time you learned to cook. It seems to me you have a couple of men to take care of. I stamped down the instinct to protest or make excuses. I wouldn't deny my feelings for them. I guess I do. Bryson chuckled. I do most of the cooking. That's your choice. But little Miss Bretessa needs to know how. May wiggled her brows. I don't know why I didn't think of that nickname years ago. Oh, no. Not you, too. I laughed and walked into the kitchen. May had gathered the ingredients and set the mixing bowl on the counter. I knew the recipe by heart after assisting her more times than I could count. Aaron stepped behind me and rested his chin on my shoulder. Need some help? Aren't you on Christmas light duty? Bryson's working on the last strand. I grinned, thinking I'd give him my least favorite chore. Go through the pecans and make sure there aren't any shells, then chop them into small pieces. His eyes grew misty and he turned his head. That was my job every Christmas before my parents died. Oh. I raised on tiptoe and kissed his cheek. Would you rather do something else? No, it's fine. It's just funny you asked. That's the wonderful thing about Christmas. Every year you do the same things while reminiscing about doing them in years past. One Christmas, many years from now, you'll be shelling pecans and remember this conversation. Aaron dipped his chin and grinned. I thought you hated Christmas. Maybe I needed someone to remind me of the good parts. Chapter 47 A Christmas movie marathon played on the television as we put the star on May's tree. I had a dozen cookies and a gallon of chocolate milk rumbling in my stomach. The oven, still in use, warmed the house and filled it with the scent of home. Life was good. I'm ready for a nap. Aaron yawned and reached for another oatmeal cookie. We have another tree to decorate. I didn't want to move from my spot on the sofa, but I felt the hands of the clock ticking the day away. Aaron's phone rang and shattered the illusion that the world was a safe place. He frowned at his cell and walked outside. That didn't sound good, Dottie sighed. We followed the news stories about the serial killer. Is Aaron still on the case? Yes, ma'am. There's a team of people involved in the cases. I made eye contact with Bryson. He winked and turned to Dottie. Tessa and I need to speak with you. She smiled, though her forehead wrinkled. What about? Betty Matthews was at the house for a couple days. Someone hurt her pretty bad. I paused to give her and May a chance to process. Is she all right? Dottie gripped the arm of the sofa. I took her other hand. She's doing a lot better. Miss Tanya came for her earlier. Dottie, she was attacked by a wolf. 
the blood drained from her face. May narrowed her eyes as she put the pieces together. Does this have something to do with the ruckus the other night? Bryson said, yes and no. We believe Betty's attack was punishment for acting out after Tessa did the love spell. None of the husbands were happy with their wives' newfound confidence. Dottie released my hand and curled her shoulders forward. You think John Macon is behind this? Bryson glanced at me, then back. We'd agreed not to tell them Betty and John were seeing each other. Macon isn't the wolf who attacked her, but his magic was on her. He's stirring the pot with the elders. The council split over a vote to bind Tessa's magic. Him on one side, Buck on the other. That's horse shit. May pushed herself to her feet. Who do those sons of bitches think they are? I grinned at my great-grandmother. The woman rarely cursed, but when she did, she did it right. Bryson set his hands on her shoulders. May, you must stay out of this. Oh, I will. Doesn't mean I don't have a right to my opinion. Red-faced and trembling, Dottie blew her nose. I know what you're going to ask. I'll think about it. May sat beside Dottie and wrapped her arm around her daughter-in-law's shoulders. You kids go on. I'll finish cleaning the kitchen. Tessa, you did a fine job with the cookies. Thanks, Gran. I gave them each a quick peck. I'm sorry this upset you, Aunt Dottie. I understand. Bryson and I walked outside to wait for Aaron. His head down and phone to his ear, he'd paced a rut in the grass beside the garden. He's going to snap if they don't solve this case soon, I whispered to Bryson. He needs people to lean on. He has us. I took his hand, intent on telling him how much he meant to me. I'm sorry about this morning. Aaron strode to us. Tessa, is there any chance you can come with me to the ballet? Bryson's grip tightened. I pulled my hand from his and rubbed my knuckles. Can you stay here in case Betty comes back? He ignored my question. What's happening at the ballet? We've stationed men everywhere, but the director and some of the dancers aren't happy. Chief asked if Tessa could come help Smooth Feathers. He grinned. <laughs> smooth Feathers. I shook my head. I can try if you promise not to make bird jokes. I don't like it. Bryson folded his arms. I'll keep her safe. Bryson nodded and turned to me. You call me if anything feels off. Under different circumstances, I would have complained about his overprotectiveness. Today, it made me feel cherished. I will. He tilted his head. That was too easy. What are you planning? Nothing. Honestly, can't I appreciate the fact that you two care about me? Uh-huh. Aaron rubbed his chin. Like I said, I'll keep an eye on her. We didn't have time to debate my imaginary ulterior motives. I turned and walked toward the house. The guys followed me through the front door. I don't know what we expected, but we exhaled at the same time. Nothing jumped out, exploded, or came at us wielding magic. Do you have a suit here? These people are high cotton, Aaron said. You've spent too much time with May. I laughed and went to my room to change. In Haley's hand-me-downs, I found a black jacket and slacks. The pants fit tight in the hips and pooled at my feet. Nothing a pair of heels won't cure. I pulled my hair into a messy bun and applied some makeup. Aaron knocked on the door. Are you ready? I have to stop by my place for clothes. Check Bryson's closet, I called to him as I applied eyeliner. Aaron yelled from the hall. You did my laundry? I reached for the mascara. Yes, dear. Almost ready? We have to go. I sighed and hung my head, seeing the downside of living with two men. Two minutes, please. Chapter 48 
Aaron hadn't exaggerated when he'd described the people at the ballet as high cotton. The man speaking to me wore shoes that cost more than my entire wardrobe before the fire. I kept my spine straight and shoulders back as I explained the situation for the third time. Mr. Blackwell, I understand your concern. It's unusual to have police officers in a practice studio. However, we are aware of a credible threat to your dancers. We fell behind with the production after the last time there was a credible threat. As you know, the police were wrong. A distracted dancer is at risk for injury. Do you wish to be responsible for ending someone's career? Of course not. Preventing the murder of non-dancers should take priority, but as he'd reminded me, the show must go on. Miss Lamar, you're welcome to sit in on the practice, provided you are quiet and turn off your cell phone. He sat back and steepled his fingers. Thank you, if you'll allow the police to guard every means of egress. Done. That was easy. I stood and smoothed my pants over my hips. He curled his lips into a snarled smile. Make sure you turn off anything that can ring, ding, vibrate, or crash. I will, thank you. Just out of curiosity, how long is practice? We have two groups, six hours each, six days per week. Longer today due to the delays in our schedule. This time he smiled. Since you're getting a late start, you'll be joining the second group in progress in Studio A. Be here tomorrow morning at seven. Tell the receptionist you need a pass to Studio D on the second floor. I'm surprised the organizers are moving forward with the event, given everything that's happened. We don't believe the media hype and refuse to allow these unfortunate incidents to tarnish Orlando's reputation. He guided me down the hall to where Aaron and the other detectives waited. Enjoy practice, Miss Lamar. Aaron turned as Mr. Blackwell walked back toward his office. Well? He agreed to allow me to sit in on the practice sessions. You can station officers at the exits. Aaron and Samuels exchanged a look. What did I miss? Aaron pulled me aside and whispered, If the shooter follows the same pattern, the attempt will happen tomorrow. We have people in position monitoring the building inside and out. I nodded, not liking where this would end. You're using the dancers as bait? He shook his head. No one will get into that studio, but this is our best chance of catching him. Or them? Yes, or them. We have some ideas of the next three targets, but nothing as clear as this. I understand. I wanted him to hug me and tell me everything would be all right. But we stood in a lobby crowded with our co-workers. Come here. He put his hand on the small of my back and led me to a side exit. We stood in the shadowed alcove, staring at each other for three heartbeats, before Aaron pushed me against the wall and pressed his lips to mine. He poured his frustration into the kiss, overwhelming me. I wrapped my arms around him to anchor myself. Aaron slid his hand beneath my shirt and massaged my breast. Months of frustration from telling ourselves the other was off limits melted in the space between us. I opened my eyes to flashing lights and shouts. Son of a bitch! Aaron shielded me from the cameras as he pushed me inside the building. I tucked my shirt in and tried to smooth my hair. Nothing I could say would change what would happen if the press shared pictures of us making out while here on official police business. They couldn't have caught our faces, he whispered. Chief's warning replayed in my head. I should get to the practice studio. I'm already late. He sighed. I'll be close, and there'll be officers nearby. If you see anything, flag someone down. Got it. I'm sorry. I knew the media was outside. I should have been more careful. I couldn't talk about it. Not yet. I'd lost one job because the press named me as a psychic. 
I knew how these things ended. Badly. I pushed my worry to the back of my mind and tried to focus on the case. Won't they scare off the shooter? Or he'll use them as cover to enter the building. He tucked a loose curl behind my ear. Be careful. You too. I turned on my heel to go. I love you. Several people at the end of the hall looked in our direction. Tears stung in my eyes, but I wouldn't let them see me crumble. I squared my shoulders and walked through the lobby, ignoring the whispers and stares. When I reached the studio door, I took a moment to clear my head. I wouldn't do anyone any good in my current state of mind. After counting backward from twenty and drawing in several cleansing breaths, I slipped inside. To my relief, no one bothered to look in my direction. I tiptoed across the entryway to keep my heels from clacking and sat in the world's most uncomfortable chair. The orange plastic reminded me of the stackable chairs in the high school cafeteria. As they practiced, I envied the dancers' long, lean bodies as they glided and leaped. While most of the women were my height, their legs seemed twice as long as mine. I imagined their costumes and the set design for the performance, white feathers and tulle. My phone rang, ruining not only my daydream, but the dancer's concentration. I fumbled in my purse until I found the damn thing. Sorry. The practice had come to a halt and all eyes focused on me. One or two women shook their heads, while others bent at the waist and used the interruption to catch their breaths. The choreographer ignored me altogether. He clapped his hands three times, and the dancers returned to their positions. Another cell phone rang causing me to jump out of my chair. They glared before I could defend myself. It's not mine. I'd never have a Christmas carol ringtone. I couldn't imagine who would have that particular song on their phone, all things considered. Oh, crap. Run! Everyone out! I tripped over my purse as I ran for the door. Pain shot from my knee to my groin as the 12 days of Christmas rang out. Several dancers bottlenecked at the exit, while others stood in place. The explosion slammed into me like a freight train of fire and shrapnel. The pressure sucked the air from my lungs. Fragments of the room and its contents moved with me as I careened backward. Flames surrounded me as objects tore through my body. And then it stopped. People wailed. Others shouted, and still others rattled their last breaths. I'd lost all sense of my position in relation to the room. Fires burned, but the space around me only had slivers of light. Something rested on top of me, but I couldn't feel its weight. I attempted to wiggle or feel my toes, my legs, hips, fingertips. If I could move, I'd survived the explosion. I'd died once before. While dead, I couldn't move or speak, but remained aware of my surroundings. Despite my efforts, I couldn't feel or move anything. I resigned myself to the reality of the situation. I'm dead. At least it happened too fast for my brain to process pain. The rational part of me knew the firebird and I would rise, but the emotional part was one stroke away from hysteria. Chapter 49 The moaning of survivors had stopped. I dared not think about what that meant. The first responders would arrive soon. I need to get out of here. A second bomb went off in another part of the building, causing more pieces of rubble to fall around me. The first time I'd risen, the firebird had done the work. I took the bullet, and she did the rest. This time, she remained tucked away in her imaginary cage. I focused on my magic and pictured it as part of me. I envisioned it pumping through my veins, strengthening my muscles, firing between the synapses in my brain. The firebird bowed her head as if accepting my invitation. Once I'd shifted into my spirit animal, peace washed over me, which shouldn't have been possible in my situation. I drew back enough energy to extinguish my feathers and took stock of my surroundings. 
The space I'd occupied before shifting left room to move in my animal form. I found an opening large enough to squeeze through and alighted on top of a pile of rubble. The interior room had no windows or direct path to the outside world. I flew through the hole in the ceiling to the second floor. The first responders wouldn't risk coming upstairs in a structurally compromised building except to rescue survivors. Even then, it would take longer to reach this space. I'd hoped to find an easy way out, but had no such luck. The room had no windows, and debris had fallen in front of the door. An air duct hung exposed near the ceiling. I could fit inside, provided the explosion hadn't crushed the ventilation shafts between here and the roof. I eased into the duct and stomped in a circle to test its strength before going further. It wobbled from lack of support, but stabilized once I moved further inside. With limited knowledge of the building, making decisions at splits in the ducts was little more than a crapshoot. After hitting a couple of dead ends and wandering in circles, I learned to scratch the walls each time I reached a turn. Acrid smoke from an electrical fire forced me to backtrack from what I believed was the eastern edge of the building. Each time I doubted my ability to escape or feared the dark path ahead, I drew magic from the firework. Her determination pushed me forward. I moved into a wider duct and came upon blast damage. I'd either walked in a circle, or this was the site of the second explosion. I wiggled through the crack in the shaft and into the attic. My pulse sped. I'd found a way out. The building had several dormers on the front facade. The glass had shattered from a few of the panes. I pecked the remaining glass free and stepped out onto a ledge. Sirens and flashing lights filled the streets below as I launched into the night sky. Rison's magic called to me, while another force drew me to the first floor. I circled back to search for Aaron, but didn't dare fly into the building. Perched in a nearby tree, I watched as people ran in and out of the doors. My connection to Aaron dimmed until I couldn't sense his presence. Oh, God. No. I reached out again, but couldn't sense him. A void formed inside me. At that moment, I would have gladly handed over control to the Firebird, but she'd become a part of me. I turned my face toward home and followed the pull of my remaining mate. When I reached my family's property, I screeched and circled the house. On the second pass, Bryson stood in the front yard with his eyes on the sky. I landed at his feet and shifted to human form. He pulled me into a bone-crushing embrace before I could speak. I clung to him, refusing to release him, fearing I'd imagined the reunion. Dottie shouted somewhere behind me. Ryson, is it her? Is she okay? He met my eyes. Are you all right? I nodded, not trusting my voice. Ryson needed to hear about Aaron, but I couldn't form the words. Where's Aaron? I lowered my eyes and shook my head. Bryson took a step back, as if to catch his balance. Without a word, he scooped me into his arms and carried me toward the house. May and Dottie met us on the porch, their frightened expressions softening when they saw me. I'm okay. I touched his face as he walked through the front door. I'm not. He glanced at the ladies. We need a minute. Bryson took me to his room and set me on the bed. He dropped to his knees, searching my eyes. I felt you die. I was in the studio when it happened. The time before the explosion seemed like years before. A haze of shock and self-protection prevented the memories from overwhelming me. Bryson wrapped his arms around my waist and rested his head in my lap. His shoulders shook with silent sobs. I leaned over him, running my fingers through his hair until he stilled. We should go speak to May and Dottie, he whispered. Aaron's. The hollow inside me widened as I said his name. Are you sure? Where was he when the bomb went off? I don't know. 
My throat constricted and stars shot across my peripheral vision. The trembling started in my fingers and traveled through my entire body. I'm going to be sick. Bryson eased my head between my knees. Easy, babe. Breathe. Nice and slow. I searched my memory for the last thing Aaron said to me. Had he told me where he'd be? I hadn't been in the studio long before it happened. How long? Could he have left the building? Would he have left me there? I couldn't remember. We need to get you dressed. He pulled away. I stayed in the same position until Bryson returned. My body had numbed to the point I couldn't lift my arms, but my mind refused to still. Bits and pieces of memories came back to me, things I'd rather had stayed buried in my subconscious forever. I didn't say it back. Bryson helped me to stand and tugged a pair of sweats over my hips. Say what, sweetheart? I was angry about the cameras and embarrassed that people heard him. He told me he loved me. I didn't say it back. Bryson took me by the shoulders. Listen to me. Unless we hear otherwise, Aaron's alive and well, working. I felt drawn to him, but it stopped. I couldn't feel him. I was outside the building, and his energy vanished. He's gone. Rassen's face fell as my words sunk in. You're in shock. A lot going on. He could have closed you out, focused on work, and shut down. I couldn't think or feel anything. The initial adrenaline rush that had fueled my escape faded until the effort to remain upright became too much. I need to sleep. May and Dottie are worried. I can't talk to them. Not tonight. You don't have to talk, but you should be with your family. He took my hand and led me into the living room. Dottie and May stood and embraced me. Their warmth melted the icy fear that had formed around my heart. I regretted leaving the solitude of the bedroom as the numbness gave way to heartache once again. I'll call Aaron, Bryson said. The lady sat me on the couch and covered me with my favorite quilt. Did you see what happened? May brushed my hair from my face. Yes, but I can't. Of course. She motioned to the television. I leaned forward as a live shot from the blast site filled the screen. No, leave it on. We sat in silence as the reporters repeated the same nonsense about the Christmas killer, unknown fatalities, and outrage that the mayor refused to cancel the event. Images of first responders, the damaged building, and a growing crowd of spectators replayed in random order. Bryson's phone rang, and I grabbed it before he had the chance. A cacophony of noise came through the line. Bryson, can you hear me? Aaron shouted over the noise. Tessa, she's gone. We found pieces of her purse. I sobbed into the phone. Aaron, it's me. I'm all right. Aaron, can you hear me? Dottie took May's hand and Bryson leaned his head back and wiped his eyes. Despite their brave faces, they'd thought the worst too. Aaron? His shout left my ear ringing, but I didn't care. Are you okay? Where are you? He yelled. I'm at home. How? Never mind. I'm on the way. Chapter 50 The mood improved after Aaron's call, but exhaustion had seeped into my bones. The last time I'd died and risen, I'd slept for days. I didn't have that luxury now. I curled against Bryson and drifted in and out of sleep. Bryson, May and Dottie watched television and waited for Aaron to arrive. Blinking lights drew my attention to the corner of the room. When did you put up the tree? Bryson grinned. After you and Aaron left today. Since you're living here now, I thought it'd be a nice surprise to have a tree here too. It's pretty, but you forgot the star. It's on the table. I saved it for you. May patted my hand. 
You've put the star on top every year since you were four. I knew I should thank her, or at least smile and nod. But no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't speak past the lump in my throat. Headlights flashed through the front windows. We were all on our feet before the car door closed. I hit the porch and leaped down the stairs with Bryson right behind me. Dust covered Aaron from head to toe. He had cuts on his face and blood stains on his clothes. I stopped short, unsure of his injuries. He stumbled as he closed the distance and embraced me. I thought I'd lost you. He wept into my hair. I thought you, I thought the same about you. He pulled me back and looked me over, then motioned to Bryson. Get in here. Bryson joined us in a massive hug that left us all laughing through tears. I stepped back from the guys and sent up a silent thank you and a prayer for those who couldn't embrace their loved ones tonight. With Bryson on one side and Aaron on the other, we walked to the ladies. Aaron received hugs and promises of home-cooked meals. Even Maddie joined the party with wet dog kisses for everyone. May wiped her eyes. It's past my bedtime. Come on, Maddie. Mine too. Dottie gave me one last hug. Take care of each other. Always. Bryson led the way back to the house. I need a shower. Aaron frowned at himself. We all do. The dust on my face from hugging him had mixed with tears and formed a crusty residue. I'd take that as an invitation if the bathroom was bigger and had a shower curtain. Aaron chuckled. I bought a new one today. Bryson went teary-eyed and hugged him again. You go first, Aaron. I curled into my favorite corner of the couch. Are you okay? They asked. I'm bushed. A blonde news anchor with collagen-injected lips and too much makeup smirked into the camera. The video they chose to show included Aaron and I making out in the background. This is footage from moments before the explosion. As you can see, news crews and bystanders surrounded the building when the explosions happened. We have confirmed injuries and one fatality outside. Aaron dipped his chin and muttered a few choice curse words. I shook my head. Whatever faith I had in the news media vanished. Of all the footage they could have played, that's what they picked? Bryson glanced from the television to me. We've survived worse. I grabbed the remote and stabbed the power button. When? At the station. He patted my leg. Cheer up. They only caught the two of you this time. Aaron sighed. I ran my hands through my hair resisting the urge to yank it from my scalp. How can Bryson be so lackadaisical about this? It's not funny. I could lose my job and Aaron could face disciplinary charges. I turned to Aaron for backup, and the words died on my tongue. He stared, as if trying to determine how to get rid of a body. Bryson didn't notice the change in Aaron's expression. You can't see either of your faces. Stop borrowing. I didn't see you leave the studio. Aaron continued to stare with haunted eyes. Where did you go? The bathroom? You don't have a scratch on you. It took me a moment to shift gears and understand his questions. I'd expected them earlier. When he hadn't asked, I assumed he'd let it go. Aaron, I... The mood in the room went from bad to worse. The blood drained from my face as it hit me, Aaron had no idea what the Firebird could do. He knew the basics, but we'd avoided telling him the details. Bryson clamped his hand on Aaron's shoulder. Go get cleaned up, then we'll talk. This has something to do with magic. He looked between us, then shook his head. Of course it does. When I'm finished, we will talk about it. All of it. I'll tell you everything. I forced a smile hating that I'd end up lying either outright or by omission. I waited until the water ran in the bathroom before turning to Bryson. The shock is wearing off, and he's angry. He sat beside me and leaned forward, placing his elbows on his knees. I know. 
I want to tell him everything. We can't, Tessa. He deserves the truth. I'm tired of lying. I pulled my knees to my chest to make myself as small as I felt. I've had enough of all of it. Bryson lowered his voice to a whisper. How do you think he'll handle knowing we age differently than he does? Or that we are the last of our kind? How about not being human? Don't you think it'll come out? If he's really the missing piece to our puzzle, he needs to know. The enormity of the situation struck me. This knowledge came with risks. Aaron already knew more than he should. On the other hand, we risked losing him later if he learned we kept more secrets. Now is not the time. These things need to be discussed with clear heads. I sighed and rested my head against the back of the sofa. He needs to know before this thing between the three of us goes further. I'll tell him. Brasson turned toward me. You still intend to give up your magic? I think so, but I'm taking my time with the decision. He slid his arm around my shoulders and pulled me against himself. Tessa. Aaron walked into the room and paused. You two need a minute? Bryson shook his head. We're good. Have a seat. Bruises had formed on the left side of Aaron's face, along with a nasty abrasion on his cheekbone. His chest and arms resembled a patchwork quilt of cuts and scrapes. He crossed the room with a slight limp and eased into the chair beside me. Did you leave the studio? My concern for him gave my inner coward a possible out. Did EMS look over you before you left? Aaron tucked his hands against his sides and glared. They had their hands full. I'm fine. Tell me what happened. Let me take care of the bigger cuts and your leg. Why are you limping? I reached for his hand and frowned. His hands looked like he'd dragged them over gravel for miles. What happened to your fingers? I helped dig through what was left of the studio to find you. His voice rose as he pulled his hand away. We found pieces of your clothes and purse. I nodded, unable to speak past the lump in my throat. Let's go easy on each other. It's been a hell of a night, Bryson said. I'd like some answers. Aaron glanced between us. Bryson started to protest, but I put my hand on his thigh. I couldn't look Aaron in the eye, but I owed him an explanation. Do you remember when I was shot in the chest? Yes. The bullet pierced my heart. I died that day. It was the first time I shifted. He nodded. So you're a shifter. I knew that. I shook my head. No, we are. Tessa, Bryson shot me a weary look. He has to know. Bryson nodded. We're Nunahi. Shifters are human. Aaron stared at us with a blank expression. You're telling me you aren't human? I forced a smile. Everything works like a human, but we don't age the same, and our magic is like an extra organ. It's part of us. You age differently, like a vampire? Am I going to get old while the two of you stay young? Aaron's voice rose. Bryson shook his head. You're going to age slower with my magic, and you may have inherited some of our other abilities. Aaron, it'll be okay. I reached for him. You expect me to believe this shit when everything you've told me has been a lie? He jerked away and gritted his teeth. Exactly what happened in the studio tonight. A cell triggered the explosion. I died in the blast, but the firebird rose. I flew into an air duct, managed to get into the attic and out a window. Once outside, I came here. You couldn't have let me know you were okay. His expression hardened. It would have raised too many questions, and I couldn't sense your energy. I thought... Brasson interrupted. I called you several times. Aaron glared. You knew she survived? Not until she came home. I called to tell you there was a chance she'd shift. Yeah, 
Well, I was busy looking for pieces of her under piles of rubble. He stood and limped toward the door. I'm going home. Aaron, wait. I jumped to my feet and blocked his path. Please stay. I know it's a lot to take in, but... But? He narrowed his eyes. I need you. And I thought I loved you. But I don't know you, do I? Either of you. I only know what you two decided to share. Chapter 51 After Aaron left, I turned to Bryson. We've lost him. Give him time to cool off. He'll forgive us when he's ready. My head ached, and I struggled to stay upright. I'm worried about Betty. Did she call? I haven't heard from her. He placed his hand on the small of my back and guided me toward the bathroom. Let's get you cleaned up. Bryson helped me out of my clothes and into the shower. I closed my eyes as the water sluiced over my head. Memories of the explosion and its aftermath forced their way into my thoughts. As the events replayed, I dissected each step I took and every word I said, trying to determine if I could have done something to prevent the tragedy. When the water ran cold, I turned off the faucet and opened the curtain. Bryson sat on the toilet lid staring at his hands. Ready for bed? I forced a smile for his benefit. Don't do that. He shook his head and followed me into the bedroom. Don't pretend everything is okay. I couldn't if I tried. I walked to his dresser and dropped the towel as I slid one of his t-shirts over my head. Come here. He held his hand out. Let me put this in the bathroom. I bent to pick up the towel, and he sucked in a breath. Leave it. The towel fell from my fingertips as I turned and met his eyes. He had no tears, no shoulder-racking sobs, no outward signs of his pain. Yet he pleaded with his dark, soulful eyes for what I didn't know. I took his hand and urged him to stand. He slid his free hand under my damp hair to the back of my neck and lowered his face to mine. I closed my eyes in anticipation of a kiss, but he nuzzled my cheek and drew a shaky breath. Bryson took a step back and sat, pulling me into his lap. He lowered his lips to my neck as his arms slid around my waist. I turned my head to kiss him, but he eased back. His grip tightened as he stood and sat me on the edge of the bed. A war of emotions crossed his face when I reached for him. Bryson? He ran his hands down my arms to the hem of my t-shirt and pulled it over my head. We had been naked around each other many times, but I covered my chest. Something in his eyes made me shiver. Bryson pulled my hands away and buried his face in my breasts. The stubble on his cheeks, coupled with the softness of his lips, left me breathless. I tangled my fingers in his hair and held him in place. Everything else slipped away. He wrapped one arm around me and lifted my body to place my head on the pillows. I closed my eyes as he ran his hand from my hip to my jaw, and tipped my face toward his. He kissed me long and slow, almost reverently. You feel different. He pulled back and studied my face. I caressed his cheek. How so? The firebird is at peace. He propped himself on his elbow and kissed my forehead. I feel her here. He kissed the top of my cleavage. And here. I tilted my head and watched as he ran his tongue over my breast. Here? Bryson. I tugged his hair to get his attention. We should get some sleep. Forgive me. You're tired. He settled on his side. People died tonight. He pulled me close and whispered, Yes, and touching you is life-affirming. Let's say the words. 
He tensed in my arms. Are you sure? The timing stunk. My life spun out of control, and each day brought new danger. But I wanted this. I wanted him. With no guarantee any of us would live to see the sunrise, waiting seemed more frivolous than the risk of taking the leap. Yes. His eyes followed his hand as he caressed my face. Tessa, daughter of Achila, will you have me as your mate? I will. He brushed his lips across mine and whispered, I, Tlitwa, claim you now and forever as my mate. The flaming arrow to my bow, my heart and my life are yours. I whispered into his ear, I, Tessa, claim you, Tlitmoa, now and forever as my mate. I am the arrow to your bow. My heart and life are yours. He rested his cheek against mine and smiled. Almost done. Second thoughts? I shook my head. How do we finish it? Kiss me. I raised my head and pressed my lips to his. As our tongues entwined, my magic stirred, though not with the heat and urgency of the firebird. This came from my essence, a part of myself I knew existed but could seldom access. Bryson's magic mingled with mine in the space between our lips. He broke the kiss and whispered, Two halves are now one. I will walk with you as one spirit shared between two bodies for the remainder of my days. My voice cracked as I repeated the words. So it is said. So it is done. He grinned. We can have a wedding one day with a white dress and a cake. The family would enjoy it, but I doubt it'll be as meaningful as what we just did. Do you want to sleep? His voice held sincerity, but the twinkle in his eyes told me he wanted something else. No. Do you want to sleep with me? I bit my lip and nodded. He kissed me until my lips felt swollen and my cheeks stung. We touched and teased without fear of interruption. For the first time, I didn't worry the firebird would ruin the moment. Bryson came to his elbow and tucked me beneath his body. Our eyes locked. We hung in that moment, neither breathing nor moving a muscle. He pressed his hips forward, and I met him in the middle. As our bodies joined, we exhaled in unison. I forgot about everything except him, me, us. I closed my eyes and focused on his warmth, the spicy smell of his hair, the feel of his muscles contracting beneath my hands. I marveled at the sense of peace that flowed between us. I love you. I love you too. Brasson raised his head and stilled. Your eyes are like candle flames. I pushed his hair from his face and smiled. So are yours. Chapter 52 Tessa, I hate to interrupt. Wake up. I opened my eyes to find Gavin leaning over the side of my bed. I'd grown accustomed enough to his appearance to recognize changes. He'd bloated. His lips had stretched back to reveal teeth and bluish gums, and his hair had thinned. Not the face I'd planned to wake up to. About time. I've been trying to wake you for 15 minutes. I eased out from under Bryson's arm and glanced around for something to wear. My God, his arms are as big around as your thighs, and that's saying something. I motioned for him to turn around. Gavin rolled his eyes and spun honestly. Modesty is overrated. I pulled the t-shirt over my head and walked into the kitchen before speaking. What's going on? Why are you whispering? I debated coffee, but if I could appease Gavin, I planned to go back to bed. Why do you wake me? Oh, right. Sorry. I saw the big guy naked and 
All the blood left my brain. What's going on? Terence is back in town. He's going to kill the Ten Lords of Leaping. Gavin tugged at the cords around his neck. What aren't you telling me? Nothing. Something didn't add up. Gavin mentioned he could visit Michael in jail, but where else did he spend his time? How do you know he's back? I just know. His voice boomed through the room. Someone's about to die. Get your priorities straight, hell girl. Who's the target? I'll call Aaron. I looked around for my phone. Good luck, honey. I believe your phone blew up with my swans yesterday. Gavin's impudence hadn't changed, but the humor had left his voice. By the way, why didn't you mention you could rise from the dead? How do you know about that? Have you been spying on me? Please, don't flatter yourself. I followed Terry to watch the fireworks. I didn't need a reminder of the explosion, nor did I need a hard time from a spirit. I turned and caught him frowning at a family photo. Are you all right? He met my gaze. I feel like I'm forgetting something important about my life. Let's focus on one thing at a time. Who's the next victim? After I call Aaron, you and I can talk. Maybe I can help you remember. I went into the bedroom and returned with Bryson's phone. Dennis Lords, the basketball player? He's not directly involved with the event, but Terry's had it in for the Orlando Magic since 2009 when they beat the Cavs in the playoffs. Are you sure? Yes, I heard it with my own ears. Dennis Lords, the number 10 draft pick last year. 10 Lords a leaping. He's scheduled to hand out toys at the children's hospital at 10.30. Terry and his wise guy plan to do it there. Gavin paced the room. The clock in the hall read nine. We had an hour before the Orlando Magic star draft pick ended up on Gavin's roster. I dialed Aaron's number. Voicemail. Thinking he might not recognize the number and pick up, I called him again from the house phone. No answer. Damn it! I scrolled through Brasson's contacts and found Samuel's info. Yeah? Sleep thickened his voice. Ah, uh, it's Tessa. Don't hang up. My heart thudded against my ribcage. Dennis Lords is the next target. He's making an appearance ten this morning at the children's hospital. You're alive. How? Muffled sounds came through the line. Birds with flaming wings rise from the ashes. The minute hand ticked. He sniffled, exhaled, and sniffled again. I couldn't pull Aaron out of there last night. Then he up and disappeared. He's not answering his phone. He was here but went home. More minutes passed. Time that the police needed to get to the hospital. Samuels, Dennis Lords will be dead in less than an hour if we don't stop them. Lords is at the children's hospital giving out toys. I'm on it, he sighed. I'm glad you're okay. Thanks, we'll talk later. I disconnected and prayed the police would arrive in time. Bryson walked into the room. Let's go. You heard that? Enough of it. He motioned to the back door. Any other time I'd insisted we rush into danger, he'd refused. You never cease to surprise me. We fly, find the guy, and follow him back to wherever he's going. That's it. He set his jaw, and we stick together. Whatever you're going to do, I suggest you do it. Daylight's a wasting, Gavin said. As we hurried to the back door, my magic rose to the surface. I took one step into the yard and shifted. No flames, no struggle. One second I was human, the next I soared. Bryson laughed before he shifted and joined me. Flying with him felt natural. Now that the firebird and I shared control, I navigated and she flew. But we both kept an eye on Bryson. The medical complex consisted of three hospitals several smaller buildings and parking garages. The children's hospital sat in the center of the campus with a roundabout circling the building. 
most people accessed the hospital via the pedestrian bridges connecting the parking garages to the facilities. Bryson and I circled the building low enough to keep an eye on the glass-covered walkways. Shortly after we arrived, police cruisers moved into position and blocked traffic from entering the roundabout. People slowed at the ends of the walkways, and I assumed officers had taken up positions at the entrances to the building. A popping noise caught my attention. The people in the tunnels ran for the garages while others spilled onto the sidewalks surrounding the building. Bryson called to me, dipped his beak, and dove low. I stayed at my current altitude and kept a wider view of the area. A blonde male, dressed in light blue scrubs, broke from the flow of foot traffic and headed down a sidewalk between two buildings. I searched the crowd for others in the same color scrubs and found only one. I dipped down and trailed the blonde. The man walked as if he'd taken a break to enjoy the sunshine. He cut across a grassy area behind the main hospital and into a parking lot. I caught an updraft and flew higher in hopes of Bryson seeing me and following. I had no doubt I'd found Terrence Pierce. Terry slid into the driver's seat of a dark sedan and headed south. I followed as he navigated the crowded streets of downtown Orlando. He circled the damaged building housing the ballet and drove east into a residential section of the city. I alighted on a tree branch outside a large house and waited as he let himself inside. Sometime later, a second dark sedan pulled into the driveway. The man from the sketch looked up at me in the tree and smiled. He couldn't know I was anything more than a bird, but looking into the eyes of a killer sent chills down my spine. Chapter 53 Brasson met me on my flight back to the house. The sun had almost set when we shifted to human form. I'd never spent that many hours as my spirit animal in one stretch. I'd expected to be exhausted but I felt as if I'd had three cups of coffee after a good night's sleep. He grabbed my discarded T-shirt from the grass. Where did you go? The playfulness in his voice surprised me. I followed Pierce to a house in Orlando. You're in a good mood? I'm proud of you. Why? I slid my arms around him. You have much more control over your magic. Last night? Today? He cupped my bare bottom and bent to kiss me. Hold that thought. I need to call Aaron. I stepped away and pulled the shirt over my head. What happened at the hospital? No idea. I went inside and dialed Aaron's number. He's not answering. Give him time. Call Samuels. Bryson turned on the television and disappeared into the bedroom. The phone rang before I could make another call. It's Aaron. He returned wearing a pair of jeans. Answer it. Hello? I chewed my lip. Aaron, it's me, Tessa. I'm returning your call. Anger laced his words. I hesitated, searching for something to say that would ease the tension between us. What happened at the hospital? We aren't releasing details to the public. What little patience I had vanished. Don't be a jerk. I'm the one who called in the tip. What happened? He disconnected. I growled and pulled my arm back, preparing to launch the phone into the wall. Bryson grabbed my wrist and took it from my hand. It's the only one we have left. Write down the address, and I'll pass it along to Samuels. I paced the room while Bryson left a message for the detective. Aaron had every right to his feelings, even his anger toward me but he didn't have the right to get people killed while he brooded. He set the phone aside. You okay? Frustrated and keyed up. He moved in front of me and ran his hands up and down my arms. That's normal after spending so much time as your spirit animal. We should work off some of this energy. How would you like to do that? He looked me over as if trying to decide which part to sample first. On every flat surface in the house. 
this side of you is going to take a little getting used to. I couldn't help but smile. He'd taken my mind off everything except him in a matter of seconds. He slid his hands under the t-shirt. You should take this off. I nuzzled against his bare chest and opened the buttons on his jeans. You first. Gavin burst into the room. Oh, Tessa, thank God. I jumped back from Bryson, more than a little embarrassed. Another murder? The ghost stared at my mate while he spoke to me. No, not that I'm aware of. It's Michael. He isn't in his jail cell. I closed my eyes and counted to ten, then to twenty for good measure. He could have had an arraignment or a visitor. Everything okay? Bryson reached for my hand. I didn't think of that. Did you stop, Terry? Gavin's back. I glanced back at Bryson, then turned to the ghost. I followed Terry to the place he's staying. I gave the police the address. Bryson turned and went into the bedroom. Gavin smirked. I could have given you the address. Did you save Dennis Lords? I don't know what happened to Lords. What do you mean you knew the address? I ran through my list of spells for something to solidify a ghost long enough for me to kill him. Gavin groaned. I followed him to a house earlier. Where do you think I heard them talking about lords? I'll be back. Let me go check central receiving for a six foot seven basketball player. Information that would have been nice to have. I cursed under my breath as I walked into the bedroom. Bryson raised a brow, but before he could ask, someone knocked on the front door. Stay here. I'll get it. I plopped on the bed, debating running away with Bryson for a few weeks. May would strangle us for missing Christmas, but it'd be worth it for some uninterrupted time with him. A female voice carried from the front room, high-pitched and frantic. Betty. Bryson patted her back while she sobbed into his shoulder. You'll be safe here. I don't want to put you and Tessa out, but I don't know where else to hide. She pulled away and blew her nose. Her face looked like she'd auditioned for a zombie movie, swollen and discolored. I'll heal the worst of the damage. Bryson eased back and inspected her wounds. No, thank you. It looks worse than it is. Who did this? I stepped further into the room. The firebird stirred at the scent of blood as my frustration morphed into something darker. My husband, Jed. Her shoulders slumped. Did you see Macon? The words tumbled out of my mouth before I considered her feelings. No. I called him, but he refused to see me. I was hiding at Tanya's when Jed found me. Bryson met my eyes and shook his head a half an inch. Where's Tanya now? Betty sighed. She's waiting in the car. I'll go get her. He turned and walked out the door. How many seconds would it take him to walk from the porch to the car? Ten? Twenty? Twenty-five seconds of peace and quiet with a defined purpose, and no one staring at him with expectant eyes. I would have given my right arm to trade places with him. I turned to Betty and smiled. I put fresh sheets on the bed after you left. It's too small for both of you, but the couch folds out. Chapter 54 Bryson, Tanya, Betty, and I sat in the living room, watching the news coverage of the attempt on Dennis Lord's life. The press speculated about what would happen now that the Christmas killer's tenth victim had survived. The basketball player had refused to comment. The spokesperson for the magic said Mr. Lawrence was resting in an undisclosed location. She's lying. I leaned closer to the TV and rewound the broadcast. Watch how her eyes water and she shakes her head. It's a classic tell. Wonder what about? Bryson pulled me in front of him and massaged my shoulders. I don't know. Maybe they don't want to cause more hysteria. I glanced at the women. They hadn't looked away from the television, 
but I found it impossible to relax as his fingers pressed into my knotted muscles. He leaned forward and whispered into my ear, I need to go out for about an hour. I tried to turn, but he kept me in place. Why? It's the wrong time of year to ask questions. Christmas was a week away, and we were no closer to finding resolution with the murders, the elders, or Aaron. It doesn't feel like Christmas. It will. He kissed my cheek and scooted me out of the way so he could stand. Want me to grab some food on the way back? My stomach answered with a growl. I'll take that as a yes. He pulled on his boots and grabbed his jacket. I'm taking the cell. Do you know the number? Yes. I stood and gave him a quick kiss. Tanya smiled. Drive safe. Betty didn't seem to notice anything, including the television. I'll be back soon. He shook his head and walked out the door. He'd lied. Part of me wanted to chase him down and ask why, but it was Christmas, the season for fibs. Plus, with Brasson out of the house, I had work to do. I stood and stretched. Make yourselves at home. I have some presents to wrap in the bedroom. Thank you, Tessa. Don't worry about us. We'll be all right out here. Tanya took the remote and scrolled through the channels. I hurried into the office and gathered the sage, healing herbs, Charlie's cedar box of keepsakes, and three white candles. A large container of salt from the kitchen and lavender oil from the bathroom completed the ingredients for my ritual. I sat on the floor in the master bedroom and placed the wooden box in front of me. Someone knocked on the front door. A tendril of fear wrapped around my throat until May called my name. I threw the quilt over the mess and went into the living room. May glanced at Betty and Tanya and walked into the kitchen, wringing her hands. Have you heard from your mama, Darlene? No. Why? She called this morning and asked for a batch of peanut butter fudge. She said her and Stone would pick it up after dress rehearsal. I motioned for her to sit. Practice probably ran late, or maybe she forgot. She wouldn't forget fudge. She sank into a chair. I've called her phone several times, but it goes straight to voicemail. Sounds like her battery died. I smiled to reassure May, though I had a sinking feeling something was wrong. Do you have Stone's cell phone number? Never thought to ask for it. Did she say where they were going? I stood and went to the fridge, wondering what kind of rehearsal my tone-deaf mother attended. You're welcome to sit with me while you wait. I'm sure she'll turn up. May lowered her voice. Thank you, Tessa Marie. I can't explain it, but I have a bad feeling. Dottie's out doing last-minute shopping. I didn't want to worry her. She's been a mess with that John Macon in town. With everything else going on, I'm a little jumpy, too. But this is Darlene we're talking about. She's not one to call and say she's running late. I poured two glasses of tea and debated the wisdom of enlisting May to help me convince Dottie to speak to the elders. Stone's playing bongos, and she's shaking the maracas in some big show. Can you imagine your pregnant mama on stage shaking those things like she's charo? The air left my lungs. I'd gone over the performer and vendor lists for the Christmas extravaganza several times. A drumming act had stood out, as an odd addition to a Christmas show. International percussion explosion? May nodded. What's wrong? Graham, they're drummers at the Christmas extravaganza. The color left her cheeks. I'll call Dottie. Let's wait in case it's nothing. I held her hand. Do you have Aaron's number? I do. Call him and tell him there's an emergency. Get him here. I'm going to contact a special friend of mine who might be able to help. She looked at me wide-eyed and pulled her phone from her pocket. I walked into the bedroom so Aaron wouldn't hear me in the background and refused to come. Gavin? Gavin Partridge, I need to speak to you. 
I called him for a solid five minutes and received no response. Alarm bells went off in the back of my mind. I could use the summoning spell to bring him to me, but I needed to get back to May. Gavin, please, it's an emergency. Come if you can hear me. May knocked on the door jam. Aaron and Detective Samuels are on the way. I turned to her and stilled. The color hadn't returned to her cheeks, and her hands trembled at her sides. She might be a spitfire, but physically, she was an elderly woman with diabetes and a questionable heart. Graham, let's sit and wait for the boys. I wrapped my arm around her shoulder and guided her to the sofa. Tanya said, I didn't mean to eavesdrop. I'm sure Darlene will be okay. May nodded and grasped my hand. We sat together, listening to the clock tick. I didn't dare move from May's side for fear she'd crumble. Headlights bounced in the front windows as a car made its way down the bumpy dirt drive. The cowardly part of me hoped Brasson would return before Aaron arrived. Two car doors slammed outside. Stay here. I'll let them in. We should give them some privacy. Tanya nudged Betty, and they left the room. May dipped her chin to her chest and drew a shaky breath. I opened the door and met Aaron's icy blue eyes. Thanks for coming. Please, have a seat. He opened his mouth to speak, but stopped when he caught sight of May. He took two long-legged strides into the room and crouched beside her. Miss May, what's happened? She glanced at me and nodded. My mother and her fiancé are missing. Darlene told May she'd stop by after dress rehearsal for the Christmas extravaganza. I swallowed to loosen the lump in my throat. They're drummers. Aaron ignored me and spoke directly to May. The show was canceled after the incident at the ballet. Are you sure Darlene said rehearsal? Samuels placed his hand on my shoulder and squeezed. I glanced back and smiled through my pain. Seeing Aaron, knowing he might never forgive me, was too much to bear. May's spine straightened. Darlene said the directors told Stone the show was back on. Aaron shot Samuels a look. Did she tell you where they were rehearsing? No? All right. Let me make some calls and see what I can find out. He patted her hand and stood. Tessa, may I speak to you outside? Grandma, call Dottie and have her come home. Brasson will be back soon. I'll be right outside. I waited until I knew she had Dottie on the line and walked onto the porch. Samuels paced the lawn while relaying information to someone on the other end of the phone. Aaron stared at the roof and sucked in a breath. We sent officers to the address you provided. And? We found Michael Adams and a weapons cache. I staggered and grabbed the railing. I thought he was locked up? We had to cut him loose. His lawyer convinced the judge that the evidence we had was weak, and Gavin was likely the first victim of a serial killer. Has Michael said anything? Aaron frowned. Only that Gavin Partridge's ghost is haunting him. Samuels jogged over. Chief wants to know if we have any idea what happened to the Eleven Pipers piping. I freaking hate Christmas, Aaron and I said together. Chapter 55 Aaron and Samuels went to the station to start the process of triangulating Darlene and Stone's cell phones. In need of some privacy, I settled Betty and Tanya in at May's and returned home. Bryson's hour-long errand had stretched into two, but he'd asked me weeks ago to stop borrowing trouble. Might as well try things his way for a change. Gavin? I removed the quilt from the ingredients for my summoning spell and sat on the floor. Gavin Partridge? I had a decision to make. I'd planned to summon Charlie's spirit and ask him to help convince Dottie to testify against John Macon. 
She'd relied on him for so many years. After his death, she'd lost her confidence. The situation with Darlene threw a monkey wrench into my plans. Gavin was our best shot at finding my mother in stone. Since the day he'd shown up in my bathroom, he'd answered when I called. I couldn't understand why he refused to come now. I poured salt in a circle around Charlie's cedar box and frowned. I couldn't risk the life of an unborn child to save my butt from the elders. John Macon had put enough bad energy into the universe. Sooner or later, it would come back to him. Okay, Darlene, you owe me one. I removed the box from the circle and wrote GP in salt. If I had more time, I would have added lavender oil to a bath to purify myself. Instead, I dabbed a little on my pulse points and finished with a smidge on my forehead. The soothing scent helped calm my racing thoughts. I sprinkled the healing herbs inside the salt circle and lit the candles. My mind drifted from Gavin to Bryson to Charlie. The spell wouldn't work unless I could focus. I folded my legs and placed my hands palm up on my thighs. My attention shifted to my breathing until I inhaled and exhaled to the count of three each. Gavin Partridge, I summon your spirit into my presence. Hear my call. Feel my intention. I beseech you, come. Gavin shimmered into view. I covered my mouth to hold back my scream. Bits of skin had fallen off his neck where the strands of Christmas lights dug into his flesh. Decomposition had caused his mouth to freeze in an unnatural position and his eyes to sink into their sockets. I whispered, what's happened to you? His voice echoed through the room, though his mouth remained fixed. Help me. How? My brain flipped off. I couldn't think or move. Let me go. I release you. I smeared the salt circle to break the spell. I didn't come because you summoned me. He turned his face away. What happened to me, Tessa? I stammered, trying to decide if he referred to his death or the changes in his spirit. I didn't have all the answers for either scenario. After you had lunch and sex with Terence Pierce, a dark-haired man knocked you unconscious. He hung you by the lights. You struggled violently until you finally passed away. He stilled. It was Michael. Michael knocked you off the ladder? Yes. He glanced at me. Michael was having an affair with Terry, too. I was out of my mind with jealousy. My husband and my ex betrayed me. We were arguing while I hung the lights. I whispered, you were still in love with Terrence. I still am, even after everything he's done. He hung his head. I'm the cause of so much death. I remembered my reason for summoning him. It pained me to change the subject, but I had to save my family. You made a mistake. But you're not responsible for the murders. I've asked the victims to forgive me. It dawned on me that Gavin had drawn the spirits to himself out of guilt. He sought atonement for imaginary sins and punished himself more than anyone else would. I died in the explosion, too. You haven't asked me for forgiveness. I was there. I saw what happened to you. He shuddered. I forgive you. How can you? I'm a monster. I had one shot to get this right, so I went with brutal honesty. You're the most annoying man I've ever met, and I love you for it. You helped me accept a part of myself I didn't want to acknowledge. You made it all right for me to love two men. Why are you punishing yourself for doing the same? Your men aren't murdering people. You aren't married to someone and lying about loving another. 
You didn't hold back information to protect your lover. You didn't have sex for revenge. I drove Michael to kill me. I've ruined his life, too. Michael is responsible for Michael, and I highly doubt that Terrence hatched his plans to kill all of those people after the two of you hooked up. These killings took time and planning. You don't know me. You don't know how evil I am. He met my eyes, challenging me to argue. I knew I had him. People who had strong convictions rarely needed to prove their points. I played my trump card, praying it would be enough. I'm not human. I can see your spirit, and it's not evil. You have an incredible capacity to love. I can help you, if you'll allow it. Gavin bowed his head. Why do you want to help someone like me? I smiled as I stepped closer, mentally preparing myself for the spell. Because you're my friend and I love you. His head shot up as if I'd startled him. Thank you. I held my hand in the space beside his face and closed my eyes. The incantation came to me in a whispered voice that reminded me of Achila. While I didn't understand the meaning, I knew the intention of the spell. I sent healing energy into his spirit, much as I had sent healing into Betty's physical body. A white light surrounded Gavin and obscured my view. I repeated the words three times and whispered, So it is said, so it is done. The light dimmed, starting at the floor and ending at his head. I covered my mouth and laughed, astonished. Gavin had transformed into the person I'd seen in the photographs, a handsome man with a contagious smile. He'd lost the translucent quality of most spirits, though still not completely solid. His energy filled the room. He looked down at himself and laughed. Well, hello, handsome. Indeed. I jumped up and threw my arms around him. I can hug you. He squeezed me until I groaned. Oh, I wonder if I can hug that man of yours. We'll see about that. My grin faded. Do you know where Terry and the other man are now? Vincent Johnny. Is that the dark-haired man? Yes. You should know his business associates wear fedoras and have names like Polly and Guido. What does that mean? Gavin laughed. The mafia, baby. They have a particular interest in Vegas tourism. Once again, my brain refused to process his words. My mother and unborn sibling were at the mercy of the mafia? Could there be more people involved in this? More killers? We're talking big bucks. Vegas and Orlando are the top tourist destinations in the country. There's a lot of money to be made, be it at Disney or in the casinos. Big events like the Christmas extravaganza are a windfall for the city. My guess is that they sent as many people as necessary to finish the job. They have my mom. Are you sure? I didn't see her at the executive airport. She's part of the drumming group. I sank onto the edge of the bed and put my head between my knees. We'll find her. He sat beside me and stroked my hair. Tessa, darling, shouldn't you call that detective of yours and tell him where your mother's being held? I dared to hope Darlene and Stone were still alive and we could get to them in time. Yet, I'd worked enough homicide cases to know that the odds decreased with each passing minute. I needed one more miracle and feared it wouldn't come. Why are they holding them this time? When the police stopped them from killing lords, they decided to grab the remaining targets. I don't know if they planned to kill them there or stayed something more dramatic. I needed to be near my mom. There had to be something I could do to help save her. Do you have any relatives or close friends who live near the airport? Yes. 
my mother. I'm going to need a cell phone, clothes, and a car. Chapter 56 It took 15 minutes and one embarrassing childhood story to convince Gavin's mother that I was in contact with her son's spirit and we needed her help. She agreed to park and wait for me at a diner a half mile from the airport. I'll see you at the restaurant after I check things out. Mom drives a... A silver Honda. I got it. I mentally ran through the plan one last time. You're sure you don't mind if I cast a forgetting spell on your mother? We aren't supposed to show outsiders our abilities. The elders... Tessa, it's fine. I understand. Gavin gave me a quick hug. Be careful. I know you can do the whole Lazarus thing, but I'd rather not think about you dying again. I'm not going close enough to get shot. I dropped my robe and shifted into the firebird. I flew toward the city as fast as my wings would carry me. Mrs. Partridge would arrive first, and I didn't want her to change her mind. Believing your dead son worked to catch a serial killer while on the phone with a psychic, shape-shifting fairy was one thing. Sitting alone, in the dark, waiting for the medium to fly to you was another. A handful of cars were parked in the lot. I circled low and searched for humans. A couple made out in a car several yards from the silver Honda. I landed on a tree branch near Mrs. Partridge and chirped three times. The woman jumped and scrambled out of the car. I hated to involve another person, but we'd run out of time and options. She opened the passenger side door and twisted the bangles on her wrists. I landed near her feet. She blinked several times. You really are a bird. I shifted to human form and smiled. We stood eye to eye, her stunned, me impatient to get into the car. I didn't dare speak for fear I'd send her into cardiac arrest. Instead, I motioned to the blanket on the seat behind her. Oh, right. She fumbled with the blanket. When you called, I, well, I don't know what I thought. Thank you. I did my best to cover my important parts. May I get in? She flustered again, nearly tripping over her feet. I smiled and ducked into the car as she hurried back to the driver's seat. Forgive me. I'd almost convinced myself I'd imagined the entire conversation. It's unusual, to say the least, but I'm a spiritualist. I mean... I practice meditation, read tarot. Heck, I've been to seances, but I never thought I'd need one to talk to my son. I nodded through her rambling. She needed the time to vent. Gavin is a wonderful man. I've enjoyed getting to know him. Is he here? Gavin, is he here? She tossed her graying blonde braid over her shoulder. Not yet. I smiled and glanced in the back seat. She followed my gaze and blushed. Oh, yes, clothes. I brought you some clothes. I guess it's hard to carry a bag when you're flying. Yes, ma'am. Despite her nervous energy, I liked this woman. She had a hippie, free spirit vibe that put me at ease. Gavin will be here soon. I slid the patchwork dress over my head and tugged it down my body. It hung like a sack, but it beat sitting naked in a car with a stranger. Thanks again. I'll get this back to you. Gavin appeared in the back seat and touched his mother's arm. I love you, Mom. Mrs. Partridge turned her head and smiled. He's here. I can feel him. He is. The scene made me miss Darlene, something I hadn't done since I was a child. Please tell him I love him, she whispered. He heard you. He says he loves you, too. His hand is on your arm. Gavin cleared the emotion from his throat. <clears throat> Six hostages. They have Dennis Lords. Four guards, including Terry. I didn't see Vincent. They're in Hangar 103. May I borrow your cell phone? Mrs. Partridge handed me the phone 
and turned in her seat to where her son's spirit sat. She stared into his eyes as if she knew his exact position. I looked out the window to give them privacy and dialed Aaron. Detective Burns, it's Tessa. I have an address where they're holding Darlene and the others. I'm listening. His clipped tone gave me pause. I relayed the information and added, no sign of Vincent Johnny. Who? The man in the sketch, Vincent Johnny, Vegas Mafia. Saying the words aloud made them more real. Would you mind telling me how you know this? Gavin went in and did recon. Where are you? I'm at the diner on Crystal Lake Drive. I looked at the sky through the windshield, praying Aaron wouldn't start yelling. I needed him on my side. Damn it, Tessa. Get out of there now. I whispered, they have Darlene. Aaron sighed. I know, honey. Listen, we're going to do our best to get her out, but I need you to go home. I can't leave her. I know. He sighed. Stay out of the way. I disconnected the call. Gavin's voice drew my attention to the back seat. Now what? Now, I go to the hangar and wait. Tessa, don't. If things go wrong, you don't need to see. I'll be careful. I turned toward the driver's seat, planning to do the forgetting spell on Gavin's mother. Mrs. Partridge, I need you to take my hands for a moment. My door swung open and cold metal pressed to the side of my head. Get out of the car. Mrs. Partridge struggled to turn the motor over. Put your hands on the wheel, or I'll put her brains in your lap. Vincent Gianni yanked me out of my seat as if I weighed nothing. Shift, Jessa! Gavin screamed. Mrs. Partridge gripped the wheel and closed her eyes. Her shoulders shook until Gavin rested his hand on the back of her head. Do as he says. I'm all right. I stilled next to Gianni, praying he would take me and leave her unharmed. I could shift at the first opportunity and would rise if he shot me. Mrs. Partridge didn't have that luxury. He jerked my arm hard enough to sprain my elbow, but I refused to cry out. I struggled to match his steps as we walked to a black sedan. He pushed me against the door and ran his hands over my body, checking for weapons. I'm unarmed. It dawned on me that I'd remained calm, although panic seemed like a normal reaction in this situation. He opened the door and shoved me toward the driver's seat. You're driving. Get in. I did as he instructed, keeping my eyes forward and my hands on the wheel. He climbed in behind me and held the gun to the back of my head. May I fasten my seatbelt? You have a gun to your head. He waved his free hand. Go ahead, try anything, and you're dead. You interrupted my dinner being here. Don't test me. I had no luck except the bad kind. Of all the places I could have chosen to meet Mrs. Partridge, I picked the place a hitman was having dinner. I grasped the belt at my shoulder so he could see my hands and fastened it. I've seen you around the murder scenes. Are you a cop? I'm a victim's advocate with the police department. He tossed the keys into my lap. Drive to the airport. I started the car, eased onto the road, and glanced at him in the rearview mirror. No seatbelt. I could ram the car into the concrete columns under the expressway, but the speed limit between here and the airport never topped 40. He'd fire the gun when I accelerated. He could shoot me, but he couldn't drive from the back seat. You a natural, redhead? He rubbed his jaw. Yes, I had to distract him for a few seconds in order to shift and get away. I couldn't let him take me inside the hangar. The second Darlene recognized me, everyone would know we were related. I'd seen enough movies to know that never ended well. What were you doing sitting in a car with Partridge's mother? 
She called and asked for assistance, filing the victim's comp paperwork with the state. I met his eyes in the mirror. I'm surprised you know her. Funerals interest me. He laughed. I worked to keep my expression blank. He'd attended Gavin's funeral. If I'd gone, I would have recognized him sooner. Are you going to kill me? Not unless I have to. Do you have any idea how much a natural redhead can make on her back? Mind if I roll the window down? I feel sick. I increased the pressure on the gas pedal. Touch that window and I'll shoot you. Chapter 57 My magic simmered below the surface, waiting for release as we approached the overpass. The part of me who still thought of myself as human threatened to ruin the plan. My hands shook and pulse sped as I struggled to keep my thoughts from showing on my face. I'd managed to increase the speed to 50 miles per hour without complaints from the back seat. I caught him staring in the rear view and averted my eyes. What's your name, Red? I cut the wheel to the right and called the Firebird. Everything happened at once. The car slammed into the concrete pillar as the gun fired near my head. In animal form, the seat belt no longer secured me, so the force of the crash sent me forward. But then the airbag deployed, pushing me back. Though the bullet had whizzed by, my ears rang from the shot. Flames surrounded me as I freed my feet from the seat belt and lunged for the windshield. Vincent moved in the back seat as I smashed through the remaining glass and flew from the car. I extinguished my flames as I gained altitude and headed for the airport. Pain on my left side made it difficult to pump my wings. I slowed and rode the wind. Did I break my ribs? When I injured my human body, I'd heal when I shifted. I never thought to ask if it worked in reverse, and I couldn't risk it now. I focused on the mystical connection that kept me tethered to Bryson to draw strength. I landed on an adjacent hangar, listening for signs of life. My human ears might have picked up words, but the firebird couldn't distinguish tones from the distance. Gavin appeared beside me. Hey, little buddy. I shook my head. He rolled his eyes. Activate your wonder twin powers and shift into a human. As soon as I changed, the night air cut through my exposed skin and into my bones. The pain I'd felt in my spirit animal exploded in human form. Each breath added to the agony. How's your mother? Shaken up, but she'll be fine. Are you hurt? I think I might have broken some ribs. My side is killing me and it hurts to breathe. Suck it up, hell girl. I curled up as much as the pain would allow. The hostages are in a room on the back side of the hangar. I lifted my head. They're isolated from the guards? Yes, please try to keep up. I had to do something, but every idea sounded more preposterous than the last. I wonder if I could burn a hole through the wall and sneak them out. He motioned to me. Can you melt through metal walls? My bare skin was no match for the chilly air. My magic should have kept my body temperature elevated. I chalked it up to my injured ribs and forced myself to concentrate. I don't know if I can focus my fire enough to burn through metal. Can you find me something to wear? I'll see what I can do. How are you going to hide your powers? I hadn't stopped to consider the logistics. I don't have time to worry about it. I need to practice on one of the hangars on the far side of the runway, and I need clothes. Gavin vanished. I shifted and flew to the other side of the airport. When the elders attempted to bind me, I'd used the fire to create a circle, but I'd never tried anything like this. My flames ignited and I pushed against the wall. The metal heated but didn't give. I envisioned the flames joining in a focused column at my wing. To my surprise, a cone-shaped beam of fire formed. Gavin appeared beside me. I have to tell you, this fire thing you have going on scares me. 
I shifted to human form and sighed. It scares me, too. Hang in there, honey. You can do this. I turned back and imagined my magic flowing out of my hand. When I touched the wall, I pushed more energy into my palm. The metal heated until I pushed through. It worked! He laughed. I took a step back, light-headed. I may not be strong enough to make a large hole. Nonsense. I found coveralls. Let's do this. I shifted, though it took more time than usual to make the transformation. Gavin led me to another hangar. I slipped through an open exhaust vent and into the building. When I returned to human form, my side throbbed and my head spun. Shifting should have healed my wounds, but I'd never injured the firebird. I need to find a way to refuel my magic. You look sick. Gavin pressed his hand to my forehead. Thanks, I smirked as I zipped up a pair of coveralls. You need to eat something. I'm okay. Rather than risking shifting again, I jogged toward the hangar with the hostages. Armored vehicles approached from a side road, and I pressed my back against the edge of the building. In the distance, police cruisers and unmarked cars filed in. I didn't know how long it would take them to breach the building, but I needed to hurry. Where should I make the hole? Gavin stuck his head through the wall, walked several feet, and looked inside again. Here. I crouched down and pressed my hand to the wall. My magic strained to travel down my arm and out my hand. After what felt like forever, the metal gave way beneath my palm. People scattered and shouted from inside the room. You have to be quiet. I doubted they heard me, but I didn't dare scream over their voices. How is she burning through the walls? Someone whispered from inside the building. Another voice answered, she must have a blowtorch or something. The conversation continued down a dangerous path. My magic didn't make enough noise to emulate an actual tool. I put my hand through the hole and waved to get their attention. When they settled, I removed my hand and whispered, I'm trying to get you out, but I need you to be quiet and move away from the wall. Dennis Lords looked back and nodded. The gods haven't checked on us in a while. Let me know if anyone comes in. I pushed my fingertips against the building and melted a thinner line. You're doing great, Tessa. The gods are still in the main hangar, Gavin whispered. After some trial and error, I found moving my fingers as I went increased my speed. Spots danced in the corners of my eyes and my arm trembled. But I kept going. She's almost got it. Bend the metal out of the way, Dennis said from inside. I lowered my hand as they pushed the wall outward until the sound of twisting metal broke the silence. Several of the hostages spoke at once. Judging from their startled conversations, their concern shifted from how I managed to melt metal to the amount of noise in the room. Stop! Please keep your voices down! Let me cut some more. I drew a breath and focused. When I reached for my magic, I felt the firebird waver. Achila and Charlie's warnings came back to me, but I couldn't stop. I had to get them out. Almost there. You can do it. Gavin put his hands on my shoulders. Go keep watch. Yes, ma'am. He saluted me. I pulled what little energy I had remaining into my hand. The metal gave as the ember of magic inside me winked out. A young woman emerged from the hole, followed by two additional people. Run to the back of that hangar and wait for the others. Please stay together. I rested my shoulder against the building for support as more people crawled through. The space inside me that was my connection to Brasson turned into a gaping hole. I'd never experienced anything like it. Not even Charlie's loss left me in such mind-numbing agony. Tessa, oh my God, Tessa. 
Darlene threw her arms around me. Shh, Mama, you have to go. Follow the others. I'll be right there. She pulled me tighter and whispered, I thought I'd never see you again. I love you, baby girl. I love you too. Stone emerged from the building and smiled. Dennis Lords followed. I'm the last one out. Let's go. I took a step forward and stumbled. Stone and Dennis caught me before I hit the ground. The basketball player hoisted me to his shoulder. We made it to the others as someone shouted inside the hangar. I murmured, hurry, they know we're gone. Dennis motioned to the next building and whispered, quickly now, stay together. I hung over his shoulder as the group moved from hangar to hangar. Though gunshots rang out behind us and people shouted in the distance, my thoughts drifted to the last night I'd spent dreaming between Aaron and Bryson. Had I known that it would hold such significance, I would have stayed awake until dawn. Whatever image my subconscious produced couldn't have been as perfect as lying between them. Dennis held everyone on the back side of a building and eased me to my feet. We should get inside. There might be a phone. Hang in there. The car's coming, Darlene whispered. Chapter 58 The car turned the corner and headlights illuminated our hiding place. The group of survivors huddled together, unsure if the car meant safety or death. Darlene pressed against my side, leaving me sandwiched between her and Dennis Lords. Police, hands up. Walk forward one at a time, the officer called to us. One by one, the hostages moved forward to form a line as the officer radioed for backup. She's injured. Dennis walked forward with me. We're clear. The policeman cut the spotlight. Backup is on the way to get you people out of here. Anyone else need EMS? We have a pregnant woman, Stone called. A second cruiser and two unmarked cars stopped near the hangar. Aaron's energy hit me like a tidal wave. He was nearby. I turned and searched for him in the crowd. Mama, find Aaron for me. He's in one of those cars. Darlene nodded and hurried toward the vehicles. The loss of my spirit animal buckled my knees, and I sagged against Dennis. I glanced around at the relieved faces and told myself I'd traded my magic for their lives. How did I ever think I could give this part of myself away? I clutched my side and pulled away from Dennis. I had to find Aaron. Each step sent a shockwave of pain through my lungs until I struggled to breathe. Samuels jogged over and embraced me. Tessa, what's wrong? Are you injured? My ribs. I struggled for breath. Why am I not healing? What the hell happened? I glanced at the others milling around. I need to sit. He helped me into the back of a cruiser and crouched between the car and the door. Talk to me. I told him the truth about the abduction, the accident, flying here and getting the hostages out of the building. He smiled. You saved these people's lives. Did they pick up Johnny? He was in the car. Samuels ran his hand over his face. The call about the accident came in on the way over. One fatality. I sank back into the seat. He was moving when I left him. Sweetheart, the car was fully engulfed when fire and rescue arrived. I gasped, sending pain from my chest to my toes. He touched my arm to get my attention. EMS is on the way. It's not something conventional medicine can fix. Right. Do you need to change into our feathered friend to heal? I can't. The firebird is gone. He folded his arms. You're worrying me. I looked past him to the crowd. I need to see Aaron. In a minute. You say Johnny grabbed you from the car right after you hung up with Aaron? Samuels nodded his head slowly. Yes? You say you were on your way home? He continued to nod. I was. Good girl. 
Let me talk to Aaron. He drew a sharp breath and stood. The night air sent a chill through me, or maybe it was my body missing the heat from the firebird. I hunched my shoulder as much as the pain would allow and bit down to stop my teeth from chattering. Aaron stood in the open door with his jaw set in a hard line. He shook his head and turned to go, stopped and turned back. Do you do this shit for attention, or are you just reckless? I looked away. Nothing I could say would help the situation. Look at me. I shook my head without turning. Samuel said, okay, buddy, that's enough. She's probably got some cracked ribs from the collision. Aaron lowered his voice. So she changes into the bird in heels. She can't. Aaron leaned into the car. What does he mean, you can't? I met his gaze. I used all of my magic, including the firebird, to get them out of the building. His expression softened. You were warned, Tessa. How did you let this happen? I don't know. Aaron turned to Samuels. The suspects are confirmed dead? That's an affirmative. Samuels took a blanket from one of the officers and handed it to Aaron. He spread it over my legs. Give me five minutes and I'll take you home. I can't leave my mother. Hurt, or perhaps disappointment, crossed his expression. They called an ambulance for Darlene. Stone insisted she go to the hospital and get checked out. I shook my head and pushed the blanket away. I need to speak to her right now. Don't move or I'll cuff you to the car. He turned and disappeared into the crowd. People and vehicles moved outside, but none of it mattered. I fought to stay awake as I waited, huddled beneath the blanket. The passenger's door opened and Darlene climbed in. Aaron said you needed me? I'll go with you to the hospital. I'll lie if I need to. You're right. Stone's a good guy. She smiled and pulled my head to her shoulder. I told him the truth. He still wants to marry me and raise this baby. He says I rock his world. I laughed and then wrapped my arms around my middle and groaned. Aaron offered to take me home. Sounds like a fine offer. She kissed my forehead. I'm so proud of you for what you did tonight. You'll always be my first baby, Tessa. Thanks. And you'll always be my mom. She opened her eyes and mouth wide and dabbed her lower lashes. Stop it. You'll ruin my makeup. See you on Christmas? Wouldn't miss it. She slid out of the car and spoke to Aaron. She's all yours. Take care of my baby. Aaron helped me to the front seat and buckled my seatbelt. I'm surprised Bryson isn't here. Without the firebird, he can't sense me. I stared out the window as we drove out of the airport. Then how did you know I was here? You sent Darlene to find me. My mouth opened, but I snapped it shut. Was he right? I'd felt his energy when he pulled up, and it drew me to him now. I don't know. He took my hand. A flutter of magic passed between us. Maybe there's still hope. His touch brought the same sense of peace as before. I focused on the feeling and welcomed it to wash over me. Maybe. Get some rest. Aaron kissed my hand. I closed my eyes and sighed. Tessa, wake up. He shook my shoulder. I opened my eyes, surprised we'd made it home already. Tessa, can you hear me? The urgency in his voice registered, but my limbs refused to cooperate. I needed to sleep. A few more minutes and I'd be good as new. Tessa, you have to wake up. I woke to Aaron, shaking me like a madman. My molars clanked together and my neck felt like it might snap. Listen to me. 
The elders are here. Bryson's injured. Pain tore through my shoulder, waking me. I tried to lift my arm to check for blood, but it refused to cooperate. Someone, no, Aaron, hovered over me. I blinked up at him as the fog cleared from my brain. Did you bite me? Sorry, I need you to get up. My head weighed four times more than usual. I couldn't lift it or move my limbs. Why am I on the ground? Something is paralyzing me. Did I die again? My level of fatigue puzzled me. I hadn't felt this lethargic at the airport. Why now? A spell? I moved you from the car. He lowered his voice. Listen to me. We're at your place. The elders are here. They refuse to speak to me. They have Brasson and demand to talk to you. You have to shift and heal. I focused my attention on the ember in my gut. Ash remained where the fire once burned. I pressed my hand to my belly as if mourning a lost child. She's gone. No, sweetheart. I can still sense her. You have to try. I didn't understand what had happened, but the desperation in his eyes was enough to convince me he spoke the truth. My teeth chattered, making it difficult to form the words. Kiss me. He leaned in and hesitated. What if you shift? That'd be a good thing. Aaron pressed his lips to mine and pulled my limp body against his chest. Warm tears fell to my cheeks, but I didn't know if they belonged to him or me. His arms tightened, wrapping me in warmth. He deepened the kiss until my lips ached from the pressure. The firebird struggled to rise inside me. Aaron broke the kiss. I can feel your magic. Can you shift now? I don't think so. I lifted my hand to his face and met his eyes. Will you take me as your mate? He pressed his lips into a thin line. We don't have time for mating or whatever you're asking me to do. Time was working against us, but I didn't have many options. If I claim you, I can access Bryson's magic inside you. Aaron glanced back toward the house, then back. Whatever he saw worried him enough to consider my request. What about Bryson? He claimed me. I'll claim you. Exhaustion threatened to pull me under again. I struggled to keep my eyes open. Do you love me? The earnest tone in his voice tightened my chest. The situation was far from ideal, but it didn't change my feelings for him. I do. And I'd want to do this even if we weren't in danger. He searched my eyes and nodded. Okay, do it. I took an unsteady breath and whispered, Aaron, will you have me as your mate? Yes. He squeezed my hand. I, Tessa, daughter of Achila, claim you now and forever as my mate. My heart and my life are yours. I smiled. Your turn. He whispered, I, Aaron, claim you, Tessa, now and forever as my mate. My heart and life are yours. Kiss me. He brushed his lips across mine, and our magic joined. I gasped as the firebird flared to life and heat returned to my blood. Two halves are now as one. I will walk with you as one spirit shared between two bodies for the remainder of my days. Aaron sat back and stared with a mixture of fear and awe. I sat upright. So it is said. So it is done. That's one hell of a way to get a guy to marry you. Chapter 59 Bryson's chest sagged against the oak tree in the front yard. Welts and cuts covered his back, 
and blood soaked the ropes binding his hands. I glanced toward May's darkened windows and prayed the ladies hadn't witnessed the beating. John Macon stood near the tree with five of his henchmen. Glad you could wake up and join us. Thank you. I needed the rest. I motioned to Bryson. You trespass on my land and harm my mate? Mr. Matthews pointed at Aaron. This isn't your concern. It is his concern. He shares my Nunahi magic as my mate. Aaron shifted his weight from one foot to the other. I felt his anxiety spike at the mention of the word Nunahi. When this ordeal ended, I planned to sit him down and answer all of his questions with or without Bryson. John laughed. <laughs> You expect us to believe a white man shares your magic? I drew a ball of fire to my palm. Aaron followed my lead and placed his hand in mine. Mr. Matthews turned red-faced angry. Illusions. You're welcome to come test the flames. I smiled. He marched over, so confident I'd used trickery, he thrust his hand into the fire. A split second later, he jerked it back and howled. I demand you return my wife. Why should I do that after you have injured my mate? John Macon stepped forward. Bryson trespassed on Matthew's land. I glanced at Bryson, then back to John. Release him. Give us Betty Matthews. Bryson cried out, no. One of John's men cracked a whip on Bryson's back. Aaron tensed beside me. I took a step forward and stopped. They wanted me to react, to attempt to rescue him. But why? What had they done? Movement caught my attention. I narrowed my eyes and searched the field adjacent to my property. The night vision of the firebird illuminated several figures jogging in our direction. Aaron and I were already outnumbered. Did John have more men waiting to ambush us? Buck Oldham and several elders stepped onto the railroad tracks. We request permission to walk your land. I dipped my chin to hide my relieved expression from John and the others, then turned and motioned to the newcomers. You and your companions are welcome here, Buck Oldham. May stepped onto her front porch with a shotgun in her hands. Aaron sucked air between his teeth. Buck scanned the scene and turned to John. You trespass here. They keep something that doesn't belong to them, John said. I nodded. I healed Betty Matthews. When I learned she was attacked in her home, I offered her safe haven. Buck said, a woman isn't property. My wife belongs to me, Mr. Matthews shouted. Buck motioned in my direction. Do you believe she is in danger if returned to her husband? I do. I made eye contact with Mr. Matthews. Her husband has beaten her twice that I know of, and John Macon has attacked her with magic at least once. John laughed. The girl will say or do anything to save her skin. Do you have proof? Buck looked from John to me. I had a hunch that Bryson had gone to Matthews to find something to use in the spell. I threw the dice, betting on my intuition. I can prove Mr. Matthews shifted and attacked his wife, but I need my mate to complete the spell. Buck nodded. Release Bryson. John held his hand out. The girl claims she has two mates. Let the other one assist her. Buck glared. Release the Nunahi. You have no right to take tribal justice outside the council. The council is present. John motioned to the men. This land was blessed by Chisiqua himself. Let justice be served. I have no objections. I released Aaron's hand. We'll complete the spell to identify the shifter. John smiled. The spell requires sunlight. Buck chuckled. Not 
if we use the blood of the accused. Mr. Matthews sputtered. I won't allow you to bleed me for some magic mumbo jumbo. Buck shook his head. You will participate in this or you will admit guilt. She's my wife to do with as I please. Give her to me now. Mr. Matthews lunged for me. Aaron stepped forward, but I turned, raised my hand, and shot a ball of fire toward Mr. Matthews. He jumped around, swatting his pants. Buck's voice boomed over the gathering. Detain him. Mr. Matthews snarled, and his energy spiked, signaling he intended to change into his wolf. I shouted the words that filled my mind without knowing the intention of the spell. Mr. Matthews collapsed to the ground. Mid-shift, John Macon moved toward me. You killed him? Aaron drew his weapon. Back up. I focused on Mr. Matthews, reaching out with my magic to determine what I'd done. No, he's in stasis. Impossible, John motioned to one of his men. He knelt beside Matthews for a moment and nodded. She's telling the truth. John narrowed his eyes and called out, I'll recant my charge against Bryson. I was operating under false information. Buck threw his hands up. Someone untie him from that damned tree. John's smug grin returned. Aaron joined the other men as they cut the ropes on Bryson's wrists. It took two people to support his weight as they brought him to me. Bryson sank to the ground and stared off into the distance. What have you done to him? I maintained an even tone and resisted the urge to embrace him. One misstep, and we'd all pay. Bryson's chin rested on his chest as if he couldn't lift his head. I didn't understand why he didn't shift and heal himself. John's smile broadened. I took out an insurance policy, against the firebird. The events of the night played through my head, my weakness, inability to heal, the loss of my magic, the sense of emptiness. It had felt as if I were dying, and I'd welcomed it. They bound his magic. Oh, Brasson, no. I promised myself I would taste John Macon's blood before the end of the night. You will unbind him immediately. Who are you to order me around, girl? I will return what is his when you submit to punishment for your crimes against the tribe. John winked. However, we're finished here tonight. I'm still in charge here. I will say when we are finished. Buck looked over those gathered. I call a vote in the matter of the firebird. I had to hand it to the man. He knew how to take advantage of a situation. With Mr. Matthews down, the stalemate ended. I have no objections. Those in favor of binding the firebird step forward. John and two of his flunkies stepped forward. He turned his smiling face toward his former supporters, The men would likely live to regret their decision to change sides. The matter is closed. Buck pointed at John. You will return Bryson's magic. John held his hands out. I'm not Nunahi with endless energy. My magic comes from spells. I don't have the necessary ingredients here. Buck's chin rose as he glanced from John to me and finally Aaron. The one who shares his essence can release Bryson's magic. Give him the words. John's eyes widened. The Nuna, he shared himself with an outsider. I couldn't hide my smile or the swell of pride as Aaron stepped forward with his head held high. Regardless of the risks, he wouldn't hesitate to go against John Macon to save Bryson. Aaron said, you were ordered to give me the words. John glanced between us and scowled as he pulled a gold coin from his pocket. 
He clearly didn't appreciate Aaron's choice of wording. John flipped it in Aaron's direction. My first instinct was to melt it before it reached Aaron, but I waited. John couldn't be foolish enough to openly attack with the council present. Aaron snatched the coin out of the air without taking his eyes off John. Trace the symbol on the coin on his forehead, then place the coin in his mouth. John folded his arms. If you do share his magic, it'll work. If you don't... I held my breath. Zarin knelt before Bryson and drew the symbol. He hesitated. The color drained from his face. I whispered, trust yourself. Aaron dipped his chin, as if saying a prayer, and slid the coin into Bryson's mouth. Time slowed as we waited for something to happen. I'd all but given up when the intelligence returned to Bryson's eyes. He held my gaze, communicating more in those few precious seconds than most could in volumes of pages. My mate's energy changed, and I exhaled in anticipation of what would happen next. The great hawk burst forth and launched into the air. He circled twice before diving toward Aaron and me. Bryson shifted to human form as his feet touched the grass. He took my hand and pulled it to his mouth, but his eyes remained fixed on John. Bryson's expression held a promise of murder. My magic flared in response to his touch. Aaron took my other hand, causing the energy between us to flash white hot. I drew the excess heat directly into the firebird, knowing I'd need it before the ordeal ended. Bryson whispered, I approve of your new mate. John Macon considered the three of us, then shook his head. He turned to Buck with the same smug smile he'd worn most of the night. May I have your permission to leave? I stepped away from the men as a sign that I spoke for myself. John Macon, I give you one hour. After the time has passed, you are not welcome on this land. Should you return, I will see it as a sign of aggression and defend myself. John smirked as he bowed. I wouldn't dream of forcing you to defend yourself against me, child. Buck turned to me. Your grandfather would be proud. Wait, Dottie called as she and Betty strode into the gathering. I wish to testify against a member of the council. As many of you know, I was attacked by a shifter as a girl. Betty sneered as she walked past her husband. The quick jerk of her shoulder told me she'd kicked him on her way to the gathering. I wish to testify as well. John turned toward them and growled. Buck looked like a soft breeze would topple him. He glanced between the women and John. Dottie speaks the truth. I witnessed her wounds. You may name your attacker. Uncertainty and fear danced across Dottie's eyes. She opened her mouth, but no words came. Tanya called to the crowd as she moved to her husband, one of the men who'd turned against John. I witnessed an attack on Betty Matthews. I added, I can testify and provide evidence of the spiritual attack on Betty Matthews. Smells like rotten potatoes. Gavin appeared out of nowhere, scaring the daylights out of me. I whipped around and caught John drawing a symbol in the air. John Macon, you are a guest here for the remainder of the hour. I forbid you from using magic. Dark magic slammed into me. I thought he'd attacked me until the air punched out of Brasson's lungs. The magic knocked him off his feet and left him writhing. I couldn't discern the intention of the spell but the residue burned my skin. I stepped forward, ready to incinerate John, but hit an invisible wall. He smirked as he drew another symbol and whispered something I couldn't hear. My body erupted in pain. I burned as if fire raged through my veins. The firebird writhed and shrieked as it pulled itself from my cells, reforming into a separate being inside me. My back bowed as she clawed her way to the surface.
She fought for independence and would have had it, even if she'd killed me in the process. I fell to the ground and pulled myself toward Bryson. Every inch brought more pain until I thought I'd pass out before closing the distance. I curled into the fetal position a foot from him. I couldn't spare the breath to tell him I loved him. I drew comfort from his proximity. The force of the next wave of magic brought Aaron to his knees. He cupped my face with one hand and Bryson's arm with the other. How do we fight this? The firebird made another bid for freedom, ramming herself against the inside of my tender ribs. The pain tore a scream from my throat. A male voice filled my head, and his words spilled from my mouth. One spirit. We share one spirit among us, Rasson whispered. One spirit among us, Aaron repeated. The great hawk moved through them, the two pieces forming a hole to protect its mate. I muttered the words, and our magic merged as it had in each of the claiming ceremonies. My pain ebbed enough to stand. The men came to their feet beside me. I turned toward John Macon. I don't know what he saw in my eyes, but he took a step back. I raised a trembling hand to end John, but Buck and his supporters stepped in my path. Bryson put his hand on my shoulder, easing me back. Let him handle this. I glanced back, not understanding. Dottie's armed. Aaron nodded toward my aunt, standing with the elders. Buck's voice rang out. Name the person who hurt you, Dottie Nokoseka. She stood in front of the men, with her head held high and shoulders squared. John Macon. Buck motioned to Betty. Name your attacker, Betty Matthews. Betty pointed and smiled as if she were looking at a new puppy. John Macon. I dipped my chin, knowing her expression would leave a scar on the good part of my soul. Let justice be served, Buck said. A gunshot startled me back to the proceedings. Dottie lowered the pistol to her side and nodded. Let justice be served. John Macon's unseeing eyes stared straight ahead, a single bullet hole between his eyes. Gavin appeared next to me and smiled. Well, I'll be damned. Now I see where you get it. I covered my mouth and turned to my men. I'd been through a lot, but my troubles were nothing in comparison to my aunt's. I'd been raised to believe that vengeance belonged to the Lord. I couldn't help but wonder if taking John Macon's life would haunt her or free her from her past. Chapter 60 Christmas Eve brought a different kind of magic. This year, rather than spending the night wrapping gifts and drinking hot cocoa, we dressed for a ball. The mayor had invited the victims' families law enforcement, and first responders to a night of remembrance. I could think of no better way to make use of the venue and items the city had already purchased for the Christmas extravaganza. I'd been on pins and needles since the invitation arrived last week, but Gavin had turned into a diva dictator. Bratessa, the limo is here. Everyone else is in the car except you and your men. Gavin tapped his watch. For the previous four hours, I'd been scrubbed, polished, painted, curled, and pinned. I needed a nap, but didn't dare wrinkle the dress Mrs. Partridge had given me. It seems wrong to celebrate so soon after so much violence. He smacked my arm. It is a celebration of life. We need a night of food and dancing to start the healing process. Now get in the car. Ready to go? Bryson stood in the doorway, staring as if he'd seen Santa carrying the baby Jesus in a pot of leprechaun gold. You're stunning. The compliment and my impure thoughts when I saw him in his tux made me blush from the tips of my ears to my chest. Thank you. You look amazing. Aaron stood 
when we walked into the living room. Between his million-watt smile and the slim-fitted tux, he looked like the star of a spy movie. Wow, Tessa. Wow. Gavin clapped his hands. Yes, yes, you all look fabulous. Now get in the car. I walked to the limo with Bryson and Aaron on either side. Merry Christmas. The uniform driver turned to us and his smile shriveled. You? No, no way you're getting in my car. Pick me up, Steve. I took a step back. You're still driving people around? His eyes narrowed as he pointed. No, thanks to you. I'm really sorry. I was working on the serial killer case. My apartment burned down. It was a bad time. You're a Christmas hater. He folded his arms. I don't allow Grinches in my limousine. What's the holdup? Gavin put his hands on his hips. I smiled. I'm very sorry I caused the accident and you lost your job. But you're wrong about me. I love Christmas. Look at my family. How could I not love a day spent with them? He looked doubtful. It's a shame someone with so much holiday spirit has to work on Christmas Eve. Would you like to join us at the party? Tessa, have you lost your mind? Gavin threw up his hands. I'd like that, Steve smiled. I have Christmas carols for the drive. Aaron cringed. If you play the 12 days of Christmas, I'll rescind your invitation. Steve bobbed his head. Yeah, that one's going to be a problem this year. As the others joked and sang along with Steve, I pressed my hand to the window and watched the passing scenery. We'd been through a lot. It seemed like ages since Charlie died, but times like this, it felt like yesterday. What are you thinking about? Brasson whispered. Christmases, past, present, and future. I smiled. When I was little, Charlie would take me out looking for the house with the prettiest lights. Every year, I picked our house as the winner. And this year? Your lights get the blue ribbon. Thank you. He squeezed my hand. Aaron sat across from us, smiling and nodding, as May regaled him with Maddie's latest caper. Seems the dog had opened the closet door and found the candy meant to go into our stockings. Five pounds of it. Dottie and Darlene debated the pros and cons of finding out the baby's sex early, while Stone listened. The goofy smile on his face told me he'd be happy either way. I looked forward to next Christmas when I'd have a new sibling to spoil. The buildings grew taller as we approached downtown Orlando. The city had come together to honor the ones lost in the previous weeks. Red and green lights lit skyscrapers and smaller historic buildings, banners with the names of the victims and the slogan, Your Spirit Lives On, hung from the overpasses. Steve exited the freeway. A few moments later, he turned into the swanky country club and parked under the portico. This is our stop. I pressed my hand to the window and stared. I feel like Cinderella. May flashed me a grin. With two princes and no pumpkins. Steve opened my door and offered his hand. Thank you for the invitation. You're welcome. He kissed my knuckles. I'll be inside as soon as I park. With a ghost at my side, I stepped into the most beautiful building I'd ever seen. Christmas trees lined the room, some tall enough to reach the second story. Garland and twinkling lights hung from the rafters and circled the columns. Centerpieces with white feathers and flowers graced the tables. Behind me, May and Dottie chattered about the decorations. Darlene and Stone headed for the food, and my men whispered secret Christmas plans. Gavin moved to my side. What do you think? It's breathtaking. I walked further into the room, taking it all in. I had a hand in most of the planning, right down to the patterns on the forks. He beamed. May I have this dance? I'm going to look a little silly out there dancing alone, as if you care what people think. I grinned and took his hand. 
I'd be honored. Gavin guided me to the empty dance floor as the band struck up a waltz. I placed my hand in his and rested my arm on his shoulder. He made it easy to follow his lead, and soon I'd forgotten the room full of people. Look, do you see them? Gavin spun me in a slow circle. The spirits of the ones we couldn't save had joined us on the dance floor, along with people who thought they danced alone. The living couldn't see their loved ones dancing with them, but I knew they felt their presence. Mrs. Partridge tapped my shoulder. May I cut in? Of course. I smiled as she stared at the space Gavin's spirit occupied. Do you feel him? She motioned to the dance floor. I believe we all do. I turned to leave, but Gavin held my hand. It's almost time for me to go. I lowered my eyes. I know. Don't look so sad. I'll come back to visit. He kissed my cheek. Merry Christmas, Tessa. Merry Christmas. I turned, and Bryson swept me into his arms. Are those happy tears? He spun me around the floor like a pro. Yes. I focused on the details of his face to burn them into my memory. Why didn't you tell me how hard it would be on you if I gave up my magic? I didn't want to influence your decision. You've lost so much. How could I take your humanity from you, too? I stopped dancing and touched his face. I've had loss this year. But I've also been blessed, truly blessed. Aaron tapped Bryson's shoulder. May I? Bryson kissed my cheek and handed me off to Aaron. I'm not much of a dancer. He pulled me close and swayed to the music. I laughed. I don't know about that. This move's not bad. I'm glad you approve. I've been working on it since junior high. He sang softly as we danced and pulled away now and then to look into my eyes. When the song ended, Aaron and I joined my family at the table. The mayor took the stage, welcoming the families to the gala. A video montage of the victims celebrating past holiday seasons brought tears to my eyes. The mayor returned to the podium. I'd like to ask the police officers and first responders to rise. Aaron stood and motioned for me to join him. I'm not a police officer, I protested. The mayor said, Miss Lamar, don't be bashful. I stood and turned as red as the ornaments on the trees. Aaron wrapped his arm around my shoulders and kissed my cheek as the crowd applauded. We couldn't have done this without you. The chief strode over as we took our seats. I closed the file on the media incident at the ballet. Good job, both of you, but next time... Keep it off camera. Will do, Chief. Aaron cleared his throat. Merry Christmas, Chief. I turned back to the table. Darlene furrowed her brow. You were on the news again? How did I miss it? Tessa and Aaron got caught kissing on the job. May had that devilish twinkle in her eyes. Darlene glanced between Aaron, Bryson, and I. One day I'll figure this all out. Stone chuckled. It's free love, baby. Actually, Gavin explained it in pretty simple terms. I smiled at my mates. I'm the creamy white center in a man candy sandwich. Dottie threw her head back and laughed, while Darlene stared open-mouthed and May choked on her water. I love them, and we're happy. The rest is personal, I said. Aaron chuckled. But it's fun watching people try to figure it out. Dottie leaned in and whispered, If you can get rid of a body together, you can share anything. I held my breath. Bryson and Aaron exchanged a look and laughed. Steve raised his hand as if he were in a classroom. So the three of you are a couple? Bryson grinned. I'll take this one. Aaron and I share Tessa. His eyes went wide. At the same time? We're both here now, at the same time. If that's what you're asking. I pinched Bryson's thigh. Behave. 
Steve looked away and stood. I think I need a drink. The table erupted in laughter. After dinner, I danced until my feet hurt. I even took turns around the floor with Samuels and the chief. Pick me up, Steve asked me to dance and maintained a solid foot between us. He seemed to have questions, but each time he opened his mouth, he'd glance back at the table and shake his head. Bryson cut in, twirled me twice, and dipped me backward. Aaron and I have something for you. We thought we'd start a new tradition. What is it? Come with me. He took my hand and pulled me to the side exit. Where are we going? His eyes twinkled like the lights on the tree as he led me to a flower-covered gazebo. Aaron stood when we approached. He had the same excited little boy smile as Bryson. You two are making me nervous. Aaron handed me an ornately wrapped gift, roughly the size of a bowling ball, though not as heavy. What's this? I started to shake it, but Bryson put his hand on my arm. Have a seat. Aaron motioned to a bench. I smoothed my dress as I sat and untied the ribbon. They watched with impatient grins as I tore into the paper and opened the box. My hands trembled as I lifted the sculpture. The firebird was carved from a deep red soapstone with intricate detail on each feather. Did you make this? Bryson smiled. Yes. It's beautiful. I set it aside and pulled a second item from the box. I removed the tissue paper to reveal a photograph of the three of us sitting on the porch steps. I thought I lost this in the fire. Aaron grinned. I found a copy of it on my computer. Thank you. They're perfect. I hugged them both. We have one more gift. Bryson motioned for me to sit. This is too much. Looking at them, side by side in their tuxes, I wondered how one woman could be so lucky. When they went to one knee in front of me, I nearly fainted. Bryson took my hand. Tessa, you've taught me the meaning of the word strength. Aaron took the other. You've challenged me to be a better man. You've reminded me that life is meaningless without love. Brasson smiled. And you've given me a family again. Aaron turned his head and cleared his throat. I looked between them, struggling to keep quiet. Brasson reached in his pocket, and I covered my mouth. Brasson held the small black box, and Aaron opened it. The ring inside stole my breath. A thin, diamond-encrusted band coiled around two round diamonds to form the delicate ring. They spoke together. Will you wear this ring as a symbol of our love and commitment? I closed my eyes and nodded. Aaron slid the ring halfway onto my finger, and Bryson finished the job. They stood and pulled me to my feet. Bryson turned my face toward his, and pressed his lips to mine. Aaron nuzzled my neck until I turned and kissed him. Brasson grinned. How do you feel about spending next week and New Year's at my place in North Carolina? A new tradition. Just the three of us. Aaron whispered as he left a trail of kisses down my neck. Starting the new year in the mountains sounds perfect. I pulled back from them and bit my lip. I have questions. They exchanged a look and sighed. We'll figure it all out. In time, I laughed. What would you two have done if I said yes to one and not the other? Tessa? Are you two always going to speak in unison? It'll save time, but I can see where it's going to be annoying. Aaron pulled me against him and kissed me until I forgot my questions. To make sure they stayed forgotten, Bryson kissed me too. The End This has been Twelve Spirits of Christmas, Tessa Lamar Novels, Volume 2, written by Katherine M. Hurst, narrated by Holly Adams, 
a member of SAG-AFTRA. Copyright 2017 by Wyndham House. Production copyright 2017 by Catherine M. Hurst.